chapter thirty nine of andersonville a story of rebel military prisons by john mcelroy this librivox recording is in the public domain july the prison becomes more crowded the weather hotter nations poorer and mortality greater some of the phenomena of suffering and death all during july the prisoners came streaming in by hundreds and thousands from every portion of the long line of battle stretching from the eastern bank of the mississippi to the shores of the atlantic over one thousand squandered by sturgis at guntown came in two thousand of those captured in the desperate blow dealt by hood against the army of the tennessee on the twenty second of the month before atlanta hundreds from hunter's luckless column in the shenandoah valley thousands from grant's lines in front of petersburg in all seven thousand one hundred and twenty-eight were during the month turned into that seething mass of corrupting humanity to be polluted and tainted by it and to assist in turn to make it fouler and deadlier over seventy hecatombs of chosen victims of fair youths and the first flush of hopeful manhood at the threshold of a life of honour to themselves and of usefulness to the community beardless boys rich in the priceless affection of homes fathers mothers sisters and sweethearts with minds thrilling with high aspirations for the bright future were sent in as the monthly sacrifice to this minotaur of the rebellion who couched in his foul lair slew them not with the merciful delivery of speedy death as his cretan prototype did the annual tribute of athenian youths and maidens but gloating over his prey doomed them to lingering destruction he rotted their flesh with the scurvy racked their minds with intolerable suspense burned their bodies with the slow fire of famine and delighted in each separate pang until they sank beneath the fearful accumulation theseus sherman d w the deliverer was coming his terrible sword could be seen gleaming as it rose and fell on the banks of the james and in the mountains beyond atlanta where he was hewing his way towards them and the heart of the southern confederacy but he came too late to save them strike as swiftly and as heavily as he would he could not strike so hard nor so sure as his foes with sabre blow and musket shot as they could at the hapless youths with the dreadful armament of starvation and disease though the deaths were one thousand eight hundred and seventeen more than were killed at the battle of shiloh this left the number in the prison at the end of the month thirty one thousand six hundred and seventy eight let me assist the reader's comprehension of the magnitude of this number by giving the population of a few important cities according to the census of eighteen seventy cambridge massachusetts eighty nine thousand six hundred and thirty nine charleston south carolina forty eight thousand nine hundred and fifty eight columbus ohio thirty one thousand two hundred and seventy four dayton ohio thirty thousand four hundred and seventy three fall river massachusetts twenty six thousand seven hundred and sixty six kansas city missouri thirty two thousand two hundred and sixty the number of prisoners exceeded the whole number of men between the ages of eighteen and forty-five in several of the states and territories in the union here for instance are the returns for eighteen seventy of men of military age in some portions of the country arizona five thousand one hundred and fifty seven colorado fifteen thousand one hundred and sixty six dakota five thousand three hundred and one idaho nine thousand four hundred and thirty one montana twelve thousand four hundred and eighteen nebraska thirty five thousand six hundred and seventy seven nevada twenty four thousand seven hundred and sixty two new hampshire sixty thousand six hundred and eighty four oregon twenty three thousand nine hundred and fifty nine rhode island forty four thousand three hundred and seventy seven vermont sixty two thousand four hundred and fifty west virginia six thousand eight hundred and thirty two it was more soldiers than could be raised to-day under strong pressure in either alabama arizona arkansas california colorado connecticut dakota delaware district of columbia florida idaho louisiana maine minnesota montana nebraska nevada new hampshire new mexico oregon rhode island south carolina utah vermont or west virginia these thirty one thousand six hundred and seventy eight active young men who were likely to find the confines of a state too narrow for them were cooped up on thirteen acres of ground less than a farmer gives for a playground for a half dozen colts or a small flock of sheep
there was hardly room for all to lie down at night and to walk a few hundred feet in any direction would require an hour's patient threading of the mass of men and tents the weather became hotter and hotter at midday the sand would burn the hand the thin skins of fair and auburn-haired men blistered under the sun's rays and swelled up in great watery puffs which soon became the breeding-grounds of the hideous maggots or the still more deadly gangrene the loathsome swamp grew in rank offensiveness with every burning hour the pestilence literally stalked at noonday and struck his victims down on every hand one could not look a rod in any direction without seeing at least a dozen men in the last frightful stages of rotting death let me describe the scene immediately around my own tent during the last two weeks of july as a sample of the condition of the whole prison i would take a space not larger than a good-sized parlor or sitting-room on this were at least fifty of us directly in front of me lay two brothers named sherwood belonging to company one of my battalion who came originally from missouri they were now in the last stages of scurvy and diarrhoea every particle of muscle and fat about their limbs and bodies had apparently wasted away leaving the skin clinging close to the bone of the face arms hands ribs and thighs everywhere except the feet and legs where it was swollen tense and transparent distended with gallons of purulent matter their livid gums from which most of their teeth had already fallen protruded far beyond their lips to their left lay a sergeant and two others of their company all three slowly dying from diarrhoea and beyond was a fair-haired german young and intelligent looking whose life was ebbing tediously away to my right was a handsome young sergeant of an illinois infantry regiment captured at kennesaw his left arm had been amputated between the shoulder and elbow and he was turned into the stockade with the stump all undressed save the ligating of the arteries of course he had not been inside an hour until the maggot flies had laid eggs in the open wound and before the day was gone the worms were hatched out and rioting amid the inflamed and supersensitive nerves where their every motion was agony accustomed as we were to misery we found a still lower depth in his misfortune and i would be happier could i forget his pale drawn face as he wandered uncomplainingly to and fro holding his maimed limb with his right hand occasionally stopping to squeeze it as one does a boil and press from it a stream of maggots and pus i do not think he ate or slept for a week before he died next to him stayed an irish sergeant of a new york regiment a fine soldierly man who with pardonable pride wore conspicuously on his left breast a medal gained by gallantry while a british soldier in the crimea he was wasting away with diarrhoea and died before the month was out this was what one could see on every square rod of the prison where i was was not only no worse than the rest of the prison but was probably much better and healthier as it was the highest ground inside farthest from the swamp and having the dead line on two sides had a ventilation that those nearer the centre could not possibly have yet with all these conditions in our favour the mortality was as i have described nearest an exasperating idiot who played the flute had established himself like all poor players he affected the low mournful notes as plaintive as the distant cooing of the dove in lowering weather he played or rather tooted away in his blues inducing strain hour after hour despite our energetic protests and occasionally flinging a club at him there was no more stop to him than to a man with a hand organ and to this day the low sad notes of a flute are the swiftest reminder to me of those sorrowful death-laden days i had an illustration one morning of how far decomposition would progress in a man's body before he died my chum and i found a treasure trove in the streets in the shape of the body of a man who died during the night the value of this find was that if we took it to the gate we would be allowed to carry it outside to the dead house and on our way back have an opportunity to pick up a chunk of wood to use in cooking while discussing our good luck another party came up and claimed the body a verbal dispute led to one of blows in which we came off victorious and i hastily caught hold of the arm near the elbow to help bear the body away the skin gave way under my hand and slipped with it down to the wrist like a torn sleeve it was sickening but i clung to my prize and secured a very good chunk of wood while outside with it the wood was very much needed by my mess as our squad had then had none for more than a week End of chapter thirty nine chapter forty of andersonville 
a story of rebel military prisons by john mcelroy this librivox recording is in the public domain the battle of the twenty second of july the arms of the tennessee assaulted front and rear death of general mcpherson assumption of command by general logan result of the battle naturally we had a consuming hunger for news of what was being accomplished by our armies toward crushing the rebellion now more than ever had we reason to ardently wish for the destruction of the rebel power before capture we had love of country and a natural desire for the triumph of her flag to animate us now we had a hatred of the rebels that passed expression and a fierce longing to see those who daily tortured and insulted us trampled down in the dust of humiliation the daily arrival of prisoners kept us tolerably well informed as to the general progress of the campaign and we added to the information thus obtained by getting almost daily in some manner or another a copy of a rebel paper most frequently these were atlanta papers or an issue of the memphis corinth jackson granada chattanooga resaca marietta atlanta appeal as they used to facetiously term a memphis paper that left that city when it was taken in eighteen sixty two and for two years fell back from place to place as sherman's army advanced until at last it gave up the struggle in september eighteen sixty four in a little town south of atlanta after about two thousand miles of weary retreat from an indefatigable pursuer the papers were brought in by fresh fish purchased from the guards at from fifty cents to one dollar apiece or occasionally thrown in to us when they had some specially disagreeable intelligence like the defeat of banks or sturgis or bunter to exult over i was particularly fortunate in getting hold of these becoming installed as a general reader for a neighborhood of several thousand men everything of this kind was immediately brought to me to be read aloud for the benefit of everybody all the other prisoners knew me by the nickname of illinois a designation arising from my wearing on my cap when i entered prison a neat little white metal badge of ills when any reading matter was brought into our neighborhood there would be a general cry of take it up to illinois and then hundreds would mass around my quarters to bear the news read the rebel papers usually had very meagre reports of the operations of the armies and these were greatly distorted but they were still very interesting and as we always started in to read with the expectation that the whole statement was a mass of perversions and lies where truth was an infrequent accident we were not likely to be much impressed with it there was a marked difference in the tone of the reports brought in from the different armies sherman's men were always sanguine they had no doubt that they were pushing the enemy straight to the wall and that every day brought the southern confederacy much nearer its downfall those from the army of the potomac were never so hopeful they would admit that grant was pounding lee terribly but the shadow of the frequent defeats of the army of the potomac seemed to hang depressingly over them there came a day however when our sanguine hopes as to sherman were checked by a possibility that he had failed that his long campaign towards atlanta had culminated in such a reverse under the very walls of the city as would compel an abandonment of the enterprise and possibly a humiliating retreat we knew that jeff davis and his government were strongly dissatisfied with the fabian policy of joe johnston the papers had told us of the rebel president's visit to atlanta of his bitter comments on johnston's tactics of his going so far as to sneer about the necessity of providing pontoons at key west so that johnston might continue his retreat even to cuba then came the news of johnston's supersession by hood and the papers were full of the exulting predictions of what would now be accomplished when that gallant young soldier is once fairly in the saddle all this meant one supreme effort to arrest the onward course of sherman it indicated a resolve to stake the fate of atlanta and the fortunes of the confederacy in the west upon the hazard of one desperate fight we watched the summoning up of every rebel energy for the blow with apprehension we dreaded another chickamauga 
the blow fell on the twenty second of july it was well planned the army of the tennessee the left of sherman's forces was the part struck on the night of the twenty first hood marched a heavy force around its left flank and gained its rear on the twenty second this force fell on the rear with the impetuous violence of a cyclone while the rebels in the works immediately around atlanta attacked furiously in front it was an ordeal that no other army ever passed through successfully the steadiest troops in europe would think it foolhardiness to attempt to withstand an assault in force in front and rear at the same time the finest legions that follow any flag to-day must almost inevitably succumb to such a mode of attack but the seasoned veterans of the army of the tennessee encountered the shock with an obstinacy which showed that the finest material for soldiery this planet holds was that in which undaunted hearts beat beneath blue blouses springing over the front of their breastworks they drove back with a withering fire the force assailing them in the rear this speeding off they jumped back to their proper places and repulsed the assault in front this was the way the battle was waged until night compelled a cessation of operations our boys were alternately behind the breastworks firing at rebels advancing upon the front and in front of the works firing upon those coming up in the rear sometimes part of our line would be on one side of the works and part on the other in the prison we were greatly excited over the result of the engagement of which we were uncertain for many days a host of new prisoners perhaps two thousand was brought in from there but as they were captured during the progress of the fight they could not speak definitely as to its issue the rebel papers exulted without stint over what they termed a glorious victory they were particularly jubilant over the death of mcpherson who they claimed was the brain and guiding hand of sherman's army one paper likened him to the pilot fish which guides the shark to his prey now that he was gone said the paper sherman's army becomes a great lumbering hulk with no one in it capable of directing it and it must soon fall to utter ruin under the skilfully delivered strokes of the gallant hood we also knew that great numbers of wounded had been brought to the prison hospital and this seemed to confirm the rebel claim of a victory as it showed they retained possession of the battlefield about the first of august a large squad of sherman's men captured in one of the engagements subsequent to the twenty second came in we gathered around them eagerly among them i noticed a bright curly-haired blue-eyed infantryman or a boy rather as he was yet beardless his cap was marked sixty eighth o y y l his sleeves were garnished with the re-enlistment stripes and on the breast of his blouse was a silver arrow to the eye of the soldier this said that he was a veteran member of the sixty eighth regiment of ohio infantry that is having already served three years he had re-enlisted for the war and that he belonged to the third division of the seventeenth army corps he was so young and fresh-looking that one could hardly believe him to be a veteran but if his stripes had not said this the soldierly arrangement of clothing and accoutrements and the graceful self-possessed pose of limbs and body would have told the observer that he was one of those old reliables with whom sherman and grant had already subdued a third of the confederacy his blanket which for a wonder the rebels had neglected to take from him was tightly rolled its ends tied together and thrown over his shoulder scarf fashion his pantaloons were tucked inside his stocking tops that were pulled up as far as possible and tied tightly around his ankle with a string a none too clean haversack containing the inevitable sooty quart cup and even blacker half canteen waft slung easily from the shoulder opposite to that on which the blanket rested hand him his faithful springfield rifle put three days rations in his haversack and forty rounds in his cartridge bog and he would be ready without an instant's demur or question to march to the ends of the earth and fight anything that crossed his path he was a type of the honest honorable self-respecting american boy who as a soldier the world has not equaled in the sixty centuries that war has been a profession i suggested to him that he was rather a youngster to be wearing veteran chevrons yes said he i'm not so old as some of the rest of the boys but i have seen about as much service and been in the business about as long as any of them they call me old dad i suppose because i was the youngest boy in the regiment when we first entered the service though our whole company officers and all were only a lot of boys in the regiment to-day what's left of them are about as young a lot of officers as men as there are in the service 
why our old colonel ain't only twenty-four years old now and he has been in command ever since we went into vicksburg i've heard it said by our boys that since we veteranized the whole regiment officers and men average less than twenty-four years old but they are greyhounds to march and stayers in a fight you bet why the rest of the troops over in west tennessee used to call our brigade leggett's cavalry for they always had us chasing old forest and we kept him skedaddling too pretty lively but i tell you we did get into a red-hot scrimmage on the twenty second it just laid our champion hills or any of the big fights around vicksburg and they were lively enough to amuse any one so you were in the affair on the twenty second were you we are awful anxious to hear all about it come over here to my quarters and tell us all you know all we know is that there has been a big fight with mcpherson killed and a heavy loss of life besides and the rebels claim a great victory oh they be damned it was the sickest victory they ever got about one more victory of that kind would make their infernal old confederacy ready for a coroner's inquest well i can tell you pretty much all about that fight for i reckon if the truth was known our regiment fired about the first and last shot that opened and closed the fighting on that day where well, you see the whole army got across the river and were closing in around the city of atlanta our corps the seventeenth was the extreme left of the army and were moving up toward the city from the east the fifteenth logan's corps joined us on the right then the army of the cumberland further to the right we run on to the rebs about sundown the twenty first they had some breastworks on a ridge in front of us and we had a pretty sharp fight before we drove them off we went right to work and kept at it all night in changing and strengthening the old rebel barricades fronting them towards atlanta and by morning had some good solid works along our whole line during the night we fancied we could hear wagons or artillery moving away in front of us apparently going south or towards our left about three or four o'clock in the morning while i was shoveling dirt like a beaver out on the works the lieutenant came to me and said the colonel wanted to see me pointing to a large tree in the rear where i could find him i reported and found him with general leggett who commanded our division talking mighty serious and bob wheeler of f company standing there with his springfield at a parade rest as soon as i came up the colonel says boys the general wants two level-headed chaps to go out beyond the pickets to the front and toward the left i have selected you for the duty go as quietly as possible and as fast as you can keep your eyes and ears open don't fire a shot if you can help it and come back and tell us exactly what you have seen and heard and not what you imagine or suspect i have selected you for the duty he gave us the countersign and off we started over the breastworks and through the thick woods we soon came to our skirmish or pickets only a few rods in front of our works and cautioned them not to fire on us in going or returning we went out as much as half a mile or more until we could plainly hear the sound of wagons and artillery we then cautiously crept forward until we could see the main road leading south from the city filled with marching men artillery and teams we could hear the commands of the officers and see the flags and banners of regiment after regiment as they passed us we got back quietly and quickly passed through our picket line all right and found the general and our colonel sitting on a log where we had left them waiting for us we reported what we had seen and heard and gave it as our opinion that the johnnies were evacuating atlanta the general shook his head and the colonel says you may return to your company bob says to me the old general shakes his head as though he thought them damned rebs ain't evacuating atlanta so mighty sudden but are up to some devilment again i ain't sure but he's right they ain't going to keep falling back and falling back to all eternity but are just a-going to give us a rip-roaring great big fight one of these days when they get a good ready you hear me saying which we both went to our companies and laid down to get a little sleep it was about daylight then and i must have snoozed away until near noon when i heard the order fall in and found the regiment getting in to line and the boys all telling about going right into atlanta that the rebels had evacuated the city during the night and that we were going to have a race with the fifteenth corps as to which would get into the city first we could look away out across a large field in front of our works and see the skirmish line advancing steadily towards the main works around the city not a shot was being fired on either side to our surprise instead of marching to the front and toward the city we filed off into a small road cut through the woods and marched rapidly to the rear we could not understand what it meant we marched a quick time feeling pretty mad that we had to go to the rear when the rest of our division were going into atlanta 
we passed the sixteenth corps lying on their arms back in some open fields and the wagon trains of our corps all comfortably corralled and finally found ourselves out by the seventeenth corps headquarters two or three companies were sent out to picket several roads that seemed to cross at that point as it was reported rebel cavalry had been seen on these roads but a short time before and this accounted for our being rushed out into such a great hurry we had just stacked arms and were going to take a little rest after our rapid march when several rebel prisoners were brought in by some of the boys who had straggled a little they found the rebels on the road we had just marched out on up to this time not a shot had been fired all was quiet back at the main works we had just left when suddenly we saw several staff officers come tearing up to the colonel who ordered us to fall in take aims about face the lieutenant colonel dashed down one of the roads where one of the companies had gone out to picket the major and adjutant galloped down the others we did not wait for them to come back though but moved right back on to the road we had just come out in line of battle our colors in the road and our flanks in open timber we soon reached a fence enclosing a large field and there could see a line of rebels moving by the flank and forming facing toward atlanta but to the left and in the rear of the position occupied by our corps as soon as we reached the fence we fired a round or two into the backs of these gray coats who broke into confusion just then the other companies joined us and we moved off on double quick by the right flank for you see we were completely cut off from the troops up at the front and we had to get well over to the right to get around the flank of the rebels just about the time we fired on the rebels the sixteenth corps opened up a hot fire of musketry and artillery on them some of their shot coming over mighty close to where we were we marched pretty fast and finally turned in through some open fields to the left and came out just in the rear of the sixteenth corps who were fighting like devils along their whole line just as we came out into the open field we saw general r k scott who used to be our colonel and who commanded our brigade came tearing toward us with one or two aides or orderlies he was on his big clay bank horse old hatchy as we called him as we captured him on the battlefield at the battle of matamora or hell on the hatchy as our boys always called it he rode up to the colonel said something hastily when all at once we heard the all firedest crash of musketry and artillery way up at the front where we had built the works the night before and left the rest of our brigade and division getting ready to prance into atlanta when we were sent off to the rear scott put spurs to his old horse who was one of the fastest runners in our division and away he went back towards the position where his brigade and the troops immediately to their left were now hotly engaged he rode right along in rear of the sixteenth corps paying no attention apparently to the shot and shell and bullets that were tearing up the earth and exploding and striking all around him his aides and orderlies vainly tried to keep up with him we could plainly see the rebel lines as they came out of the woods into the open grounds to attack the sixteenth corps which had hastily formed in the open field without any signs of works and were standing up like men having a hand-to-hand -hand fight we were just far enough in the rear so that every blasted shot or shell that was fired too high to hit the ranks of the sixteenth corps came rattling over amongst us all this time we were marching fast following in the direction general scott had taken who evidently had ordered the colonel to join his brigade up at the front we were down under the crest of a little hill following along the bank of a little creek keeping under cover of the bank as much as possible to protect us from the shots of the enemy we suddenly saw general logan and one or two of his staff upon the right bank of the ravine riding rapidly toward us as he neared the head of the regiment he shouted halt what regiment is that and where are you going the colonel in a loud voice that all could hear told him the sixty eighth ohio going to join our brigade of the third division your old division general of the seventeenth corps logan says you had better go right in here on the left of dodge the third division have hardly ground enough left now to bury their dead god knows they need you but try it on if you think you can get to them just at this moment a staff officer came riding up on the opposite side of the ravine from where logan was and interrupted logan who was about telling the colonel not to try to go to the position held by the third division by the road cut through the woods whence we had come out but to keep off to the right towards the fifteenth corps as the woods referred to were full of rebels the officer saluted logan and shouted across general sherman directs me to inform you of the death of general mcpherson and orders you to take command of the army of the tennessee have dodged close well up to the seventeenth corps and sherman will reinforce you to the extent of the whole army 
logan standing in his stirrups on his beautiful black horse formed a picture against the blue sky as we looked up the ravine at him his black eyes fairly blazing and his long black hair waving in the wind he replied in a ringing clear tone that we all could hear say to general sherman i have heard of mcpherson's death and have assumed the command of the army of the tennessee and have already anticipated his orders in regard to closing the gap between dodge and the seventeenth corps this of course all happened in one quarter of the time i have been telling you logan put spurs to his horse and rode in one direction the staff officer of general sherman in another and we started on a rapid step toward the front this was the first we had heard of mcpherson's death and it made us feel very bad some of the officers and men cried as though they had lost a brother others pressed their lips gritted their teeth and swore to avenge his death he was a great favorite with all his army particularly of our corps which he commanded for a long while our company especially knew him well and loved him dearly for we had been his headquarters guard for over a year as we marched along toward the front we could see brigades and regiments and batteries of artillery coming over from the right of the army and taking position in the new lines in rear of the sixteenth and seventeenth corps major generals and their staffs brigadier generals and their staffs were mighty thick along the banks of the little ravine we were following stragglers and wounded men by the hundred were pouring into the safe shelter formed by the broken ground along which we were rapidly marching stories were heard of divisions brigades and regiments that these wounded or stragglers belonged having been all cut to pieces officers all killed and the speaker the only one of his command not killed wounded or captured but you boys have heard and seen the same cowardly sneaks probably in fights that you were in the battle raged furiously all this time part of this time the sixteenth corps seemed to be in the worst then it would let up on them and the seventeenth corps would be hotly engaged along their whole front we had probably marched half an hour since leaving logan and were getting pretty near back to our main line of works when the colonel ordered a halt and knapsacks to be unslung and piled up i tell you it was a relief to get them off for it was a fearful hot day and we had been marching almost double quick we knew that this meant business though and we, that we were stripping for the fight which we would soon be in just at this moment we saw an ambulance with the horses on a dead run followed by two or three mounted officers and then coming right towards us out of the very woods logan had cautioned the colonel to avoid when the ambulance got to where we were it halted it was pretty well out of danger from the bullets and shell of the enemy they stopped and we recognized major strong of mcpherson's staff whom they all knew as he was the chief inspector of our corps and in the ambulance he had the body of general mcpherson major strong it appears during the slight lull in the fighting at that part of the line having taken an ambulance and driven into the very jaws of death to recover the remains of his loved commander it seems he found the body right by the side of the little road that we had gone out on when we went to the rear he was dead when he found him having been shot off his horse the bullet striking him in the back just below his heart probably killing him instantly there was a young fellow with him who was wounded also when strong found them he belonged to our first division and recognized general mcpherson and stood by him until major strong came up he was in the ambulance with the body of mcpherson when they stopped by us it seems that when the fight opened away back in the rear where we had been and at the left of the sixteenth corps which was almost directly in the rear of the seventeenth corps mcpherson sent his staff and orderlies with various orders to different parts of the line and started himself to ride over from the seventeenth corps to the sixteenth corps taking exactly the same course our regiment had perhaps an hour before but the rebels had discovered there was a gap between the sixteenth and seventeenth corps and meeting no opposition to their advances in the strip of woods where they were hidden from view they had marched right along down in the rear and with their line at right angles with the line of works occupied by the left of the seventeenth corps they were thus parallel and close to the little road mcpherson had taken and probably he rode right into them and was killed before he realized the true situation having piled our knapsacks and left a couple of our older men who were played out with the heat and most ready to drop with sunstroke to guard them we started out again the ambulance with the corpse of general mcpherson moved off towards the right of the army which was the last we ever saw of that brave and handsome soldier we bore off a little to the right of a large open field on top of a high hill where one of our batteries was bounding away at a tremendous rate we came up to the main line of works just about at the left of the fifteenth corps they seemed to be having an easy time of it just then no fighting going on in their front except occasional shots from some heavy guns on the main line of rebel works around the city we crossed right over 
the fifteenth corps works and filed to the left keeping along on the outside of our works we had not gone far before the rebel gunners in the main works around the city discovered us and the way they did tear loose at us was a caution their aim was rather bad however and most of their shots went over us we saw one of them i think it was a shell strike an artillery caisson belonging to one of our batteries it exploded as it struck and then the caisson which was full of ammunition exploded with an awful noise throwing pieces of wood and iron and its own load of shot and shell high into the air scattering death and destruction to the men and horses attached to it we thought we saw arms and legs and parts of bodies of men flying in every direction but we were glad to learn afterwards that it was the contents of the knapsacks of the battery boys who had strapped them on the caissons for transportation just after passing the hill where our battery was making things so lively they stopped firing to let us pass we saw general leggett our division commander come riding toward us he was outside of our line of works too you know how we build breastworks sort of zigzag like you know so that they cannot be enfiladed well that's just the way the works were along there and you never saw such a curious shape as we formed our division in why part of them were on one side of the works and go along a little further and here was a regiment or a part of a regiment on the other side both sets firing in opposite directions no siree they were not demoralized or in confusion they were cool and, and as steady as on parade but the old division had you know never been driven from any position they had once taken in all their long service and they did not propose to leave that ridge until they got orders from some one beside the rebs there were times when a fellow did not know which side of the works was the safest for the johnnies were in front of us and in rear of us you see our fourth division which had been to the left of us had been forced to quit their works when the rebs got into the works in their rear so that our division was now at the point where our line turned sharply to the left and rear in the direction of the sixteenth corps we got into business before we had been there over three minutes a line of the rebs tried to charge across the open fields in front of us but by the help of the old twenty-four pounders which proved to be part of cooper's illinois battery that we had been alongside of in many a hard fight before we drove them back a flying only to have to jump over on the outside of our works the next minute to tackle a heavy force that came for our rear through that blasted strip of woods we soon drove them off and the firing on both sides seemed to have pretty much stopped our brigade which we discovered was now commanded by old whiskers colonel powell's of the seventy eighth ohio i'll bet he's got the longest whiskers of any man in the army you see general scott had not been seen or heard of since he had started to the rear after our dredgment when the fighting first commenced we all believed that he was either killed or captured or he would have been with his command he was a splendid soldier and a bulldog of a fighter his absence was a great loss but we had not much time to think of such things for our brigade was then ordered to leave the works and to move to the right about twenty or thirty rods across a large ravine where we were placed in position in an open cornfield forming a new line at quite an angle from the line of works we had just left extending to the left and getting us back nearer on to a line with the sixteenth corps the battery of howitzers now reinforced by a part of the third ohio heavy guns still occupied the old works on the highest part of the hill just to the right of our new line we took our position just on the brow of a hill and were ordered to lie down and the rear rank to go for rails which we discovered a few rods behind us in the shape of a good ten rail fence every rear rank chap came back with all the rails he could lug and we barely had time to lay them down in front of us forming a little barricade of six to eight or ten inches high when we heard the most unearthly rebel yell directly in front of us it grew louder and came nearer and nearer until we could see a solid line of the gray coats coming out of the woods and down the opposite slope their battle flags flying officers in front with drawn swords arms at right shoulder and every one of them yelling like so many sioux indians the line seemed to be massed six or eight ranks deep followed closely by the second line and that by the third each if possible yelling louder and appearing more desperately reckless than the one ahead at their first appearance we opened on them and so did the bully old twenty-four pounders with canister 
on they came the first line staggered and wavered back on to the second which was coming on the double quick such a raking as we did give them oh lordy how we did wish that we had the breech loading spencers or winchesters but we had the old reliable springfields and we poured it in hot and heavy by the time the charging column got down the opposite slope and were struggling through the thicket of undergrowth in the ravine they were one confused mass of officers and men the three lines now forming one solid column which made several desperate efforts to rush up to the top of the hill where we were punishing them so one of their first surges came mighty near going right over the left of our regiment as they were lying down behind their little rail piles but the boys clubbed their guns and the officers used their revolvers and swords and drove them back down the hill the seventy eighth and twentieth ohio our right and left bowers who had been brigaded with us ever since shiloh were into it as hot and heavy as we had been and had lost numbers of their officers and men but were hanging on to their little rail pals when the fight was over at one time the rebs were right in on top of the seventy eighth one big reb grabbed their colors and tried to pull them out of the hands of the color bearer but old captain orr a little short dried up fellow about sixty years old struck him with his sword across the back of the neck and killed him deader than a mackerel right in his tracks it was now getting dark and the johnnies concluded they had taken a bigger contract in trying to drive us off that hill in one day than they had counted on so they quit charging on us but drew back under cover of the woods and along the old line of works that we had left and kept up a pecking away and sharp shooting at us all night long they opened fire on us from a number of pieces of artillery from the front from the left and from some heavy guns away over to the right of us in the main works around atlanta we did not fool away much time that night either we got our shovels and picks and while part of us were sharpshooting and trying to keep the rebels from working up too close to us the rest of the boys were putting up some good solid earthworks right where our rail piles had been and by morning we were in splendid shape to have received our friends no matter which way they had come at us for they kept up such an all-fired shelling of us from so many different directions that the boys had built traverses and bomb proofs at all sorts of angles and in all directions there was one point off to our right a few rods up along our old line of works where there was a crowd of rebel sharpshooters that annoyed us more than all the rest by their constant firing at us through the night they killed one of company h s boys and wounded several others finally captain williams of d company came along and said he wanted a couple of good shots out of our company to go with him so i went for one he took about ten of us and we crawled down into the ravine in front of where we were building the works and got behind a large fallen tree and we laid there and could just fire right up into the rear of those fellows as they lay behind a traverse extending back from our old line of works it was so dark we could only see where to fire by the flash of guns but every time they would shoot some of us would let them have one they stayed there until almost daylight when they concluded as things looked since we were going to stay they had better be going it was an awful night down in the ravine below us lay hundreds of killed and wounded rebels groaning and crying about loud for water and for help we did do what we could for those right around us but it was so dark and so many shell bursting and bullets flying around that a fellow could not get about much i tell you it was pretty tough next morning to go along to the different companies of our regiment and hear who were among the killed and wounded and to see the long row of graves that were being dug to bury our comrades and our officers there was the captain of company e nelson skeels of fulton county o one of the bravest and best officers in the regiment by his side lay first sergeant lesnit and next were the two great powerful shepherds cousins but more like brothers one it seems was killed while supporting the head of the other who had just received a death wound thus dying in each other's arms but i can't begin to think or tell you the names of all the poor boys that we laid away to rest in their last long sleep on that gloomy day our major was severely wounded and several other officers had been hit more or less badly it was a frightful sight though to go over the field in front of our works on that morning the rebel dead and badly wounded laid where they had fallen the bottom and opposite side of the ravine showed how destructive our fire and that of the canister from the howitzers had been the underbrush was cut slashed and torn into shreds and the larger trees were scarred 
hard bruised and broken by the thousands of bullets and other missiles that had been poured into them from almost every conceivable direction during the day before a lot of us boys went way over to the left into fuller's division of the sixteenth corps to see how some of our boys over there had got through the scrimmage for they had about as nasty a fight as any part of the army and if it had not been for their being just where they were i'm not sure but what the old seventeenth corps would have had a different story to tell now we found our friends had been way out by decatur where their brigade had got into a pretty lively fight on their own hook we got back to camp and the first thing i knew i was detailed for picket duty and we were posted over a few rods across the ravine in our front we had not been out but a short time when we saw a flag of truce borne by an officer coming towards us we halted him and made him wait until a report was sent back to corps headquarters the rebel officer was quite chatty and talkative with our picket officer while waiting he said he was on general claiborne's staff and that the troops had charged us so fiercely the evening before was claiborne's whole division and that after their last repulse knowing the hill where we were posted was the most important position along our line he felt that if they would keep close to us during the night and keep up a show of fight that we would pull out and abandon the hill before morning he said that he with about fifty of their best men had volunteered to keep up the demonstration and it was his party that had occupied the traverse in our old works the night before and had annoyed us and the battery men by their constant sharpshooting which we fellows behind the old tree had finally tired out he said they stayed until almost daylight and that he lost more than half his men before he left he also told us that general scott was captured by their division at about the time and almost the same spot as where general mcpherson was killed and that he was not hurt or wounded and was now a prisoner in their hands quite a lot of our staff officers soon came out and as near as we could learn the rebels wanted a truce to bury their dead our folks tried to get up an exchange of prisoners that had been taken by both sides the day before but for some reason they could not bring it about but the truce for burying the dead was agreed to along about dusk some of the boys on my post got to telling about a lot of silver and brass instruments that belonged to one of the bands of the fourth division which had been hung up in some small trees a little way over in front of where we were when the fight was going on the day before and that when a bullet would strike one of the horns they could hear it go a pinging and in a few minutes ping would go another bullet through one of them a new picket was just coming on and i picked up my blanket and haversack and was about ready to start back to camp when thinks i i'll just go out there and see about them horns i told the boys what i was going to do they all seemed to think it was safe enough so out i started I had not gone more than a hundred yards i should think when they hear i found the horns all hanging around on the trees just as the boys had described some of them had lots of bullet holes in them but i saw a beautiful nice-looking silver bugle hanging off to one side a little i think says i i'll just take that little toot horn in out of the wet and take it back to camp i was just reaching up after it when i heard some one say halt and i'll be dog-boned if there wasn't two of the meanest-looking rebels standing not ten feet from me with their guns cocked and pointed at me and of course i knew i was a goner they walked me back about one hundred and fifty yards where their picket line was from there i was kept going for an hour or two until we got over to a place on the railroad called east point there i got in with a big crowd of our prisoners who were taken the day before and we have been fooling along in a lot of old cattle cars getting down here ever since so this is andersonville is it well by god end of chapter forty chapter forty one of andersonville a story of rebel military prisons by john mcelroy this librivox recording is in the public domain clothing its rapid deterioration and devices to replenish it desperate efforts to cover nakedness little red cap and his letter clothing had now become an object of real solicitude to us older prisoners the veterans of our crowd the surviving remnant of those captured at gettysburg had been prisoners over a year the next in seniority the chickamauga boys had been in ten months the mine run fellows were eight months old and my battalion had had seven months incarceration 
none of us were models of well-dressed gentlemen when captured our garments told the whole story of the hard campaigning we had undergone now with months of the wear and tear of prison life sleeping on the sand working in tunnels digging wells etc we were tattered and torn to an extent that a second-class tramp would have considered disgraceful this is no reflection upon the quality of the clothes furnished by the government we simply reach the limit of the wear of textile fabrics i am particular to say this because i want to contribute my little mite towards doing justice to a badly abused part of our army organization the quartermaster's department it is fashionable to speak of shoddy and utter some stereotyped sneers about brown paper shoes and mosquito netting overcoats when any discussion of the quartermaster service is the subject of conversation but i have no hesitation in asking the endorsement of my comrades to the statement that we have never found anywhere else as durable garments as those furnished us by the government during our service in the army the clothes were not as fine in texture nor so stylish in cut as those we wore before or since but when it came to wear they could be relied on to the last thread it was always marvellous to me that they lasted so well with the rough usage a soldier in the field must necessarily give them but to return to my subject i can best illustrate the way our clothes dropped off us piece by piece like the petals from the last rose of summer by taking my own case as an example when i entered prison i was clad in the ordinary garb of an enlisted man of the cavalry stout comfortable boots woollen pox drawers pantaloons with a reinforcement or ready-made patches as the infantry call them vest warm snug-fitting jacket under and over shirts heavy overcoat and a forage cap first my boots fell into cureless ruin but this was no special hardship as the weather had become quite warm and it was more pleasant than otherwise to go barefooted then part of the underclothing retired from service the jacket and vest followed therein being hastened by having their best portions taken to patch up the pantaloons which kept giving out at the most embarrassing places then the cape of the overcoat was called upon to assist in repairing these continually recurring breaches in the nether garments the same incessant demand finally consumed the whole coat in a vain attempt to prevent an exposure of person greater than consistent with the usages of society the pantaloons or wet by courtesy i called such were a monument of careful and ingenious but hopeless patching that should have called forth the admiration of a florentine artist in mosaic i have been shown in later years many table-tops ornamented in marquetry inlaid with thousands of little bits of wood cunningly arranged and patiently joined together i always look at them with interest for i know the work spent upon them i remember my andersonville pantaloons the clothing upon the upper part of my body had been reduced to the remains of a knit undershirt it had fallen into so many holes that it looked like the coarse riddles through which ashes and gravel are sifted wherever these holes were the sun had burned my back breast and shoulders deeply black the parts covered by the threads and fragments forming the boundaries of the holes were still white when i pulled my lead shirt off to wash or to free it from some of its teeming population my skin showed a fine lace pattern in black and white that was very interesting to my comrades and the subject of countless jokes by them they used to descant loudly on the chaste elegance of the design the richness of the tracing etc and begged me to furnish them with a copy of it when i got home for their sisters to work window curtains or tidies by they were sure that so striking a novelty in patterns would be very acceptable i would reply to their witticisms in the language of portia's prince of morocco mislike me not for my complexion the shattered livery of the burning sun one of the stories told me in my childhood by an old negro nurse was of a poverty-stricken little girl who slept on the floor and was covered with the door and she once asked mamma how do you poor folks get along who haven't any door in the same spirit i used to wonder how poor fellows got along who hadn't any shirt one common way of keeping up one's clothing was by stealing meal sacks the meal furnished as rations was brought in white cotton sacks sergeants of detachments were required to return these when the rations were issued the next day i before alluded to the general incapacity of the rebels to deal accurately with even simple numbers it was never very difficult for a shrewd sergeant to make nine sacks count as ten after a while the rebels began to see through this sleight of hand manipulation and to check it 
then the sergeants resorted to the device of tearing the sacks in two and turning each half in as a whole one the cotton cloth gained in this way was used for patching or if a boy could succeed in beating the rebels out of enough of it he would fabricate himself a shirt or a pair of pantaloons we obtained all our thread in the same way a half of a sack carefully ravelled out would furnish a couple of handfuls of thread had it not been for this resource all our sewing and mending would have come to a standstill most of our needles were manufactured by ourselves from bones a piece of bone split as near as possible to the required size was carefully rubbed down upon a brick and then had an eye laboriously worked through it with a bit of wire or something else available for the purpose the needles were about the size of ordinary darning needles and answered the purpose very well these devices gave one some conception of the way savages provide for the wants of their lives time was with them as with us of little importance it was no loss of time to them nor to us to spend a large portion of the waking hours of a week in fabricating a needle out of a bone where a civilized man could purchase a much better one with the product of three minutes labor i do not think any red indian of the plains exceeded us in the patience with which we worked away at these minutiae of life's needs of course the most common source of clothing was the dead and no body was carried out with any clothing on it that could be of service to the survivors the plymouth pilgrims who were so well clothed on coming in and were now dying off very rapidly furnished many good suits to cover the nakedness of older prisoners most of the prisoners from the army of the potomac were well dressed and as very many died within a month or six weeks after their entrance they left their clothes in pretty good condition for those who constituted themselves their heirs administrators and assigns for my own part i had the greatest aversion to wearing dead men's clothes and could only bring myself to it after i had been a year in prison and it became a question between doing that and freezing to death every new batch of prisoners was besieged with anxious inquiries on the subject which lay closest to all our hearts what are they doing about exchange nothing in human experience save the anxious expectancy of a sail by castaways on a desert island could equal the intense eagerness with which this question was asked and the answer awaited to thousands now hanging on the verge of eternity it meant life or death between the first day of july and the first of november over twelve thousand men died who would doubtless have lived had they been able to reach our lines get to god's country as we expressed it the newcomers brought little reliable news of contemplated exchange there was none to bring in the first place and in the next soldiers in active service in the field had other things to busy themselves with than reading up the details of the negotiations between the commissioners of exchange they had all heard rumors however and by the time they reached andersonville they had crystallized these into actual statements of fact half hour after they entered the stockade a report like this would spread like wildfire an army of the potomac man has just come in who was captured in front of petersburg he says that he read in the new york herald the day before he was taken that an exchange had been agreed upon and that our ships had already started for savannah to take us home then our hopes would soar up like balloons we fed ourselves on such stuff from day to day and doubtless many lives were greatly prolonged by the continual encouragement there was hardly a day when i did not say to myself that i would much rather die than endure imprisonment another month and had i believed that another month would see me still there i am pretty certain that i should have ended the matter by crossing the dead line i was firmly resolved not to die the disgusting agonizing death that so many around me were dying one of our best purveyors of information was a bright blue-eyed fair-haired little drummer boy as handsome as a girl well-bred as a lady and evidently the darling of some refined loving mother he belonged i think to some loyal virginia regiment was captured in one of the actions in the shenandoah valley and had been with us in richmond we called him red cap from his wearing a jaunty gold-laced crimson cap ordinarily the smaller a drummer boy is the harder he is but no amount of attrition with rough men could course the ingrained refinement of red cap's manners he was between thirteen and fourteen and it seemed utterly shameful that men calling themselves soldier should make war on such a tender boy and drag him off to prison but no six-footer had a more soldierly heart than little red cap and none were more loyal to the cause it was a pleasure to hear him tell the story of the fights and movements his regiment had been engaged in he was a good observer and told his tale with boyish fervour shortly afterwards 
assumed command he took red cap into his office as an orderly his bright face and winning manner fascinated the women visitors at headquarters and numbers of them tried to adopt him but with poor success like the rest of us he could see few charms in an existence under the rebel flag and turned a deaf ear to the blandishments he kept his ears open to the conversation of the rebel officers around him and frequently secured permission to visit the interior of the stockade when he would communicate to us all that he has heard he received a flattering reception every time he came in and no orator ever secured a more attentive audience than would gather around him to listen to what he had to say he was beyond a doubt the best known and most popular person in the prison and i know all the survivors of his old admirer share my great interest in him and my curiosity as to whether he yet lives and whether his subsequent career has justified the sanguine hopes we all had as to his future i hope that if he sees this or any one who knows anything about him he will communicate with me there are thousands who would be glad to hear from him a most remarkable coincidence occurred in regard to this comrade several days after the above had been written and set up but before it had yet appeared in the paper i received the following letter eckhart mines allegheny county maryland march twenty fourth to the editor of the blade last evening i saw a copy of your paper in which was a chapter or two of a prison life of a soldier during the late war i was forcibly struck with the correctness of what he wrote and the names of several of my old comrades which he quoted hill limber jim etc etc i was a drummer boy of company one tenth west virginia infantry and was fifteen years of age a day or two after arriving in andersonville which was in the last of february eighteen eighty four nineteen of my comrades were there with me and poor fellows they are there yet i have no doubt that i would have remained there too had i not been more fortunate i do not know who your soldier correspondent is but assume to say that from the following description he will remember having seen me in andersonville i was the little boy that for three or four months officiated as orderly for captain wirtz i wore a red cap and every day could be seen riding wirtz's gray mare either at headquarters or about the stockade i was acting in this capacity when the six raiders mosby proper name collins delaney curtis and i forget the other names were executed i believe that i was the first that conveyed the intelligence to them that confederate general winder had approved their sentence as soon as words received the dispatch to that effect i ran down to the stocks and told them i visited hill of, of wauseon fulton county ohio since the war and found him hale and hearty i have not heard from him for a number of years until reading your correspondence letter last evening it is the only letter of the series that i have seen but after reading that one i feel called upon to certify that i have no doubts of the truthfulness of your correspondence story the world will never know or believe the horrors of andersonville and other prisons in the south no living human being in my judgment will ever be able to properly paint the horrors of those infernal dens i formed the acquaintance of several ohio soldiers whilst in prison among these were o d streeter of cleveland who went to andersonville about the same time that i did and escaped and was the only man that i ever knew that escaped and reached our lines after an absence of several months he was retaken in one of sherman's battles before atlanta and brought back i also knew john l richards of fostoria seneca county ohio or eaglesville wood county also a man by the name of beverly who was a partner of charles Bev of tennessee i would like to hear from all of these parties they all know me mr editor i will close by wishing all my comrades who shared in the sufferings and dangers of confederate prisons a long and useful life yours truly ransom t powell End of chapter forty one chapter forty two of andersonville a story of rebel military prisons by john McElroy. this librivox recording is in the public domain some features of the mortality percentage of deaths to those living an average mean only stands the misery three months description of the prison and the condition of the men therein by a leading scientific man of the south speaking of the manner in which the plymouth pilgrims were now dying 
i am reminded of my theory that the ordinary man's endurance of this prison life did not average over three months the plymouth boys arrived in may the bulk of those who died passed away in july and august the great increase of prisoners from all sources was in may june and july the greatest mortality among these was in august september and october many came in who had been in good health during their service in the field but who seemed utterly overwhelmed by the appalling misery they saw on every hand and giving way to despondency died in a few days or weeks i do not mean to include them in the above class as their sickness was more mental than physical my idea is that taking one hundred ordinarily healthful young soldiers from a regiment in active service and putting them into andersonville by the end of the third month at least thirty-three of those weakest and most vulnerable to disease would have succumbed to the exposure the pollution of ground and air and the insufficiency of the ration of coarse corn meal after this the mortality would be somewhat less say at the end of six months fifty of them would be dead the remainder would hang on still more tenaciously and at the end of a year there would be fifteen or twenty still alive there were sixty-three of my company taken thirteen lived through i believe this was about the usual proportion for those who were in as long as we in all there were forty-five thousand six hundred and thirteen prisoners brought into andersonville of these twelve thousand nine hundred and twelve died there to say nothing of thousands that died in other prisons in georgia and the carolinas immediately after their removal from andersonville one of every three and a half men upon whom the gates of the stockade closed never repassed them alive twenty-nine per cent of the boys who so much as set foot in andersonville died there let it be kept in mind all the time that the average stay of a prisoner there was not four months the great majority came in after the first of may and left before the middle of september may one eighteen sixty four there were ten thousand four hundred and twenty seven in the stockade august eight there were thirty three thousand one hundred and fourteen september thirty all these were dead or gone except eight thousand two hundred and eighteen of whom four thousand five hundred and ninety died inside of the next thirty days the records of the world can show no parallel to this astounding mortality since the above matter was first published in the blade a friend has sent me a transcript of the evidence at the wurtz trial of professor joseph jones a surgeon of high rank in the rebel army and who stood at the head of the medical profession in georgia he visited andersonville at the instance of the surgeon-general of the confederate states army to make a study for the benefit of science of the phenomena of disease occurring there his capacity and opportunities for observation and for clearly estimating the value of the facts coming under his notice were of course vastly superior to mine and as he states the case stronger than i dared to for fear of being accused of exaggeration and downright untruth i reproduced the major part of his testimony embodying also his official report to medical headquarters at richmond that my readers may know how the prison appeared to the eyes of one who though a bitter rebel was still a humane man and a conscientious observer striving to learn the truth medical testimony transcript from the printed testimony at the wurtz trial pages six eighteen to six thirty nine inclusive october seventh eighteen eighty five dr joseph jones for the prosecution by the judge advocate question where do you reside answer in augusta georgia question are you a graduate of any medical college answer of the university of pennsylvania question how long have you been engaged in the practice of medicine answer eight years question has your experience been as a practitioner rather as an investigator of medicine as a science answer both question what position do you hold now answer that of medical chemist in the medical college of georgia at augusta question how long have you held your position in that college answer since eighteen fifty eight question how were you employed during the rebellion answer i served six months in the early part of it as a private in the ranks and the rest of the time in the medical department question under the direction of whom answer under the direction of dr moore surgeon-general question did you while acting under his direction visit andersonville professionally answer yes sir question for the purpose of making investigations there answer for the purpose of prosecuting investigations ordered by the surgeon-general question you went there in obedience to a letter of instructions answer in obedience to orders which i received 
question did you reduce the results of your investigations to the shape of a report answer i was engaged at that work when general johnston surrendered his army a document being handed to witness question have you examined this extract from your report and compared it with the original answer yes sir i have question is it accurate answer so far as my examination extended it is accurate the document just examined by witness was offered in evidence and is as follows observations upon the diseases of the federal prisoners confined to camp sumter andersonville in sumter county georgia instituted with a view to illustrate chiefly the origin and causes of hospital gangrene the relations of continued and malarial fevers and the pathology of camp diarrhea and dysentery by joseph jones surgeon p a c s professor of medical chemistry in the medical college of georgia at augusta georgia hearing of the unusual mortality among the federal prisoners confined at andersonville georgia in the month of august eighteen sixty four during a visit to richmond virginia i expressed to the surgeon-general s p moore confederate states of america a desire to visit camp sumter with the design of instituting a series of inquiries upon the nature and causes of the prevailing diseases smallpox had appeared among the prisoners and i believed that this would prove an admirable field for the establishment of its characteristic lesions the condition of payers glands in this disease was considered as worthy of minute investigation it was believed that a large body of men from the northern portion of the united states States, suddenly transported to a warm southern climate and confined upon a small portion of land would furnish an excellent field for the investigation of the relations of typhus typhoid and malarial fevers the surgeon-general of the confederate states of america furnished me with the following letter of introduction to the surgeon in charge of the confederate states military prison at andersonville georgia confederate states of america surgeon-general's office richmond virginia august sixth eighteen sixty four sir the field of pathological investigations afforded by the large collection of federal prisoners in georgia is of great extent and importance and it is believed that results of value to the profession may be obtained by careful investigation of the effects of disease upon the large body of men subjected to a decided change of climate and those circumstances peculiar to prison life the surgeon in charge of the hospital for federal prisoners together with his assistants will afford every facility to surgeon joseph jones in the prosecution of the labors ordered by the surgeon-general efficient assistance must be rendered surgeon jones by the medical officers not only in his examinations into the causes and symptoms of the various diseases but especially in the arduous labors of post-mortem examinations the medical officers will assist in the performance of such post-mortems as surgeon jones may indicate in order that this great field for pathological investigation may be explored for the benefit of the medical department of the confederate army s p moore surgeon-general surgeon isaiah h white in charge of hospital for federal prisoners andersonville georgia in compliance with this letter of the surgeon-general isaiah h white chief surgeon of the post and r r stevenson surgeon in charge of the prison hospital afforded the necessary facilities for the prosecution of my investigations among the sick outside of the stockade after the completion of my labors in the military prison hospital the following communication was addressed to brigadier general john h winder in consequence of the refusal of on the part of the commandant of the interior of the confederate states military prison to admit me within the stockade upon the order of the surgeon general camp sumter andersonville georgia september sixteenth eighteen sixty four general i respectfully request the commandant of the post of andersonville to grant me permission and to furnish the necessary pass to visit the sick and medical officers within the stockade of the confederate states prison i desire to institute certain inquiries ordered by the surgeon-general surgeon isaiah h white chief surgeon of the post and surgeon r r stevenson in charge of the prison hospital have afforded me every facility for the prosecution of my labors among the sick outside of the stockade very respectfully your obedient servant joseph jones surgeon p a c s brigadier-general john h winder commandant post andersonville 
in the absence of general winder from the post captain winder furnished the following order camp sumter andersonville september seventeenth eighteen sixty four captain you will permit surgeon joseph jones who has orders from the surgeon general to visit the sick within the stockade that are under medical treatment surgeon jones is ordered to make certain investigations which may prove useful to his profession by direction of general winder very respectfully w ace winder a a g captain h wirtz commanding prison description of the confederate states military prison hospital at andersonville number of prisoners physical condition food clothing habits moral condition diseases the confederate military prison at andersonville georgia consists of a strong stockade twenty feet in height enclosing twenty-seven acres the stockade is formed of strong pine logs firmly planted in the ground the main stockade is surrounded by two other similar rows of pine logs the middle stockade being sixteen feet high and the outer twelve feet these are intended for offence and defence if the inner stockade should at any time be forced by the prisoners the second forms another line of defence while in case of an attempt to deliver the prisoners by a force operating upon the exterior the outer line forms an admirable protection to the confederate troops and a most formidable obstacle to cavalry or infantry the four angles of the outer line are strengthened by earthworks upon commanding eminences from which the cannon in case of an outbreak among the prisoners may sweep the entire enclosure and it was designed to connect these works by a line of rifle pits running zigzag around the outer stockade those rifle pits have never been completed the ground enclosed by the innermost stockade lies in the form of a parallelogram the larger diameter running almost due north and south this space includes the northern and southern opposing sides of two hills between which a stream of water runs from west to east the surface soil of these hills is composed chiefly of sand with varying admixtures of clay and oxide of iron the clay is sufficiently tenacious to give a considerable degree of consistency to the soil the internal structure of the hills as revealed by the deep wells is similar to that already described the alternate layers of clay and sand as well as the oxide of iron which forms in its various combinations a cement to the sand allow of extensive tunneling the prisoners not only constructed numerous dirt huts with balls of clay and sand taken from the wells which they have excavated all over those hills but they have also in some cases tunneled extensively from these wells the lower portions of these hills bordering on the stream are wet and boggy from the constant oozing of water the stockade was built originally to accommodate only ten thousand prisoners and included at first seventeen acres near the close of the month of june the area was enlarged by the addition of ten acres the ground added was situated on the northern slope of the largest hill the average number of square feet of ground to each prisoner in august eighteen sixty four thirty five point seven within the circumscribed area of the stockade the federal prisoners were compelled to perform all the offices of life cooking washing the calls of nature exercise and sleeping during the month of march the prison was less crowded than at any subsequent time and then the average space of ground to each prisoner was only ninety eight point seven feet or less than seven square yards the federal prisoners were gathered from all parts of the confederate states east of the mississippi and crowded into the confined space until in the month of june the average number of square feet of ground to each prisoner was only thirty three point two or less than four square yards these figures represent the condition of the stockade in a better light even than it really was for a considerable breadth of land along the stream flowing from west to east between the hills was low and boggy and was covered with the excrement of the men and thus rendered wholly uninhabitable and in fact and useless for every purpose except that of defecation the pines and other small trees and shrubs which originally were scattered sparsely over these hills were in a short time cut down and consumed by the prisoners for firewood and no shade tree was left in the entire enclosure of the stockade with their characteristic industry and ingenuity the federals constructed for themselves small huts and caves and attempted to shield themselves from the rain and sun and night damps and dew but few tents were distributed to the prisoners and those were in most cases torn and rotten in the location and arrangement of these tents and huts no order appears to have been followed in fact regular streets appeared to be out of the question in so crowded an area especially too as large bodies of prisoners were from time to time added suddenly without any previous preparations the irregular arrangement of the huts and imperfect shelters was very unfavourable for the maintenance of a proper system of police 
the police and internal economy of the prison was left almost entirely in the hands of the prisoners themselves the duties of confederate soldiers acting as guards being limited to the occupation of the boxes or lookouts ranged around the stockade at regular intervals and to the manning of the batteries at the angles of the prison even judicial matters pertaining to themselves as the detection and punishment of such crimes as theft and murder appear to have been in a great measure abandoned to the prisoners a striking instance of this occurred in the month of july when the federal prisoners within the stockade tried condemned and hanged six of their own number who had been convicted of stealing and of robbing and murdering their fellow prisoners they were all hung upon the same day and thousands of the prisoners gathered around to witness the execution the confederate authorities are said not to have interfered with these proceedings in this collection of men from all parts of the world every phase of human character was represented the stronger preyed upon the weaker and even the sick who were unable to defend themselves were robbed of their scanty supplies of food and clothing dark stories were afloat of men both sick and well who were murdered at night strangled to death by their comrades for scant supplies of clothing or money i heard a sick and wounded federal prisoner accuse his nurse a fellow prisoner of the united states army of having stealthily during his sleep inoculated his wounded arm with gangrene that he might destroy his life and fall heir to his clothing the large number of men confined within the stockade soon under a defective system of police and with imperfect arrangements covered the surface of the low grounds with excrements the sinks over the lower portions of the stream were imperfect in their plan and structure and the excrements were in large measure deposited so near the borders of the stream as not to be washed away or else accumulated upon the low boggy ground the volume of water was not sufficient to wash away the feces and they accumulated in such quantities in the lower portion of the stream as to form a mass of liquid excrement heavy rains caused the water of the stream to rise and as the arrangements for the passage of the increased amounts of water out of the stockade were insufficient the liquid feces overflowed the low grounds and covered them several inches after the subsidence of the waters the action of the sun upon this putrefying mass of excrements and fragments of bread and meat and bones excited most rapid fermentation and developed a horrible stench improvements were projected for the removal of the filth and for the prevention of its accumulation but they were only partially and imperfectly carried out as the forces of the prisoners were reduced by confinement want of exercise and proper diet and by scurvy diarrhoea and dysentery they were unable to excavate to evacuate their bowels within the stream or along its banks and the excrements were deposited at the very doors of their tents the vast majority appeared to lose all repulsion to filth and both sick and well disregarded all the laws of hygiene and personal cleanliness the accommodations for the sick were imperfect and insufficient from the organization of the prison february twenty fourth eighteen sixty four to may twenty two the sick were treated within the stockade in the crowded condition of the stockade and with the tents and huts clustered thickly around the hospital it was impossible to secure proper ventilation or to maintain the necessary police the federal prisoners also made frequent forays upon the hospital stores and carried off the food and clothing of the sick the hospital was on the twenty second of may removed to its present site without this stockade and five acres of ground covered with oaks and pines appropriated to the use of the sick the supply of medical officers has been insufficient from the foundation of the prison the nurses and attendants upon the sick have been most generally federal prisoners who in too many cases appear to have been devoid of moral principle and who not only neglected their duties but were also engaged in extensive robbing of the sick from the want of proper police and hygienic regulations alone it is not wonderful that from february twenty fourth to september twenty one eighteen sixty four nine thousand four hundred and seventy nine deaths nearly one-third the entire number of prisoners should have been recorded i found the stockade in the hospital in the following condition during my pathological investigations instituted in the month of september eighteen sixty four stockade confederate states military prison at the time of my visit to andersonville a large number of federal prisoners had been removed to millen savannah charleston and other parts of the confederacy in anticipation of an advance of general sherman's forces from atlanta with the design of liberating their captive brethren however about fifteen thousand prisoners remained confined within the limits of the stockade and confederate states military prison hospital 
in the stockade with the exception of the damp lowlands bordering the small stream the surface was covered with huts and small ragged tents and parts of blankets and fragments of oilcloth coats and blankets stretched upon stacks the tents and huts were not arranged according to any order and there was in most parts of the enclosure scarcely room for two men to walk abreast between the tents and huts if one might judge from the large pieces of corn bread scattered about in every direction on the ground the prisoners were either very lavishly supplied with this article of diet or else this kind of food was not relished by them each day the dead from the stockade were carried out by their fellow-prisoners and deposited upon the ground under a bush arbor just outside of the southwestern gate from thence they were carried in carts to the burying ground one quarter of a mile northwest of the prison the dead were buried without coffins side by side in trenches four feet deep the low grounds bordering the stream were covered with human excrements and filth of all kinds which in many places appeared to be alive with working maggots an indescribable sickening stench arose from these fermenting masses of human filth there were near five thousand seriously ill federals in the stockade and confederate states military prison hospital and the deaths exceeded one hundred per day and large numbers of the prisoners who were walking about and who had not been entered upon the sick reports were suffering from severe and incurable diarrhoea dysentery and scurvy the sick were attended almost entirely by their fellow-prisoners appointed as nurses and as they received but little attention they were compelled to exert themselves at all times to attend to the calls of nature and hence they retained the power of moving about to within a comparatively short period of the close of life owing to the slow progress of the diseases most prevalent diarrhoea and chronic dysentery the corpses were as a general rule emaciated i visited two thousand sick within the stockade lying under some long sheds which had been built at the northern portion for themselves at this time only one medical officer was in attendance whereas at least twenty medical officers should have been employed died in the stockade from its organization february twenty four eighteen sixty one to september twenty one three thousand two hundred and fifty four died in hospital during same time six thousand two hundred and twenty five total deaths in hospital and stockade nine thousand four hundred and seventy nine scurvy diarrhoea dysentery and hospital gangrene were the prevailing diseases i was surprised to find but few cases of malarial fever and no well-marked cases either of typhus or typhoid fever the absence of the different forms of malarial fever may be accounted for in the supposition that the artificial atmosphere of the stockade crowded densely with human beings and loaded with animal exhalations was unfavorable to the existence and action of the malarial poison the absence of typhoid and typhus fevers amongst all the causes which are supposed to generate these diseases appeared to be due to the fact that the great majority of these prisoners had been in captivity in virginia at bell island and in other parts of the confederacy for months and even as long as two years and during this time they had been subjected to the same bad influences and those had not had these fevers before either had them during their confinement in confederate prisons or else their systems from long exposure were proof against their action the effects of scurvy were manifested on every hand and in all its various stages from the muddy pale complexion pale gums feeble languid muscular motions lowness of spirits and fetid breath to the dusky dirty leaden complexion swollen features spongy purple livid fungoid bleeding gums loose teeth e dematis limbs covered with livid vibices and petichii spasmodically flexed painful and hardened extremities spontaneous hemorrhages from mucous canals and large ill-conditioned spreading ulcers covered with a dark purplish fungus growth observed that in some of the cases of scurvy the pair to glands were greatly swollen and in some instances to such an extent as to preclude entirely the power to articulate in several cases of dropsy of the abdomen and lower extremities supervening upon scurvy the patients affirmed that previously to the appearance of the dropsy they had suffered with profuse and obstinate diarrhoea and that when this was checked by a change of diet from indian corn bread baked with the husk to boiled rice the dropsy appeared the severe pains and livid patches were frequently associated with swelling in various parts and especially in the lower extremities accompanied with stiffness and contractions of the knee joints and ankles and often with a brawny feel of the parts as if lymph had been effused between the integuments and epineuroses 
preventing the motion of the skin over the swollen parts many of the prisoners believed that the scurvy was contagious and i saw men guarding their wells and springs fearing lest some man suffering with the scurvy might use the water and thus poison them I observed also numerous cases of hospital gangrene and of spreading scorbutic ulcers which had supervened upon slight injuries the scorbutic ulcers presented a dark purple fungoid elevated surface with livid swollen edges and exuded a thin beaded sinus fluid instead of pus many ulcers which originated from the scorbutic condition of the system appeared to become truly gangrenous assuming all the characteristics of hospital gangrene from the crowded condition filthy habits bad diet and dejected depressed condition of the prisoners their systems had become so disordered that the smallest abrasion of the skin from the rubbing of a shoe or from the effects of the sun or from the prick of a splinter or from scratching or a mosquito bite in some cases took on rapid and frightful ulceration and gangrene the long use of salt meat oft times imperfectly cured as well as the most total deprivation of vegetables and fruit appeared to be the chief causes of the scurvy i carefully examined the bakery and the bread furnished the prisoners and found that they were supplied almost entirely with corn bread from which the husk had not been separated this husk acted as an irritant to the alimentary canal without adding any nutriment to the bread as far as my examination extended no fault could be found with the mode in which the bread was baked the difficulty lay in the failure to separate the husk from the corn meal i strongly urged the preparation of large quantities of soup made from the cow and calves heads from with the brains and tongues to which a liberal supply of sweet potatoes and vegetables might have been advantageously added the material existed in abundance for the preparation of such soup in large quantities with but little additional expense such aliment would have been not only highly nutritious but it would also have acted as an efficient remedial agent for the removal of the score beauty condition the sick within the stockade lay under several long sheds which were originally built for barracks these sheds covered two floors which were open on all sides the sick lay upon the bare boards or upon such ragged blankets as they possessed without as far as i observed any bedding or even straw the haggard distressed countenances of these miserable complaining dejected living skeletons crying for medical aid and food and cursing their government for its refusal to exchange prisoners and the ghastly corpses with their glazed eyeballs staring up into vacant space with the flies swarming down of their open and grinning mouths and over their ragged clothes infested with numerous lice as they lay amongst the sick and dying formed a picture of helpless hopeless misery which it would be impossible to portray by words or by the brush a feeling of disappointment and even resentment on account of the united states government upon the subject of the exchange of prisoners appeared to be widespread and the apparent hopeless nature of the negotiations for some general exchange of prisoners appeared to be a cause of universal regret and deep and injurious despondency i heard some of the prisoners go so far as to exonerate the confederate government from any charge of intentionally subjecting them to the protracted confinement with its necessary and unavoidable sufferings in a country cut off from all intercourse with foreign nations nations and sorely pressed on all sides whilst on the other hand they charged their prolonged captivity upon their own government which was attempting to make the negro equal to the white man some hundred or more of the prisoners had been released from confinement in the stockade or on parole and filled various offices as clerks druggists and carpenters etc in the various departments these men were well clothed and presented a stout and healthy appearance and as a general rule they presented a much more robust and healthy appearance than the confederate troops guarding the prisoners the entire grounds are surrounded by a frail board fence and are strictly guarded by confederate soldiers and no prisoner except the paroled attendants is allowed to leave the grounds except by a special permit from the commandant of the interior of the prison the patients and attendants near two thousand in number are crowded into this confined space and are but poorly supplied with old and ragged tents large numbers of them were without any bunks in the tents and lay upon the ground oft times without even a blanket no beds of straw appear to have been furnished the tents extend to within a few yards of the small stream the eastern portion of which as we have before said is used as a privy and is loaded with excrements and i observed a large pile of corn-bread bones and filth of all kinds thirty feet in diameter and several feet in height swarming with mere of flies in a vacant space near the pots used for cooking millions of flies swarmed over everything and covered the faces of the sleeping patients and crawled down their open mouths and deposited their maggots in the gangrenous wounds of the living and in the mouths of the dead mosquitoes in great numbers also infested the tents and many of the patients were so stung by these pestiferous insects that they resembled those suffering from a slight attack of the measles 
the police and hygiene of the hospital were defective in the extreme the attendants who appeared in almost every instance to have been selected from the prisoners seemed to have in many cases but little interest in the welfare of their fellow captives the accusation was made that the nurses in many cases robbed the sick of their clothing money and rations and carried on a clandestine trade with the paroled prisoners and confederate guards without the hospital enclosure in the clothing effects of the sick dying and dead federals they certainly appeared to neglect the comfort and cleanliness of the sick entrusted to their care in a most shameful manner even after making due allowances for the difficulties of the situation many of the sick were literally encrusted with dirt and filth and covered with vermin when a gangrenous wound needed washing the limb was thrust out a little from the blanket or board or rags upon which the patient was lying and water poured over it and all the putrescent matter allowed to soak into the ground floor of the tent the supply of rags for dressing wounds was said to be very scant and i saw the most filthy rags which had been applied several times and imperfectly washed used in dressing wounds where hospital gangrene was prevailing it was impossible for any wound to escape contagion under these circumstances the results of the treatment of wounds in the hospital were of the most unsatisfactory character from this neglect of cleanliness and in the dressings and wounds themselves as well as from various other causes which will be more fully considered i saw several gangrenous wounds filled with maggots i have frequently seen neglected wounds amongst the confederate soldiers similarly affected as far as my experience extends these worms destroy only the dead tissues and do not injure especially the well parts i have even heard surgeons affirm that a gangrenous wound which had been thoroughly cleansed by maggots healed more rapidly than if it had been left to itself this want of cleanliness on the part of the nurses appeared to be the result of carelessness and inattention rather than of malignant design and the whole trouble can be traced to the want of the proper police and sanitary regulations and to the absence of intelligent organization and division of labor the abuses were in a large measure due to the almost total absence of system government and rigid but wholesome, wholesome sanitary regulations in extenuation of these abuses it was alleged by the medical officers that the confederate troops were barely sufficient to guard the prisoners and that it was impossible to obtain any number of experienced nurses from the confederate forces in fact the guard appeared to be too small even for the regulation of the internal hygiene and police of the hospital the manner of disposing of the dead was also calculated to depress the already desponding spirits of these men many of whom had been confined for months and even for nearly two years in richmond and other places and whose strength had been wasted by bad air bad food and neglect of personal cleanliness the dead house is merely a frame covered with old tent cloth and a few bushes situated in the southwestern corner of the hospital grounds when a patient dies he is simply laid in the narrow street in front of his tent until he is removed by federal negroes detailed to carry off the dead if a patient dies during the night he lies there until the morning and during the day even the dead were frequently allowed to remain for hours in these walks in the dead house the corpses lie upon the bare ground and were in most cases covered with filth and vermin the cooking arrangements are of the most effective character five large iron pots similar to those used for boiling sugar-cane appear to be the only cooking utensils furnished by the hospital for the cooking of nearly two thousand men and the patients were dependent in great measure upon their own miserable utensils they were allowed to cook in the tent doors and in the lanes and this was another source of filth and another favourable condition for the generation and multiplication of flies and other vermin the air of the tents was foul and disagreeable in the extreme and in fact the entire grounds emitted a most nauseous and disgusting smell i entered nearly all the tents and carefully examined the cases of interest and especially the cases of gangrene upon numerous occasions during the prosecution of my pathological inquiries at mendersonville and therefore enjoyed every opportunity to judge correctly of the hygiene and police of the hospital there appeared to be almost absolute indifference and neglect on the part of the patients of personal cleanliness their persons and clothing in most instances and especially of those suffering with ang gangrene and scorbutic ulcers were filthy in the extreme and covered with vermin it was too often the case that patients were received from the stockade in a most deplorable condition i have seen men brought in from the stockade in a dying condition begrimed from head to foot with their own excrements and so black from smoke and filth that they resembled negroes rather than white men that this description of the stockade and hospital has not been overdrawn will appear from the reports of the surgeons in charge appended to this report we will examine first the consolidated report of the sick and wounded federal prisoners during six months from the first of march to the thirty first of august forty two thousand six hundred and eighty six cases of diseases and wounds were reported no classified record of the sick in the stockade was kept after the establishment of the hospital without the prison this fact 
in conjunction with those already presented relating to the insufficiency of medical officers and the extreme illness and even death of many prisoners in the tents of the stockade without any medical attention or record beyond the bare number of the dead demonstrate that these figures large as they appear to be are far below the truth as the numbers of prisoners varied greatly at different periods the relations between those reported sick and well as far as those statistics extend can best be determined by a comparison of the statistics of each month during this period of six months no less than five hundred and sixty-five deaths are recorded under the head of morbi vani in other words those men died without having received sufficient medical attention for the determination of even the name of the disease causing death during the month of august fifty-three cases and fifty-three deaths are recorded as due to marasmus surely this large number of deaths must have been due to some other morbid state than slow wasting if they were due to improper and insufficient food they should have been classed accordingly and if to diarrhoea or dysentery or scurvy the classification should in like manner have been explicit we observe a progressive increase of the rate of mortality from three point eleven per cent in march to nine point nine per cent of mean strength sick and well in august the ratio of mortality continued to increase during september for notwithstanding the removal of one half of the entire number of prisoners during the early portion of the month one thousand seven hundred and sixty seven deaths are registered from september one to twenty one and the largest number of deaths upon any one day occurred during this month on the sixteenth these one hundred and nineteen the entire number of federal prisoners confined at anderson there was about forty thousand six hundred and eleven and during the period of near seven months from february twenty four to september twenty one nine thousand four hundred and seventy nine deaths were recorded that is during this period near one fourth or more exactly one in four point two or thirteen point three per cent terminated fatally the increase of mortality was due in great measure to the accumulation of the sources of disease as the increase of excrements and filth of all kinds and the concentration of noxious effluvia and also to the progressive effects of salt diet crowding and the hot climate conclusions first the great mortality among the federal prisoners confined in the military prison at andersonville was not referable to climatic causes or to the nature of the soil and waters second the chief causes of death were scurvy and its results and bowel affections chronic and acute diarrhoea and dysentery the bowel affections appear to have been due to the diet the habits of the patients the depressed dejected state of the nervous system and moral and intellectual powers and to the effluvia arising from the decomposing animal and vegetable filth the effects of salt meat and an invariant diet of cornmeal with but few vegetables and imperfect supplies of vinegar and syrup were manifested in the great prevalence of scurvy this disease without doubt was also influenced to an important extent in its origin and course by the foul animal emanations third from the sameness of the food in form the action of the poisonous gases in the densely crowded and filthy stockade and hospital the blood was altered in its constitution even before the manifestation of actual disease in both the well and the sick the red corpuscles were diminished and in all diseases uncomplicated with inflammation the fibrous element was deficient in case of ulceration of the mucous membrane of the intestinal canal the fibrous element of the blood was increased while in simple diarrhoea uncomplicated with ulceration it was either diminished or else remained stationary heart clots were very common if not universally present in cases of ulceration of the intestinal mucous membrane while in the uncomplicated cases of diarrhoea and scurvy the blood was fluid and did not coagulate readily and the heart clots and fibrous concretions were almost universally absent from the watery condition of the blood there resulted various serous infusions into the pericardium ventricles of the brain and into the abdomen in almost all the cases which i examined after death even the most emaciated there was more or less serious effusion into the abdominal cavity in cases of hospital gangrene of the extremities and in cases of gangrene of the intestines heart clots and fibrous coagula were universally present the presence of those clots in the cases of hospital gangrene while they were absent in the cases in which there was no inflammatory symptom sustains the conclusion that hospital gangrene is a species of inflammation imperfect and irregular though it may be in its progress in which the fibrous element and coagulation of the blood are increased even in those who are suffering from such a condition of the blood and from such diseases as are naturally accompanied with a decrease in the fibrous constituent 
fourth the fact that hospital gangrene appeared in the stockade first and originated spontaneously without any previous contagion and occurred sporadically all over the stockade and prison hospital was proof positive that this disease will arise whenever the conditions of crowding filth foul air and bad diet are present the exhalations from the hospital and stockade appeared to exert their effects to a considerable distance outside of these localities the origin of hospital gangrene among these prisoners appeared clearly to depend in great measure upon the state of the general system induced by diet and various external noxious influences the rapidity of the appearance and action of the gangrene depended upon the powers and state of the constitution as well as upon the intensity of the poison in the atmosphere or upon the direct application of poisonous matter to the wounded surface this was further illustrated by the important fact that hospital gangrene or disease resembling it in all essential respects attacked the intestinal canal of patients laboring under ulceration of the bowels although there were no local manifestations of the gangrene upon the surface of the body this mode of termination in cases of dysentery was quite common in the foul atmosphere of the confederate states military hospital in the depressed depraved condition of the system of these federal prisoners fifth a scorbutic condition of the system appeared to favor the origin of foul ulcers which frequently took on true hospital gangrene scurvy and hospital gangrene frequently existed in the same individual in such cases vegetable diet with vegetable acids would remove the scorbutic condition without curing the hospital gangrene from the results of the existing war for the establishment of the independence of the confederate states as well as from the published observation of dr trotter sir gilbert blaine and others of the english navy and army it is evident that this scorbutic condition of the system especially in crowded ships and camps is most favorable to the origin and spread of foul ulcers and hospital gangrene as in the present case of andersonville so also in past times when medical hygiene was almost entirely neglected those two diseases were almost universally associated in crowded ships in many cases it was very difficult to decide at first whether the ulcer was a simple result of scurvy or of the action of the prison or hospital gangrene for there was great similarity in the appearance of the ulcers in the two diseases so commonly have those two diseases been combined in their origin and action that the description of scorbutic ulcers by many authors evidently includes also many of the prominent characteristics of hospital gangrene this will be rendered evident by an examination of the observation of dr lind and sir gilbert blaine upon scorbutic ulcers sixth gangrenous spots followed by rapid destruction of tissue appeared in some cases where there had been no known wound without such well-established fact it might be assumed that the disease was propagated from one patient to another in such a filthy and crowded hospital as that of the confederate states military prison at andersonville it was impossible to isolate the wounded from the sources of actual contact of the gangrenous matter the flies swarming over the wounds and over filth of every kind the filthy imperfectly washed and scanty supplies of rags and the limited supply of washing utensils the same wash bowl serving for scores of patients were sources of such constant circulation of the gangrenous matter that the disease might rapidly spread from a single gangrenous wound the fact already stated that a form of moist gangrene resembling hospital gangrene was quite common in this foul atmosphere in cases of dysentery both with and without the existence of the disease upon the entire surface not only demonstrates the dependence of the disease upon the state of the constitution but proves in the clearest manner that neither the contact of the poisonous matter of gangrene nor the direct action of the poisonous atmosphere upon the ulcerated surfaces is necessary to the development of the disease seventh in this foul atmosphere amputation did not arrest hospital gangrene the disease almost invariably returned almost every amputation was followed finally by death either from the effects of gangrene or from the prevailing diarrhoea and dysentery nitric acid and escharotics generally in this crowded atmosphere loaded with noxious effluvia exerted only temporary effects after their application to the diseased surfaces the gangrene would frequently return with redoubled energy and even after the gangrene had been completely removed by local and constitutional treatment it would frequently return and destroy the patient as far as my observation extended very few of the cases of amputation for gangrene recovered the progress of these cases was frequently very deceptive i have observed after death the most extensive disorganization of the structures of the stump when during life there was but little swelling of the part and the patient was apparently doing well i endeavored to impress upon the medical officers the view that in this disease treatment was almost useless without an abundant supply of pure fresh air nutritious food and tonics and stimulants 
such changes however as would allow of the isolation of the cases of hospital gangrene appeared to be out of the power of the medical officers eighth the gangrenous mass was without true pus and consisted chiefly of broken down disorganized structures the reaction of the gangrenous matter in certain stages was alkaline ninth the best and in truth the only means of protecting large armies and navies as well as prisoners from the ravages of hospital gangrene is to furnish liberal supplies of well-cured meat together with fresh beef and vegetables and to enforce a rigid system of hygiene tenth finally this gigantic mass of human misery calls loudly for relief not only for the sake of suffering humanity but also on account of our own brave soldiers now captives in the hands of the federal government strict justice to the gallant men of the confederate armies who have been or who may be so unfortunate as to be compelled to surrender in battle demands that the confederate government should adopt that course which will best secure their health and comfort in captivity or at least leave their enemies without a shadow of an excuse for any violation of the rules of civilized warfare in the treatment of prisoners end of the witness's testimony the variation from month to month of the proportion of deaths to the whole number living is singular and interesting it supports the theory i have advanced above as the following facts taken from the official report will show in april one in every sixteen died in may one in every twenty six died in june one in every twenty two died in july one in every eighteen died in august one in every eleven died in september one in every three died in october one in every two died in november one in every three died does the reader fully understand that in september one-third of those in the pen died that in october one-half of the remainder perished and in november one-third of those who still survived died let him pause for a moment and read this over carefully again because its startling magnitude will hardly dawn upon him at first reading it is true that the fearfully disproportionate mortality of those months was largely due to the fact that it was mostly the sick that remained behind but even this diminishes but little the frightfulness of the showing did any one ever hear of the an epidemic so fatal that one-third of those attacked by it in one month died one half of the remnant the next month and one-third of the feeble remainder the next month if he did his reading has been much more extensive than mine the greatest number of deaths in one day is reported to have occurred on the twenty third of august when one hundred and twenty seven died or one man every eleven minutes the greatest number of prisoners in the stockade is stated to have been august eighth when there were thirty three thousand one hundred and fourteen i have always imagined both these statements to be short of the truth because my remembrance is that one day in august i counted over two hundred dead lying in a row as for the greatest number of prisoners i remember quite distinctly standing by the ration wagon during the whole time of the delivery of rations to see how many prisoners there really were inside that day the one hundred and thirty-third detachment was called and its sergeant came up and drew rations for a full detachment all the other detachments were habitually kept full by replacing those who died with newcomers as each detachment consisted of two hundred and seventy men one hundred and thirty three detachments would make thirty five thousand nine hundred and ten exclusive of those in the hospital and those detailed outside as cooks clerks hospital attendants and various other employments say from one to two thousand more End of chapter forty two chapter forty three of andersonville a story of rebel military prisons by john mcelroy this librivox recording is in the public domain difficulty of exercising embarrassments of a morning walk the rialto of the prison cursing the southern confederacy the story of the battle of spotsylvania court house certainly in no other great community that ever existed upon the face of the globe was there so little daily ebb and flow as in this dull as an ordinary town or city may be however monotonous eventless even stupid the lives of its citizens there is yet nevertheless a flow every day of its life-blood its population towards its heart and an ebb of the same every evening towards its extremities these recurring tides mingle all classes together and promote the general healthfulness as the constant motion hither and yon of the ocean's waters purify and sweeten them 
the lack of these helped vastly to make the living mass inside the stockade a human dead sea or rather a dying sea a putrefying stinking lake resolving itself into phosphorescent corruption like those rotting southern seas whose seething filth burns in hideous reds and ghastly greens and yellows being little call for motion of any kind and no room to exercise whatever wish there might be in that direction very many succumbed unresistingly to the apathy which was so strongly favoured by despondency and the weakness induced by continual hunger and lying supinely on the hot sand day in and day out speedily brought themselves into such a condition as invited the attacks of disease it required both determination and effort to take a little walking exercise the ground was so densely crowded with holes and other devices for shelter that it took one at least ten minutes to pick his way through the narrow and tortuous labyrinth which served as paths for communication between different parts of the camp still further there was nothing to see anywhere or to form sufficient inducement for any one to make so laborious a journey one simply encountered at every new step the same unwelcome sights that he had just left there was a monotony in the misery as in everything else and consequently the temptation to sit or lie still in one's own quarters became very great i used to make it a point to go to some of the remoter parts of the stockade once every day simply for exercise one can gain some idea of the crowd and the difficulty of making one's way through it when i say that no point in the prison could be more than fifteen hundred feet from where i stayed and had the way been clear i could have walked thither and back in at most a half an hour yet it usually took me from two to three hours to make one of these journeys this daily trip a few visits to the creek to wash all over a few games of chess attendance upon roll-call drawing rations cooking and eating the same lousing my fragments of clothes and doing some little duties for my sick and helpless comrades constituted the daily routine for myself as for most of the active youths in the prison the creek was the great meeting-point for all inside the stockade all able to walk were certain to be there at least once during the day and we made it a rendezvous a place to exchange gossip discuss the latest news canvass the prospects of exchange and most of all to curse the rebels indeed no conversation ever progressed very far without both speaker and listener taking frequent rest to say bitter things as to the rebels generally and words winder and davis in particular a conversation between two boys strangers to each other who came to the creek to wash themselves or their clothes or for some other purpose would progress thus first boy i belong to the second corps hancocks the army of the potomac boys always mentioned what corps they belonged to where the western boys stated their regiment they got me up spotsylvania when they were butting their heads against our breastworks trying to get even with us for gobbling up johnson in the morning he stopped suddenly and changed his tone to say hope to god that when our folks get richmond they will put old ben butler in command of it with orders to limb skin and jayhawk it worse than he did new orleans second boy fervently i wish to god he would and that he'd catch old jeff and that grey-headed devil winder and the old dutch captain strip em just as we were put em in this pen with just the rations they are given us and set a guard of plantation niggers over em with orders to blow their whole infernal heads off if they dared so much as to look at the dead line first boy returning to the story of his capture old hancock caught the johnnies that morning the neatest you ever saw anything in your life after the two armies had murdered each other for four or five days in the wilderness by fighting so close together that much of the time you could almost shake hands with the graybacks both hauled off a little and lay and glowered at each other each side had lost about twenty thousand men in learning that if it attacked the other it would get mashed fine so each built a line of works and lay behind them and tried to nag the other into coming out and attacking at spotsylvania our lines and those of the johnnies weren't twelve hundred yards apart the ground was clear and clean between them and any force that attempted to cross it to attack would be cut to pieces as sure as anything we laid there three or four days watching each other just like boys at school who shake fists and dare each other at one place the rebel line ran out towards us like the top of a great letter a the night of the 
eleventh of may it rained very hard and then came a fog so thick that you couldn't see the length of a company hancock thought he'd take advantage of this we were all turned out very quietly about four o'clock in the morning not a bit of noise was allowed we even had to take off our canteens and tin cups that they might not rattle against our bayonets the ground was so wet that our footsteps couldn't be heard it was one of those deathly still movements when you think your heart is making as much noise as a bass drum the johnnies didn't seem to have the faintest suspicion of what was coming though they ought because we would have expected such an attack from them if we hadn't made it ourselves their pickets were out just a little ways from their works and we were almost on them before they discovered us they fired and ran back at this we raised a yell and dashed forward at a charge as we poured over the works the rebels came double quicking up to defend them we flanked johnson's division quicker than you could say jack robinson and had four thousand of em in our grip just as nice as you please we sent them to the rear under guard and started for the next line of rebel works about a half a mile away but we had now waked up the whole of lee's army and they all came straight for us like packs of mad wolves ewell struck us in the centre long street let drive at our left flank and hill tackled our right we fell back to the works we had taken warren and wright came up to help us and we had it hot and heavy for the rest of the day and part of the night the johnnies seemed so mad over what we'd done that they were half crazy they charged us five times coming up every time just as if they were going to lift us right out of the works with the bayonet about midnight after they had lost over ten thousand men they seemed to understand that we had preempted that piece of real estate and didn't propose to allow anybody to jump our claim so they fell back sullen like to their main works when they came on the last charge our brigadier walked behind each of our regiments and said boys we'll send em back this time for keeps give it to em by the acre and when they begin to waver we'll all jump over the works and go for them with the bayonet we did it just that way we poured such a fire on them that the bullets knocked up the ground in front just like you have seen the deep dust in a road in the middle of summer fly up when the first great big drops of a rainstorm strike it but they came on yelling and swearing officers in front waving swords and shouting all that business you know when they got to about one hundred yards from us they did not seem to be coming so fast and there was a good deal of confusion among them the brigade bugle sounded stop firing we all ceased instantly the rebels looked up in astonishment our general sang out fix bayonets but we knew what was coming and were already executing the order you can imagine the crash that ran down the line as every fellow snatched his bayonet out and slapped it on the muzzle of his gun then the general's voice rang out like a bugle ready forward charge we cheered till everything seemed to split and jumped over the works almost every man at the same minute the johnnies seemed to have been puzzled at the stoppage of our fire when we all came sailing over the works with guns brought right down where they meant business they were so astonished for a minute that they stood stock still not knowing whether to come for us or run we did not allow them long to debate but went straight towards them on the double quick with the bayonets looking awful savage and hungry it was too much for mr johnny Reb's nerves they all seemed to about face at once and they lit out of there as if they had been sent for in a hurry we chased after em as fast as we could and picked up just lots of em finally it began to be real funny a johnny's wind would begin to give out he'd fall behind his comrades he'd hear us yell and think that we were right behind him ready to sink a bayonet through him he'd turn around throw up his hands and sing out i surrender mister i surrender and find that we were a hundred feet off and would have to have a bayonet as long as one of mcclellan's general orders to touch him well my company was the left of our regiment and our regiment was the left of the brigade and we swung out ahead of all the rest of the boys in our excitement of chasing the johnnies we didn't see that we had passed an angle of their works about a thirty of us had become separated from the company and were chasing a squad of about seventy-five or one hundred we had got up so close to them that we hollowed halt there now or we'll blow your heads off they turned round with halt yourselves you yankee we looked around at this and saw that we were not one hundred feet away from the angle of the works which were filled with rebels waiting for our fellows to get to where they could have a good flank fire upon them there was nothing to do but to throw down our guns and surrender and we had hardly gone inside of the works until the johnnies opened on our brigade and drove it back this ended the battle at spotsylvania courthouse second boy 
irrelevantly some day the underpinning will fly out from under the south and let it sink right into the middle kittle a hell first boy savagely only wish the whole southern confederacy was hanging over hell by a single string and i had a knife End of chapter 43「of Andersonville, a story of rebel military prisons by John McElroy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Rebel music, singular lack of the creative power among the Southerners, contrast with similar people elsewhere, their favorite music and where it was borrowed from, a fifer with one tune i have before mentioned as among the things that grew upon one with increasing acquaintance with the rebels on their native heath was astonishment at their lack of mechanical skill and at their inability to grapple with numbers and the simpler processes of arithmetic another characteristic of the same nature was their wonderful lack of musical ability or of any kind of tuneful creativeness elsewhere all over the world people living under similar conditions to the southerners are exceedingly musical and we owe the great majority of the sweetest compositions which delight the ear and subdue the senses to unlettered song-makers of the swiss mountains the tyrolese valleys the bavarian highlands and the minstrels of scotland ireland and wales the music of english-speaking people is very largely made up of these contributions from the folk-songs of dwellers in the wilder and more mountainous parts of the british isles one rarely goes far out of the way in attributing to this source any air that he may hear that captivates him with its seductive opulence of harmony exquisite melodies limpid and unstrained stained as the carol of a bird in springtime and as plaintive as the cooing of a turtle dove seems as natural products of the scottish highlands as the gorse which blazons on their hillsides in august debarred from expressing their aspirations as people of broader culture do in painting in sculpture and poetry and prose these mountaineers make song the flexible and ready instrument for the communication of every emotion that sweeps across their souls love hatred grief revenge anger and especially war seems to tune their minds to harmony and wake the voice of song in them hearts the battles which the scotch and irish fought to replace the luckless stuarts upon the british throne the bloody rebellions of seventeen fifteen and seventeen forty five left a rich legacy of sweet song the outpouring of loving passionate loyalty to a wretched cause songs which are to-day esteemed and sung wherever the english language is spoken by people who have long since forgotten what burning feelings gave birth to their favourite melodies for a century the bones of both the pretenders have mouldered in alien soil the names of james edward and charles edward which were once trumpet blasts to rouse armed men mean as little to the multitude of to-day as those of the saxon ethelbert and danish harder canute yet the world goes on singing and will probably as long as the english language is spoken while be king but charlie when jamie come home over the water to charlie charlie is my darling the bonny blue bonnets are over the border saddle your steeds and away and a myriad others whose infinite tenderness and melody no modern composer can equal yet these same scotch and irish the same jacobite english transplanted on account of their chronic rebelliousness to the mountains of virginia the carolinas and georgia seem to have lost their tunefulness as some fine singing birds do when carried from their native shores the descendants of those who drew swords for james and charles at preston pans and culloden dwell to-day in the dales and valleys of the alleghanies as their fathers did in the dales and valleys of the grampians but their voices are mute as a rule the southerners are fond of music they are fond of singing and listening to old-fashioned ballads most of which have never been printed but ended down from one generation to the other like the volk leader of germany they sing these with the wild fervid impressiveness characteristic of the ballad singing of unlettered people very many play tolerably on the violin and banjo and occasionally one is found whose instrumentation may be called good but above this height they never soar the only musician produced by the south of whom the rest of the country has ever heard is blind tom the negro idiot no composer no song-writer of any kind has appeared within the borders of dixie
it was a disappointment to me that even the stress of the war the passion and fierceness with which the rebels felt and fought could not stimulate any adherent of the stars and bars into the production of a single lyric worthy in the remotest degree of the magnitude of the struggle and the depth of the popular feeling where two million scots fighting to restore the fallen fortunes of the worse than worthless stuarts fill the world with immortal music eleven million of southerners fighting for what they claim to be individual freedom and national life did not produce any original verse or a bar of music that the world could recognize as such this is the fact and an undeniable one its explanation i must leave to abler analysts than i am searching for peculiar causes we find but two that make the south differ from the ancestral home of these people these two were climate and slavery climatic effects will not account for the phenomenon because we see that the peasantry of the mountains of spain and the south of france as ignorant as these people and dwellers in a still more enervating atmosphere are very fertile in musical composition and their songs are to the romantic languages what the scotch and irish ballads are to the english then it must be ascribed to the incubus of slavery upon the intellect which has repressed this as it has all other healthy growths in the south slavery seems to benumb all the faculties except the passions the fact that the mountaineers had but few or no slaves does not seem to be of importance in the case they lived under the deadly shadow of the upas tree and suffering the consequences of its stunting their development in all directions as the ague smitten inhabitant of the roman campana finds every sense and every muscle clogged by the filtering in of the insidious miasma they did not compose songs and music because they did not have the intellectual energy for that work the negroes displayed all the musical creativeness of that section their wonderful prolificness in wild root songs with strangely melodious airs that burned themselves into the memory was one of the salient characteristics of that downtrodden race like the russian serfs and the bondmen of all ages and lands the songs they made and sang all had an undertone of touching plaintiveness born of ages of dumb suffering the themes were exceedingly simple and the range of subjects limited the joys and sorrows hopes and despairs of love's gratification or disappointment of struggles for freedom contests with malign persons and influences of rage hatred jealousy revenge such as formed the motifs for the majority of the poetry of free and strong races were wholly absent from their lyrics religion hunger and toy were their main inspiration they sang of the pleasures of idling in the genial sunshine the delights of abundance of food the eternal happiness that awaited them in the heavenly future where the slave drivers ceased from troubling and the weary were at rest where time rolled around in endless cycles of days spent in basking harp in hand and silken clad in golden streets under the soft effulgence of cloudless skies glowing with warmth and kindness emanating from the creator himself had their masters condescended to borrow the music of the slaves they would have found none whose sentiments were suitable for the ode of a people undergoing the pangs of what was hoped to be the birth of a new nation the three songs most popular at the south and generally regarded as distinctively southern were the bonnie blue flag maryland my maryland and stonewall jackson crossing into maryland the first of these was the greatest favorite by long odds women sang men whistled and the so-called musicians played it wherever we went well in the field before capture it was the commonest of experiences to have rebel women sing it at us tauntingly from the house that we passed or near which we stopped if ever near enough of rebel camp we were sure to hear its wailing crescendo rising upon the air from the lips or instruments of some one more quartered there at richmond it rang upon us constantly from some source or another and the same was true wherever else we went in the so-called confederacy i give the air and words below the bonnie blue flag we are a band of brothers and native to the soil fighting for our liberty with treasure blood and toil and when our rights were threatened the cry rose near and far hurrah for the bonnie blue flag that bears a single star hurrah hurrah for southern rights hurrah hurrah for the bonnie blue flag that bears a single star all familiar with scotch songs were readily recognized the name and air as an old friend and one of the fierce jacobite melodies that for a long time disturbed the tranquillity of the brunswick family on the english throne the new words supplied by the rebels are the merest doggerel and fit the music as poorly as the unchanged name of the song fitted to its new use 
the flag of the rebellion was not a bonny blue one but had quite as much red and white as azure it did not have a single star but thirteen near in popularity was maryland my maryland the versification of this was of a much higher order being fairly respectable the air is old and a familiar one to all college students and belongs to one of the most common of german household songs o tenenbaum o tenenbaum we true sin deiner blatter draguenis nicht nur zur sommerzeit nein auch in winter when es schneit etc which longfellow has finally translated o oh, hemlock tree o oh, hemlock tree how faithful are thy branches green not alone in summer time but in the winter's float and rhyme o oh, hemlock tree o oh, hemlock tree how faithful are thy branches etc the rebel version ran maryland the despot's heel is on thy shore maryland his touch is at thy temple door maryland avenge the patriotic gore that fleck the streets of baltimore and be the battle queen of your maryland my maryland hark to the wandering sun's appeal maryland my mother stay to thee i kneel maryland for life and death for woe and weal thy peerless chivalry reveal and gird thy beauteous limbs with steel maryland my maryland thou wilt not cower in the duet maryland thy beaming sword shall never rust maryland remember carol's sacred trust remember howard's warlike thrust and all thy slumberers with the just maryland my maryland come tis the red dawn of the day maryland come with thy panoplied array maryland with rhinegold spirit for the fray with watson's blood at monterey with fearless low and dashing may maryland my maryland come it for thy shield is bright and strong maryland come for thy dalliance does thee wrong maryland come to thin's own heroic throng that stalks with liberty along and give a new key to thy song maryland my maryland dear mother burst thy tyrant's chain maryland virginia should not call in vain maryland she meets her sisters on the plain six emperor tis the proud refrain that baffles millions back amain maryland arise in majesty again maryland my maryland i see the blush upon thy cheek maryland but thou wast ever bravely meek maryland but lo there surges forth a shriek from hill to hill from creek to creek potomac calls to chesapeake maryland my maryland thou wilt not yield the vandal toll maryland thou wilt not crook to his control maryland better the fire upon thee roll better the blade the shot the bow than crucifixion of the soul maryland my maryland i hear the distant thunder hem maryland the old lines bugle fife and drum maryland she is not dead nor deaf nor dumb huzza she spurns the northern scum she breathes she burns she'll come she'll come maryland my maryland stonewall jackson crossing into maryland was another travesty of about the same literary merit or rather demerit as the bonny blue flag its air was that of the well-known and popular negro minstrel song billy patterson for all that it sounded very martial and stirring when played by a brass band we heard these songs with tiresome iteration daily and nightly during our stay in the southern confederacy some one of the guards seemed to be perpetually beguiling the weariness of his watch by singing in all keys in every sort of a voice and with the wildest latitude as to air and time they became so terribly irritating to us that to this day the remembrance of these so lacerating lyrics abides with me as one of the chief of the minor torments of our situation they were in fact nearly as bad as the lice we revenged ourselves as best we could by constructing fearfully wicked obscene and insulting parodies on these and by singing them with irritating effusiveness in the hearing of the guards who were inflicting these nuisances upon us of the same nature was the garrison music one fife played by an asthmatic old fellow whose breathings were nearly as audible as his notes and one rheumatic drummer constituted the entire band for the post the fifer actually knew but one tune the bonny blue flag and did not know that well but it was all that he had and he played it with wearisome monotony for every camp call five or six times a day and seven days in the week he called us up in the morning with it for a reveille he sounded the roll-call and drill-call breakfast dinner and supper with it and finally sent us to bed with the same dreary wail that had rung in our ears all day i never hated any piece of music as i came to hate that threnody of treason it would have been such a relief if the old asthmatic who played it could have been induced to learn another tune to play on sundays and give us one day of rest he did not but desecrated the lord's day by playing as vilely as on the rest of the week the rebels were fully conscious of their musical deficiencies and made repeated but unsuccessful attempts to induce the musicians among the prisoners to come outside and form a band End of chapters forty four
chapter forty five of andersonville a story of rebel military prisons by john mcelroy this librivox recording is in the public domain august needles stuck in pumpkin seeds some phenomena of starvation rioting in remembered luxuries illinois said tall gaunt jack north of the one hundred and fourteenth illinois to me one day as we sat contemplating our naked and sadly attenuated underpinning what do our legs and feet most look most like give it up jack said i why darning needles stuck in pumpkin seeds of course i never heard a better comparison for our wasted limbs the effects of the great bodily emaciation were sometimes very startling boys of a fleshy habit would change so in a few weeks as to lose all resemblance to their former selves and comrades who came into prison later would utterly fail to recognize them most fat men as most large men died in a little while after entering though there were exceptions one of these was a boy of my own company named george hillocks george had shot up within a few years to over six feet in height and then as such boys occasionally do had after enlisting with us taken on such a development of flesh that we nicknamed him the giant and he became a pretty good load for even the strongest horse george held his flesh through belle isle and the earlier weeks in andersonville but june july and august fetched him as the boys said he seemed to melt away like an icicle on a spring day and he grew so thin that his height seemed preternatural we called him flagstaff and cracked all sorts of jokes about putting an insulator on his head and setting him up for a telegraph pole braiding his legs and using him for a whiplash letting his hair grow a little longer and trading him off to the rebels for a sponge and staff for the artillery etc we all expected him to die and looked continually for the development of the fatal scurvy symptoms which were to seal his doom but he worried through and came out at last in good shape a happy result due as much as to anything else to his having in chester hayward of prairie city illinois one of the most devoted chums i ever knew chester nursed and looked out for george with wife-like fidelity and had his reward in bringing him safe through our lines there were thousands of instances of this generous devotion to each other by chums in andersonville and i know of nothing that reflects any more credit upon our boy soldiers there was little chance for any one to accumulate flesh on the rations we were receiving i say it in all soberness that i do not believe that a healthy hand could have grown fat upon them i am sure that any good-sized shanghai eats more every day than the meagre half-loaf that we had to maintain life upon scanty as this was and hungry as all were very many could not eat it their stomachs revolted against the trash it became so nauseous to them that they could not force it down even when famishing and they died of starvation with the chunks of the so-called bread under their head i found myself rapidly approaching this condition i had been blessed with a good digestion and a talent for sleeping under the most discouraging circumstances these i have no doubt were of the greatest assistance to me in my struggle for existence but now the rations became fearfully obnoxious to me and it was only with the greatest effort pulling the bread into little pieces and swallowing each of these as one would a pill that i succeeded in worrying the stuff down i had not as yet fallen away very much but as i had never up to that time weighed so much as one hundred and twenty-five pounds there was no great amount of adipose to lose it was evident that unless some change occurred my time was near at hand there was not only hunger for more food but longing with an intensity beyond expression for alteration of some kind in the rations 
the changeless monotony of the miserable saltless bread or worse mush for days weeks and months became unbearable if those wretched mule teams had only once a month hauled in something different if they had come in loaded with sweet potatoes green corn or wheat flour there would be thousands of men still living who now slumber beneath those melancholy pines it would have given something to look forward to and remember when past but to know each day that the gates would open to admit the same distasteful apologies for food took away the appetite and raised one's gorge even while famishing for something to eat we could for a while forget the stench the lice the heat the maggots the dead and dying around us the insulting malignance of our jailers but it was very hard work to banish thoughts and longings for food from our minds hundreds became actually insane from brooding over it crazy men could be found in all parts of the camp numbers of them wandered around entirely naked their babblings and maunderings about something to eat were painful to hear i have before mentioned the case of the plymouth pilgrim near me whose insanity took the form of imagining that he was sitting at the table with his family and it would go through the show of helping them to imaginary viands and delicacies the cravings for green food of those afflicted with the scurvy were agonizing large numbers of watermelons were brought to the prison and sold to those who had the money to pay for them at from one to five dollars greenbacks apiece a boy who had means to buy a piece of these would be followed about while eating it by a crowd of perhaps twenty-five or thirty livid gummed scorbutics each imploring him for the rind when he was through with it we thought of food all day and were visited with torturing dreams of it at night one of the pleasant recollections of my pre-military life was a banquet at the planter's house st louis at which i was a boyish guest it was doubtless an ordinary affair as banquets go but to me then with all the keen appreciation of youth and first experience it was a feast worthy of lucullus but now this delightful reminiscence became a torment hundreds of times i dreamed i was again at the planters i saw the wide corridors with their mosaic pavement i entered the grand dining-room keeping timidly near the friend to whose kindness i owed this wonderful favour i saw again the mirror-lined walls the evergreen decked ceilings the festoons and mottoes the tables gleaming with cut glass and silver the buffets with wines and fruits the brigade of sleek black white aproned waiters headed by one who had presence enough for a major-general again i revelled in all the dainties and dishes on the bill of fare calling for everything that i dared to just to see what each was like and to be able to say afterwards that i had partaken of it all these bewildering delights of the first realization of what a boy has read and wondered much over and longed for would dance their route and reel through my somnolent brain then i would awake to find myself a half-naked half-starved vermin eaten wretch crouching in a hole in the ground waiting for my keepers to fling me a chunk of corn bread naturally the boys and especially the country boys and new prisoners talked much of victuals what they had had and what they would have again when they got out take this as a sample of the conversation which might be heard in any group of boys sitting together on the sand killing lice and talking of exchange tom well bill when we get back to god's country you and jim and john must all come to my house and take dinner with me i want to give you a square meal i want to show you just what good living is you know my mother is just the best cook in all that section when she lays herself out to get up a meal all the other women in the neighborhood just stand back and admire bill oh that's all right but i'll bet she can't hold a candle to my mother when it comes to good cooking jim no nor to mine john with patronizing contempt oh shucks none of you fellers were ever at our house even when we had one of our common weekday dinners tom unheedful of the counterclaims i have teen studying up the dinner i'd like and the bill of fare i'd set out for you fellers when you come over to see me first of course we'll lay the foundation like with a nice juicy loin roast and some mashed potatoes bill interrupting now do you like mashed potatoes with beef the way 
may mother does is to pare the potatoes and lay them in the pan along with the beef then you know they come out just as nice and crisp and brown they have soaked up all the beef gravy and they crinkle between your teeth jim now i tell you mashed nashanix with butter on em is plenty good enough for me john if you'd at some of the new kind of peach blows that we raised in the old pasture lot the year before i enlisted you'd never say another word about your nashanix tom taking breath and starting in fresh then we'll have some fried spring chickens of our dominic breed them dominics of ours have the nicest tenderest meat better'n quail a darn sight and the way my mother can fry a spring chickens bill aside to jim every derned woman in the country thinks she can spry chicking frickens but my mother john you fellows all know that there's nobody knows half as much about chicken doings as these tinnerant methodist preachers they give em chicken wherever they go and folks do say that out in the new settlements they can't get no preachin no gospel nor nothin until the chickens become so plenty that a preacher is reasonably sure of havin one for his dinner wherever he may go now there's old peter cartwright who has travelled over illinois and indiany since the year one and preached more good sermons than any other man who ever set on saddlebags and has et more chickens than there are birds in a big pigeon roost well he took dinner at our house when he came up to dedicate the big white church at simpkins corners and when he passed up his plate the third time for more chicken he says says he i've et at a great many hundred tables in the fifty years i have laboured in the vineyard of the redeemer but i must say mrs kiggins that your way of frying chickens is a leetle the nicest that i ever knew i only wish that the sisters generally would get your receipt yes that's what he said a leetle the nicest tom and then we'll have biscuits and butter i'll just bet five hundred dollars to a cent and give back the cent if i win that we have the best butter at our house that there is in central illinois you can't never have good butter unless you have a spring house there's no use o talkin all the patent turns that lazy men ever invented all the fancy milk pans and coolers can't make up for a spring house locations for a spring house are scarcer than hen's teeth in illinois but we have one and there ain't a better one in orange county new york then you'll see dome of the biscuits my mother makes bill well now my mother's a boss biscuit maker too jim you can just gamble that mine is john oh that's the way you fellers ought to think and talk but my mother tom coming in again with fresh vigour they're just as light and fluffy as a dandelion puff and they melt in your mouth like a ripe bartlett pear you just pull em open now you know that i think there's nothing that shows a person's raisin so well as to see him eat biscuits and butter if he's been raised mostly on corn bread and common doin's and don't know much about good things to eat he'll most likely cut his biscuit open with a case knife and make it fall as flat as one of yesterday's pancakes but if he is used to biscuits says sat em often at his house he'll just pull em open slow and easy like then he'll lay a little slice of butter inside and drop a few drops of clear honey on this and stick the two halves back together again and oh for god almighty's sake stop talking that infernal nonsense roar out a half dozen of the surrounding crowd whose mouths have been watering over this unctuous recital of the good things of the table you blamed fools do you want to drive yourselves and everybody else crazy with such stuff as that dry up and try to think of something else end of chapter forty five chapter forty six of andersonville a story of rebel military prisons by john mcelroy this librivox recording is in the public domain surly britain the stolid courage that makes the english flag a banner of triumph our company bugler his characteristics and his death urgent demand for mechanics none want to go treatment of a rebel shoemaker enlargement of the stockade 
it is broken by storm the wonderful spring early in august f marriott our company bugler died previous to coming to america he had been for many years an english soldier and i accepted him as a type of that stolid doggedly brave class which forms the bulk of the english armies and has for centuries carried the british flag with dauntless courage into every land under the sun rough surly and unsocially did his duty with the unemotional steadiness of a machine he knew nothing but to obey orders and obeyed them under all circumstances promptly but with stony impassiveness with the command to move forward into action he moved forward without a word and with face as blank as a side of soul leather he went as far as ordered halted at the word and retired at command as phlegmatically as he advanced if he cared a straw whether he advanced or retreated if it mattered to the extent of a pinch of salt whether we whipped the rebels or they defeated us he kept that feeling so deeply hidden in the recesses of his sturdy bosom that no one ever suspected it in the excitement of action the rest of the boys shouted and swore and expressed their tense feelings in various ways but marriott might as well have been a graven image for all the expression that he suffered to escape doubtless if the captain had ordered him to shoot one of the company through the heart he would have executed the command according to the manual of arms brought his carbine to a recover and at the word marched back to his quarters without an inquiry as to the cause of the proceedings he made no friends and though his surliness repelled us he made few enemies indeed he was rather a favourite since he was a genuine character his gruffness had no taint of selfish greed in it he minded his own business strictly and wanted others to do the same when he first came into the company it is true he gained the enmity of nearly everybody in it but an incident occurred which turned the tide in his favour some annoying little depredations had been practised on the boys and it needed but a word of suspicion to inflame all their minds against the surly englishman as the unknown perpetrator the feeling intensified until about half of the company were in a mood to kill the bugler outright as we were returning from stable duty one evening some little occurrence fanned the smouldering anger into a fierce blaze a couple of the smaller boys began an attack upon him others hastened to their assistance and soon half the company were engaged in the assault he succeeded in disengaging himself from his assailants and squaring himself off said defiantly dumb your cowardly highs just come hat me one hat a time and i'll wallop the old gang of yez one of our sergeants styled himself proudly a chicago rough and was as vain of his pugilistic abilities as a small boy is of a father who plays in the band we all hated him cordially even more than we did mary ott he thought this was a good time to show off and forcing his way through the crowd he said vauntingly just fall back and form a ring boys and see me polish off the fool the ring was formed with the bugler and the sergeant in the centre though the latter was the younger and stronger the first round showed him that it would have profited him much more to have let marriott's challenge pass unheeded as a rule it is as well to ignore all invitations of this kind from englishmen and especially from those who like marriott have served a term in the army for they are likely to be so handy with their fists as to make the consequences of an acceptance more lively than desirable so the sergeant found marriott as one of the spectators expressed and went around him like a cooper around a barrel he planted his blows just where he wished to the intense delight of the boys who yelled enthusiastically whenever he got in a hot one and their delight at seeing the sergeant drubbed so thoroughly and artistically worked an entire revolution in his favour thenceforward we viewed his eccentricities with lenient eyes and became rather proud of his bulldog stolidity and surliness the whole battalion soon came to share this feeling and everybody enjoyed hearing his deep toned growl which mischievous boys would incite by some petty annoyances deliberately designed for that purpose i will mention incidentally that after his encounter with the sergeant no one ever again volunteered to polish him off 
andersonville did not improve either his temper or his communicativeness he seemed to want to get as far away from the rest of us as possible and took up his quarters in a remote corner of the stockade among utter strangers those of us who wandered up in his neighbourhood occasionally to see how he was getting along were received with such scant courtesy that we did not hasten to repeat the visit at length after none of us had seen him for weeks we thought that comradeship demanded another visit we found him in the last stages of scurvy and diarrhoea chunks of uneaten corn bread lay by his head they were at least a week old the rations since then had evidently been stolen from the helpless man by those around him the place where he lay was indescribably filthy and his body was swarming with vermin some good samaritan had filled his little black oyster can with water and placed it within his reach for a week at least he had not been able to rise from the ground he could barely reach for the water near him he gave us such a glare of recognition as i remember to have seen light up the fast darkening eyes of a savage old mastiff that i my boyish companions once found dying in the woods of disease and hurts had he been able he would have driven us away or at least assailed us with biting english epithets thus he had doubtless driven away all those who had attempted to help him we did a little we could and stayed with him until the next afternoon when he died we prepared his body in the customary way folded the hands across his breast tied the toes together and carried it outside not forgetting each of us to bring back a load of wood the scarcity of mechanics of all kinds in the confederacy and the urgent needs of the people for many things which the war and the blockade prevented their obtaining led to continual inducements being offered to the artisans among us to go outside and work at their trade shoemakers seemed most in demand next to these blacksmiths machinists moulders and metal workers generally not a week passed during my imprisonment that i did not see a rebel emissary of some kind about the prison seeking to engage skilled workmen for some purpose or another while in richmond the managers of the tredegar ironworks were brazen and persistent in their efforts to seduce what are termed malleable ironworkers to enter their employ a boy who was master of any one of the commoner trades had but to make his wishes known and he would be allowed to go out on parole to work i was a printer and i think that at least a dozen times i was approached by rebel publishers with offers of a parole and work at good prices one from columbia south carolina offered me two dollars and a half a thousand for composition as the highest price for such work that i had received before enlisting was thirty cents a thousand this seemed a chance to accumulate untold wealth since a man working in daytime can set from thirty-five to fifty thousand a week this would make weekly wages run from eighty-seven dollars and fifty cents to one hundred and twenty-five dollars but it was in confederate money then worth from ten to twenty cents on the dollar still better offers were made to iron workers of all kinds to shoemakers tanners weavers tailors hatters engineers machinists millers railroad men and similar tradesmen any of these could have made a handsome thing by accepting the offers made them almost weekly as nearly all in the prison had useful trades it would have been of immense benefit to the confederacy if they could have been induced to work at them there is no measuring the benefit it would have been to the southern cause if all the hundreds of tanners and shoemakers in the stockade could have been persuaded to go outside and labor in providing leather and shoes for the almost shoeless people and soldiery the machinists alone could have done more good to the southern confederacy than one of their brigades was doing harm by consenting to go to the railroad shops at griswoldville and ply their handicraft the lack of material resources in the south was one of the strongest allies our arms had this lack of resources was primarily caused by a lack of skilled labor to develop those resources and nowhere could there be found a finer collection of skilled laborers than in the thirty-three thousand prisoners incarcerated in andersonville all solicitations to accept a parole and go outside to work at one's trade were treated with the scorn they deserved if any mechanic yielded to them the fact did not come under my notice the usual reply to invitations of this kind was no sir by god i'll stay in here till i rot and the maggots carry me out through the cracks in the stockade before i'll so much as raise my little finger to help the infernal confederacy or rebels in any shape or form 
in august a macon shoemaker came in to get some of his trade to go back with them to work in the confederate shoe factory he prosecuted his search for these until he reached the center of the camp on the north side when some of the shoemakers who had gathered around him apparently considering his propositions seized him and threw him into a well he was kept there a whole day and only released when wirtz could out the rations of the prison for that day and announced that no more would be issued until the man was returned safe and sound to the gate the terrible crowding was somewhat ameliorated by the opening in july of an addition six hundred feet long to the north side of the stockade this increased the room inside to twenty acres giving about an acre to every one thousand seven hundred men a preposterously contracted area still the new ground was not a hotbed of virulent poison like the olds however and those who moved on to it had that much in their favour the palisades between the new and the old portions of the pen were left standing when the new portion was opened we were still suffering a great deal of inconvenience from lack of wood that night the standing timbers were attacked by thousands of prisoners armed with every species of a tool to cut wood from a case knife to an axe they worked the livelong night with such energy that by morning not only every inch of the logs above ground had disappeared but that below had been dug up and there was not enough left of the eight hundred foot wall of twenty five foot logs to make a box of matches one afternoon early in august one of the violent rain storms common to that section sprung up and in a little while the water was falling in torrents the little creek running through the camp swelled up immensely and swept out large gaps in the stockade both in the west and east sides the rebels noticed the breaches as soon as the prisoners two guns were fired from the star tort and all the guards rushed out in form so as to prevent any egress if one was attempted taken by surprise we were not in a condition to profit by the opportunity until it was too late the storm did one good thing it swept away a great deal of filth and left the camp much more wholesome the foul stench rising from the camp made an excellent electrical conductor and the lightning struck several times within one hundred feet of the prison toward the end of august there happened what the religiously inclined termed a providential dispensation the water in the creek was indescribably bad no amount of familiarity with it no increase of intimacy with our offensive surroundings could lessen the disgust at the polluted water as i have said previously before the stream entered the stockade it was rendered too filthy for any use by the contaminations from the camps of the guards situated about a half mile above immediately on entering the stockade the contamination became terrible the oozy seep at the bottom of the hillsides drained directly into it all the mass of filth from a population of thirty three thousand imagine the condition of an open sewer passing through the heart of a city of that many people and receiving all the offensive product of so dense a gathering into a shallow sluggish stream a yard wide and five inches deep and heated by the burning rays of the sun in the thirty-second degree of latitude imagine if one can without becoming sick at the stomach all of these people having to wash in and drink of this foul flow there is not a scintilla of exaggeration in this statement that it is within the exact truth is demonstrable by the testimony of any man rebel or union who ever saw the inside of the stockade at andersonville i am quite content to have its truth as well as that of any other statement made in this book be determined by the evidence of any one no matter how bitter his hatred of the union who had any personal knowledge of the condition of affairs at andersonville no one can successfully deny that there were at least thirty three thousand prisoners in the stockade that the one shallow narrow creek which passed through the prison was at once their main sewer and their source of supply of water or for bathing drinking and washing with these main facts admitted the reader's common sense of natural consequences will furnish the rest of the details it is true that some of the more fortunate of us had wells thanks to our own energy in overcoming extraordinary obstacles no thanks to our jailers for making the slightest effort to provide these necessities of life we dug the wells with case and pocket knives and half canteens to a depth of from twenty to thirty feet pulling up the dirt and pantaloons legs and running continual risk of being smothered to death by the caving in of the unwalled sides not only did the rebels refuse to give us boards with which to wall the wells and buckets for drawing the water but they did all in their power to prevent us from digging the wells and made continual forays to capture the digging tools because the wells were frequently used as the starting places for tunnels 
professor jones lays special stress on this tunnel feature in his testimony which i have introduced in a previous chapter the great majority of the prisoners who went to the creek for water went as near as possible to the dead line on the west side where the creek entered the stockade that they might get water with as little filth in it as possible in the crowd struggling there for their turn to take a dip some one nearly every day got so close to the dead line as to arouse a suspicion in the guard's mind that he was touching it the suspicion was the unfortunate one's death warrant and also its execution as the sluggish brain of the guard conceived it he levelled his gun the distance to his victim was not over one hundred feet he never failed his aim the first warning the wretched prisoner got that he was suspected of transgressing a prison rule was the charge of ball and buck that tore through his body it was lucky if he was the only one of the group killed more wicked and unjustifiable murders never were committed than these almost daily assassinations at the creek one morning the camp was astonished beyond measure to discover that during the night a large bowl spring had burst out on the north side about midway between the swamp and the summit of the hill it poured out its grateful flood of pure sweet water in an apparently exhaustless quantity to the many who looked in wonder upon it it seemed as truly a heaven-wrought miracle as when moses's enchanted rod smote the parched rock in sinai's desert waste and the living waters gushed forth the police took charge of the spring and every one was compelled to take his regular turn in filling his vessel this was kept up during our hold stay in andersonville and every morning shortly after daybreak a thousand men could be seen standing in line waiting for their turns to fill their cans and cups with the precious liquid i am told by comrades who have revisited the stockade of recent years that the spring is yet running as when we left and is held in most pious veneration by the negroes of that vicinity who still preserve the tradition of its miraculous origin and ascribe to its water wonderful grace-giving and healing properties similar to those which pious catholics believe exist in the holy water of the fountain at lourdes i must confess that i do not think they are so very far from right if i could believe that any water was sacred and thaumaturgic it would be of the fountain which appeared so opportunely for the benefit of the perishing thousands of andersonville and when i hear of people bringing water for baptismal purposes from the jordan i say in my heart how much more would i value for myself and friends the administration of the chrismal sacrament with a diviner flow from that low sand-hill in western georgia End of chapter forty six chapter forty seven of andersonville a story of rebel military prisons by john mcelroy this librivox recording is in the public domain sick call and the scenes that accompanied it mustering the lame halt and diseased at the south gate an unusually bad case going out to the hospital accommodation and treatment of the patients there the horrible suffering in the gangrene ward bungling amputations by blundering practitioners affection between a sailor and his ward death of my comrade every morning after roll call thousands of sick gathered at the south gate where the doctors made some pretence of affording medical relief the scene there reminded me of the illustrations of my sunday school lessons of that time when great multitudes came unto him by the shores of the sea of galilee having with them those that were lame blind dumb maimed and many others had the crowds worn the flouting robes of the east the picture would have lacked nothing but the presence of the son of man to make it complete here were the burning sands and parching sun here there came scores of groups of three or four comrades laboriously staggering under the weight of a blanket in which they had carried a disabled and dying friend from some distant part of the stockade beside them hobbled the scorbutics with swollen and distorted limbs each more loathsome and nearer death than the lepers whom christ's divine touch made whole dozens unable to walk and having no comrades to carry them crawled painfully along with frequent stops on their hands and knees every form of intense physical suffering that it is possible for disease to induce in the human frame was visible at these daily parades of the sick of the prison 
as over three thousand three thousand and seventy six died in august there were probably twelve thousand dangerously sick at any given time during the month and a large part of these collected at the south gate every morning measurably calloused as we had become by the daily sights of horror around us we encountered spectacles in these gatherings which no amount of visible misery could accustom us to i remember one especially that burned itself deeply into my memory it was of a young man not over twenty-five who a few weeks ago his clothes looked comparatively new had evidently been the picture of manly beauty and youthful vigour he had had a well-knit lithe form dark curling hair fell over a forehead which had once been fair and his eyes still showed that they had gleamed with a bold adventurous spirit the red clover leaf on his cap showed that he belonged to the first division of the second corps the three chevrons on his arm that he was a sergeant and the stripe at his cuff that he was a veteran some kind-hearted boy had found him in a miserable condition on the north side and carried him over in a blanket to where the doctors could see him he had but little clothing on save his blouse and cap ulcers of some kind had formed in his abdomen and these were now masses of squirming worms it was so much worse than the usual forms of suffering that quite a little crowd of compassionate spectators gathered around and expressed their pity the sufferer turned to one who lay beside him with comrade if we were only under the old stars and stripes we wouldn't care a goddamn for a few worms would we this was not profane it was an utterance from the depths of a brave man's heart couched in the strongest language at his command it seemed terrible that so gallant a soul should depart from earth in this miserable fashion some of us much moved by the sight went to the doctors and put the case as strongly as possible begging them to do something to alleviate his suffering they declined to see the case but got rid of us by giving us a bottle of turpentine with directions to pour it in upon the ulcers to kill the maggots we did so it must have been cruel torture and as absurd remedially as cruel but our hero set his teeth and endured without a groan he was then carried out to the hospital to die i said the doctors made a pretence of affording medical relief it was hardly that since about all the prescription for those inside the stockade consisted in giving a handful of sumac berries to each of those complaining of scurvy the berries might have done some good had there been enough of them and had their action been assisted by proper food as it was they were probably nearly if not wholly useless nothing was given to arrest the ravages of dysentery a limited number of the worst cases were admitted to the hospital each day as this only had capacity for about one quarter of the sick in the stockade new patients could only be admitted as others died it seemed anyway like signing a man's death warrant to send him to the hospital as three out of every four who went out there died the following from the official report of the hospital shows this total number admitted twelve thousand nine hundred died eight thousand six hundred and sixty three exchanged eight hundred and twenty eight took the oath of allegiance twenty five sent elsewhere two thousand eight hundred and eighty nine total twelve thousand four hundred average deaths seventy six per cent early in august i made a successful effort to get out to the hospital i had several reasons for this first one of my chums w w watts of my own company had been sent out a little while before very sick with scurvy and pneumonia and i wanted to see if i could do anything for him if he still lived i have mentioned before that for a while after our entrance into andersonville five of us slept on one overcoat and covered ourselves with one blanket two of these had already died leaving as possessors of the blanket and overcoat w w watts b b andrews and myself next i wanted to go out to see if there was any prospect of escape i had long since given up hopes of escaping from the stockade all our attempts at tunnelling had resulted in dead failures and now to make us wholly despair of success in that direction another stockade was built clear around the prison at a distance of one hundred and twenty feet from the first palisades it was manifest that though we might succeed in tunnelling past one stockade we could not go beyond the second one i had the scurvy rather badly and being naturally slight in frame i presented a very sick appearance to the physicians and was passed out to the hospital while this was a wretched affair it was still a vast improvement on the stockade about five acres of ground a little southeast of the stockade and bordering on a creek were enclosed by a board fence around which the guard walked trees shaded the ground tolerably well there were tents and flies to shelter part of the sick and in these were beds made of pine leaves there were 
regular streets and alleys running through the grounds and as the management was in the hands of our own men the place was kept reasonably clean and orderly for andersonville there was also some improvement in the food rice in some degree replaced the nauseous and innutritious corn-bread and if served in sufficient quantities would doubtless have promoted the recovery of many men dying from dysenteric diseases we also received small quantities of okra a plant peculiar to the south whose pods contained a mucilaginous matter that made a soup very grateful to those suffering from scurvy but all these ameliorations of condition were too slight to even arrest the progress of the disease of the thousands of dying men brought out from the stockade they still wore the same lice infested garments as in prison no baths or even ordinary applications of soap and water cleaned their dirt grimed skins to give their pores an opportunity to assist in restoring them to health even their long lank and matted hair swarming with vermin was not trimmed the most ordinary and obvious measures for their comfort and care were neglected if a man recovered he did it almost in spite of fate the medicines given were scanty and crude the principal remedial agent as far as my observation extended was a rank feeded species of unrectified spirits which i was told was made from sorghum seed it had a light green tinge and was about as inviting to the taste as spirits of turpentine it was given to the sick in small quantities mixed with water i had had some experience with kentucky applejack which it was popularly believed among the boys would dissolve a piece of the fattest pork thrown into it but that seemed balmy and oily alongside of this after tasting some i ceased to wonder at the atrocities of worse and his associates nothing would seem too bad to a man who made that his habitual tipple for a more particular description of the hospital i must refer my reader to the testimony of professor jones in a previous chapter certainly this continent has never seen and i fervently trust it will never again see such a gigantic concentration of misery as that hospital displayed daily the official statistics tell the story of this with terrible brevity there were three thousand seven hundred and nine in the hospital in august one thousand four hundred and eighty nine nearly every other man died the rate afterwards became much higher than this the most conspicuous suffering was in the gangrene wards horrible sores spreading almost visibly from hour to hour devoured men's limbs and bodies i remember one ward in which the alterations appeared to be altogether in the back where they ate out the tissue between the skin and the ribs the attendants seemed trying to arrest the progress of the sloughing by dredging the sores with a solution of blue vitriol this was exquisitely painful and in the morning when the drenching was going on the whole hospital rang with the most agonizing screams but the gangrene mostly attacked the legs and arms and the, the legs more than the arms sometimes it killed men inside of a week sometimes they lingered on indefinitely i remember one man in the stockade who cut his hand with the sharp corner of a cart of cornbread he was lifting from the ration wagon gangrene set in immediately and he died four days after one form that was quite prevalent was a cancer of the lower one corner of the mouth and it finally ate the whole side of the face out of course the sufferer had the greatest trouble in eating and drinking for the latter it was customary to whittle out a little wooden tube and fasten it in a tin cup through which he could suck up the water as this mouth cancer seemed contagious none of us would allow any one afflicted with it to use any of our cooking utensils the rebel doctors at the hospital resorted to wholesale amputations to check the progress of the gangrene they had a two hours session of limb lopping every morning each of which resulted in quite a pile of severed members i presume more bungling operations are rarely seen outside of russia or turkish hospitals their unskilfulness was apparent even to non-scientific observers like myself the standard of medical education in the south as indeed of every other form of education was quite low the chief surgeon of the prison dr isaiah white and perhaps two or three others seemed to be gentlemen of fair abilities and attainments the remainder were of that class of illiterate and unlearning quacks who physic and blister the poor whites and negroes in the country districts of the south who believe they can stop bleeding of the nose by repeating a verse from the bible who think that if in gathering their favourite remedy of bone set they cut the stem upwards it will purge their patients and if downward it will vomit them and who hold that there is nothing so good for fits as a black cat killed in the dark of the moon cut open and bound while yet warm upon the naked chest of the victim of the convulsions 
they had a case of instruments captured for some of our field hospitals which were dull and fearfully out of order with poor instruments and unskilled hands the operations became mangling in the hospital i saw an admirable illustration of the affection which a sailor will lavish on a ship's boy whom he takes a fancy to makes his chicken as the phrase is the united states sloop water which had recently been captured in Asaba sound and her crew brought into prison one of her boys a bright handsome little fellow of about fifteen had lost one of his arms in the fight he was brought into the hospital and the old fellow whose chicken he was was allowed to accompany and nurse him this old barnacle back was as surly and a growler as ever went aloft but to his chicken he was as tender and thoughtful as a woman they found a shady nook in one corner and any moment one looked in that direction he could see the old tar hard at work at something for the comfort and pleasure of his pet now he was dressing the wound as deftly and gently as a mother caring for a new-born babe now he was trying to concoct some relish out of the slender materials he could beg or steal from the quartermaster now trying to arrange the shade of the bed of pine leaves in a more comfortable manner now repairing or washing his clothes and so on all the sailors were particularly favoured by being allowed to bring their backs in untouched by the guards this chicken had a wonderful supply of clothes the handiwork of his protector who like most good sailors was very skilful with the needle he had suits of fine white duck embroidered with blue in a way that would ravish the heart of a fine lady and blue suits similarly embroidered with white no bell ever kept her clothes in better order than these were when the duck came up from the old sailor's patient washing it was as spotless as new fallen snow i found my chum in a very bad condition his appetite was entirely gone but he had an inordinate craving for tobacco for strong black plug which he smoked in a pipe he had already traded off all his brass buttons to the guards for this i had accumulated a few buttons to bribe the guard to take me out for wood and i gave these also for tobacco for him when i awoke one morning the man who laid next to me on the right was dead having died some time during the night i searched his pockets and took what was in them these were a silk pocket handkerchief a gutta percha finger ring a comb a pencil and a leather pocket-book making in all quite a nice little find i hid over to the guard and succeeded in trading the personal estate which i had inherited from the interested deceased for a handful of peaches a handful of hardly ripe figs and a long plug of tobacco i hastened back to watts expecting that the figs and peaches would do him a world of good at first i did not show him the tobacco as i was strongly opposed to his using it thinking that it was making him much worse but he looked at the tempting peaches and figs with lacklustre eyes he was too far gone to care for them he pushed them back to me saying faintly no you take em mac i don't want em i can't eat em i then produced the tobacco and his face lightened up concluding that this was all the comfort that he could have and that i might as well gratify him i cut up some of the weed filled his pipe and lighted it he smoked calmly and almost happily all the afternoon hardly speaking a word to me as it grew dark he asked me to bring him a drink i did so as, as i raised him up he said mac this thing's ended tell my father that i stood it as long as i could and the death rattle sounded in his throat and when i laid him back it was all over straightening out his limbs folding his hands across his breast and composing his features as best i could i lay down beside the body and slept till morning when i did what little else i could toward preparing for the grave all that was left of my long-suffering little friend End of chapter forty seven chapter forty eight of andersonville a story of rebel military prisons by john mcelroy this librivox recording is in the public domain determination to escape d different plans and their merits i prefer the apalachicola route preparations for departure a hot day the fence passed successfully pursued by the hounds caught returned to the stockade after watt's death i set earnestly about seeing what could be done in the way of escape frank harvey of the first west virginia cavalry a boy of about my own age and disposition joined with me in the scheme i was still possessed with my original plan of making my way down the creeks to the flint river down the flint river to where it emptied into the apalachicola river and down that stream to its debouture into the bay that connected with the gulf of mexico i was sure of finding my way by this route because if nothing else offered i could get astride of a log and float down the current 
the way to sherman in the other direction was long tortuous and difficult with a fearful gauntlet of bloodhounds patrols and the scouts of hood's army to be run i had but little difficulty in persuading harvey into an acceptance of my views and we began arranging for a solution of the first great problem how to get outside of the hospital grounds as i have explained before the hospital was surrounded by a board fence with guards walking their beats on the ground outside a small creek flowed through the southern end of the grounds and at its lower end was used as a sink the boards of the fence came down to the surface of the water where the creek passed out but we found by careful prodding with a stick that the hole between the boards at the bottom of the creek was sufficiently large to allow the passage of our bodies and there had been no stakes driven or other precautions used to prevent egress by this channel a guard was posted there and probably ordered to stand at the edge of the stream but it smelled so vilely in those scorching days that he had consulted his feelings and probably his health by retiring to the top of the bank a rod up or more distant we watched night after night and at last were gratified to find that none went nearer the creek than the top of this bank then we waited for the moon to come right so that the first part of the night should be dark this took several days but at last we knew that the next night she would not rise until between nine and ten o'clock which would give us nearly two hours of the dense darkness of a moonless summer night in the south we at first thought of saving up some rations for the trip but then reflected that these would be ruined by the filthy water into which we must sink to go under the fence it was not difficult to abandon the food idea since it was very hard to force ourselves to lay by even the smallest portion of our scanty rations as the next day wore on our minds were wrought up into exalted tension by the rapid approach of the supreme moment with all its chances and consequences the experience of the past few months was not such as to mentally fit us for such a hazard it prepared us for sullen uncomplaining endurance for calmly contemplating the worst that could come but it did not strengthen that fibre of mind that leads to venturesome activity and daring exploits doubtless the weakness of our bodies reacted upon our spirits we contemplated all the perils that confronted us perils that now looming up with impending nearness took a clearer and more threatening shape than they had ever done before we considered the desperate chances of passing the guard unseen or if noticed of escaping his fire without death or severe wounds but supposing him fortunately evaded then came the gauntlet of the hounds and the patrols hunting deserters after this a long weary journey with bare feet and almost naked bodies through an unknown country abounding with enemies the dangers of assassination by the embittered populace the risks of dying with hunger and fatigue in the gloomy depths of a swamp the scanty hopes that if we reached the seashore we could get to our vessels not one of all these contingencies failed to expand itself to all its alarming proportions and unite with its fellows to form a dreadful vista like the valleys the filled with demons and genii dragons and malign enchantments which confront the heroes of the arabian nights when they set out to perform their exploits but behind us lay more miseries and horrors than a riotous imagination could conceive before us could certainly be nothing worse we would put life and freedom to the hazard of a touch and win or lose it all the day had been intolerably hot the sun's rays seemed to seal the earth like heated irons and the air that lay on the burning sand was broken by wavy lines such as one sees indicate the radiation from a hot stove except the wretched chain-gang plodding tortuously back and forward on the hillside not a soul nor an animal could be seen in motion outside the stockade the hounds were panting in their kennel the rebel officers half or wholly drunken with villainous sorghum whisky were stretched at full length in the shade at headquarters the half cake gunners crouched under the shadow of the un bankments of the forts the guards hung limply over the stockade in front of their little perches the thirty thousand boys inside the stockade prone or supine upon the glowing sand gasped for breath for one draught of 
sweet cool wholesome air that did not bear on its wings the subtle seeds of rank corruption and death everywhere was the prostration of discomfort the inertia of sluggishness only the sick moved only the pain racked cried out only the dying struggled only the agonies of dissolution could make life assert itself against the exhaustion of the heat harvey and i lying in the scanty shade of the trunk of a tall pine and with hearts filled with solicitude as to the outcome of what the evening would bring us looked out over the scene as we had done daily for long months and remained silent for hours until the sun as if weary with torturing and slaying began going down in the blazing west the groans of the thousands of sick around us the shrieks of the rotting ones in the gangrene wards rang incessantly in our ears as the sun disappeared and the heat abated the suspended activity was restored the master of the hounds came out with his yelping pack and started on his rounds the rebel officers aroused themselves from their siesta and went lazily about their duties the fifer produced his cracked fife and piped forth his unvarying bonny blue flag as a signal for dress parade and drums beaten by unskilled hands in the camps of the different regiments repeated the signal in time stockade the mass of humanity became full of motion as an anthill and resembled it very much from our point of view with the boys threading their way among the burrows tents and holes it was becoming dark quite rapidly the moment seemed galloping onward toward the time when we must make the decisive step we drew from the dirty rag in which it was wrapped the little piece of corn-bread that we had saved for our supper carefully divided into two equal parts and each took one and ate it in silence this done we held a final consultation as to our plans and went over each detail carefully that we might fully understand each other under all possible circumstances and act in concert one point we laboriously impressed upon each other and that was that under no circumstances were we to allow ourselves to be tempted to leave the creek until we reached its junction with the flint river i then picked up two pine leaves broke them off to unequal lengths rolled them in my hands behind my back for a second and presenting them to harvey with their ends sticking out of my closed hands said the one that gets the longest one goes first harvey reached forth and drew the longer one we made a tour of reconnaissance everything seemed as usual and wonderfully calm compared with the tumult in our minds the hospital guards were pacing their beats lazily those on the stockade were drawling listlessly the first call around of the evening post number four half past seven o'clock and all swell inside the stockade was a babel of sounds above all of which rose the melody of religious and patriotic songs sung in various parts of the camp from the headquarters came the shouts and laughter of the rebel officers having a little frolic in the cool of the evening the groans of the sick around us were gradually hushing as the abatement of the terrible heat let all but the worst cases sink into a brief slumber from which they awoke before midnight to renew their outcries but those in the gangrene ward seemed to be denied even this scanty blessing apparently they never slept for their shrieks never ceased a multitude of whippoorwills in the woods around us began their usual dismal cry which had never seemed so unearthly and full of dreadful presages as now it was now quite dark and we stole noiselessly down to the creek and reconnoitred we listened the guard was not pacing his beat as we could not hear his footsteps a large ill-shapen lump against the trunk of one of the trees on the bank showed that he was leaning there resting himself we watched him for several minutes but he did not move and the thought shot into our minds that he might be asleep but it seemed impossible it was too early in the evening now if ever was the opportunity harvey wheezed my hand stepped noiselessly into the creek and laid himself gently down into the filthy water and while my heart was beating so that i was certain it could be heard some distance from me began making toward the fence he passed under easily and i raised my eyes toward the guard while on my strained ear fell the soft plashing made by harvey as he pulled himself cautiously forward it seemed as if the sentinel must hear this he could not help it and every second i expected to see the black lump address itself to motion and the musket flash out fiendishly but he did not the lump remained motionless the musket silent 
when i thought that harvey had gained a sufficient distance i followed it seemed as if the disgusting water would smother me as i laid myself down into it and such was my agitation that it appeared almost impossible that i should escape making much such noise as would attract the guard's notice catching hold of the roots and limbs at the side of the stream i pulled myself slowly along and as noiselessly as possible i passed under the fence without difficulty and was outside and within fifteen feet of the guard i had lain down into the creek upon my right side that my face might be toward the guard and i could watch him closely all the time as i came under the fence he was still leaning motionless against the tree but to my heated imagination he appeared to have turned and be watching me i hardly breathed the filthy water rippling past me seemed to roar to attract the guard's attention i reached my hand out cautiously to grasp a root to pull myself along by and caught instead a dry branch which broke with a loud crack my heart absolutely stood still the guard evidently heard the noise the black lump separated itself from the tree and at the straight line which i knew to be his musket separated itself from the lump in a brief instant i lived a year of mortal apprehension so certain was i that he had discovered me and was levelling his piece to fire that i could scarcely restrain myself from springing up and dashing away to avoid the shot then i heard him take a step and to my unutterable surprise and relief he walked off farther from the creek evidently to speak to the man whose beat joined his i pulled away more swiftly but still with the greatest caution until after half an hour's painful effort i had gotten fully one hundred and fifty yards away from the hospital fence and found harvey crouched on a cypress knee close to the water's edge watching for me we waited there a few minutes until i could rest and calm my perturbed nerves down to something near their normal equilibrium and then started on we hoped that if we were as lucky in our next step as in the first one we would reach the flint river by daylight and have a good long start before the morning roll-call revealed our absence we could hear the hounds still baying in the distance but this sound was too customary to give us any uneasiness but our progress was terribly slow every step hurt fearfully the creek bed was full of roots and snags and briars and vines trailed across it these caught and tore our bare feet and legs rendered abnormally tender by the scurvy it seemed as if every step was marked with blood the vines tripped us and we frequently fell headlong we struggled on determinedly for nearly an hour and were perhaps a mile from the hospital the moon came up and its light showed that the creek continued its course through a dense jungle like that we had been traversing while on the high ground to our left were the open pine woods i have previously described we stopped and debated for a few minutes we recalled our promise to keep in the creek the experience of other boys who had tried to escape had been caught by the hounds if we stayed in the creek we were sure the hounds would not find our trail but it was equally certain that at this rate we would be exhausted and starved before we got out of sight of the prison it seemed that we had gone far enough to be out of reach of the packs patrolling immediately around the stockade and there could be but little risk in trying a short walk on the dry ground we concluded to take the chances and ascending the bank we walked and ran as fast as we could for about two miles further all at once it struck me that with all our progress the hounds sounded as near as when we started i shivered at the thud and though nearly ready to drop with fatigue urged myself and harvey on an instant later their baying rang out on the still night air right behind us and with fearful distinctness there was no mistake now they had found our trail and were running us down the change from fearful apprehension to the crushing reality stopped us stock still in our tracks at the next breath the hounds came bursting through the woods in plain sight and in full cry we obeyed our first impulse rushed back into the swamp forced our way for a few yards through the flesh tearing impediments until we gained a large cypress upon whose great knees we climbed thoroughly exhausted just as the yelping pack reached the edge of the water and stopped there and baited us it was a physical impossibility for us to go another step in a moment the low-browed villain who had charge of the hounds came galloping up on his mule tooting signals to his dogs as he came on the cow horn slung from his shoulders he immediately discovered us covered us with his revolver and yelled out come ashore there quick you sons of bitches 
there was no help for it we climbed down off knees and started towards the land as we neared it the hounds became almost frantic and it seemed as if we would be torn to pieces the moment they could reach us but the master dismounted and drove them back he was surly even savage to us but seemed in too much hurry to get back to waste any time annoying us with the dogs he ordered us to get around in front of the mule and start back to camp we moved as rapidly as our fatigue and our lacerated feet would allow us and before midnight were again in the hospital fatigued filthy torn bruised and wretched beyond description or conception the next morning we were turned back into the stockade as punishment End of chapter forty eight chapter forty nine of andersonville a story of rebel military prisons by john mcelroy this LibriVox recording is in the public domain august good luck in not meeting captain wirtz that worthy's treatment of recaptured prisoners secret societies in prison singular meeting and its result discovery and removal of the officers among the enlisted men harvey and i were specially fortunate in being turned back into the stockade without being brought before captain wirtz we subsequently learned that we owed this good luck to wirtz's absence on sick leave his place being supplied by lieutenant davis a moderate-brained baltimorean and one of that horde of marylanders in the rebel army whose principal service to the confederacy consisted in working themselves into bomb-proof places and forcing those whom they displaced into the field winder was the illustrious head of this crowd of bomb-proof rebels from maryland my maryland whose enthusiasm for the southern cause and consistency in serving it only in such places as were out of range of the yankee artillery was the subject of many bitter jibes by the rebels especially by those who secure berths they possess themselves of lieutenant davis went into the war with great brashness he was one of the mob which attacked the sixth massachusetts in its passage through baltimore but like all of that class of roughs he got a stomach full of war as soon as the real business of fighting began and he retired to where the chances of attaining a ripe old age were better than in front of the army of the potomac's muskets we shall hear of davis again encountering captain wirtz was one of the terrors of an abortive attempt to escape when recaptured prisoners were brought before him he would frequently give way to paroxysms of screaming rage so violent as to closely verge on insanity brandishing the fearful and wonderful revolver of which i have spoken in such a manner as to threaten the luckless captives with instant death he would shriek out imprecations curses and foul epithets in french german and english until he fairly frothed at the mouth there were plenty of stories current in camp of his having several times given away to his rage so far as to actually shoot men down in these interviews and still more of his knocking boys down and jumping upon them until he inflicted injuries that soon resulted in death how true these rumours were i am unable to say of my own personal knowledge since i never saw him kill any one nor have i talked with any one who did there were a number of cases of this kind testified to upon his trial but they all happened among paroles outside the stockade or among the prisoners inside after we left so i knew nothing of them one of the old switzer's favourite ways of ending these seances was to inform the boys that he would have them shot in an hour or so and bid them prepare for death after keeping them in fearful suspense for hours he would order them to be punished with the stocks the ball and chain the chain gang or if his fierce mood had burned itself entirely out as was quite likely with a man of shallow brain and vacillating temper to be simply returned to the stockade nothing i am sure since the days of the inquisition or still later since the terrible punishments visited upon the insurgents of eighteen forty eight by the austrian aristocrats has been so diabolical as the stocks and chain gangs as used by wirtz at one time seven men sitting in the stocks near the star fort in plain view of the camp became objects of interest to everybody inside they were never relieved from their painful position but were kept there until all of them died i think it was nearly two weeks before the last one succumbed what they endured in that time even imagination cannot conceive i do not think that an indian tribe ever devised keener torture for its captives 
the chain gang consisted of a number of men varying from twelve to twenty-five all chained to one sixty-four pound ball they were also stationed near the star fort standing out in the hot sun without a particle of shade over them when one moved they all had to move they were scourged with the dysentery and the necessities of some one of their number kept them constantly in motion i can see them distinctly yet tramping laboriously and painfully back and forward over that burning hillside every moment of the long weary summer days a comrade writes to remind me of the beneficent work of the masonic order i mention it most gladly as it was the sole recognition on the part of any of our foes of our claims to human kinship the churches of all denominations except the solitary catholic priest father hamilton ignored us as wholly as if we were dumb beasts lay humanitarians were equally indifferent and the only interest manifested by any rebel in the welfare of any prisoner was by the masonic brotherhood the rebel masons interested themselves in securing details outside the stockade in the cookhouse the commissary and elsewhere for the brethren among the prisoners who would accept such favours such as did not feel inclined to go outside on parole received frequent presents in the way of food and especially of vegetables which were literally beyond price materials were sent inside to build tents for the masons and i think such as made themselves known before death received burial according to the rites of the order dr white and perhaps other surgeons belonged to the fraternity and the, and the wearing of a masonic emblem by a new prisoner was pretty sure to catch their eyes and be the means of securing for the wearer the tender of their good offices such as a detail into the hospital as nurse and wardmaster etc i was not fortunate enough to be one of the mystic brethren and so missed all share in any of these benefits as well as in any others and i take special pride in one thing that during my whole imprisonment i was not beholden to a rebel for a single favour of any kind the rebel does not live who can say that he ever gave me so much as a handful of meal a spoonful of salt an inch of thread or a stick of wood from first to last i received nothing but my rations except occasional trifles that i succeeded in stealing from the stupid officers charged with issuing rations i owe no man in the southern confederacy gratitude for anything not even for a kind word speaking of secret society pins recalls a noteworthy story which has been told me since the war of, of boys whom i knew at the breaking out of hostilities there existed in toledo a festive little secret society such as lurking boys frequently organize with no other object than fun and the usual adolescent love of mystery there were a dozen or so members in it who called themselves the royal rubens and were headed by a bookbinder named ned hopkins some one started a branch of the order in napoleon oh and among the members was charles e reynolds of that town the badge of the society was a peculiarly shaped gold pin reynolds and hopkins never met and had no acquaintance with each other when the war broke out hopkins enlisted in battery h first ohio artillery and was sent to the army of the potomac where he was captured in the fall of eighteen sixty three while scouting in the neighborhood of richmond reynolds entered the sixty eighth ohio volunteer infantry and was taken in the neighborhood of jackson mississippi two thousand miles from the place of hopkins's capture at andersonville hopkins became one of the officers in charge of the hospital one day a rebel sergeant who called the roll in the stockade after studying hopkins's pin a minute said i seed a yank in the stockade to-day a wearin a pin exactly like that air this aroused hopkins's interest and he went inside in search of the other feller having his squad and detachment there was little difficulty in finding him he recognized the pin spoke to his wearer gave him the grand hailing sign of the royal rubens and it was duly responded to the upshot of the matter was that he took reynolds out with him as a clerk and saved his life as the latter was going down hill very rapidly reynolds in turn secured the detail of a comrade of the sixty eighth who was failing fast and succeeded in saving his life all of which happy results were directly attributable to that insignificant boyish society and its equally unimportant badge of membership 
along in the last of august the rebels learned that there were between two and three hundred captains and lieutenants in the stockade passing themselves off as enlisted men the motive of these officers was twofold first a chivalrous wish to share the fortunes and fate of their boys and second disinclination to gratify the rebels by the knowledge of the rank of their captives the secret was so well kept that none of us suspected it until the fact was announced by the rebels themselves they were taken out immediately and sent to macon where the commissioned officer's prison was it would not do to trust such possible leaders with us another day end of chapter forty nine chapter fifty of andersonville a story of rebel military prisons by john mcelroy this librivox recording is in the public domain food the meagreness inferior quality and terrible sameness rebel testimony on the subject futility of successful explanation i have in other places dwelt upon the insufficiency and the nauseousness of the food no words that i can use no insistence upon this theme can give the reader any idea of its mortal importance to us let the reader consider for a moment the quantity quality and variety of food that he now holds to be necessary for the maintenance of life and health i trust that every one who peruses this book that every one in fact over whom the stars and stripes wave has his cup of coffee his biscuits and his beef steak for breakfast a substantial dinner of roast or boiled and a lighter but still sufficient meal in the evening in all certainly not less than fifty different articles are set before him during the day for his choice as elements of nourishment let him scan this extended bill of fare which long custom has made so commonplace as to be uninteresting perhaps even wearisome to think about and see what he could omit from it if necessity compelled him after a reluctant farewell to fish butter eggs milk sugar green and preserved fruits etc he thinks that perhaps under extraordinary circumstances he might be able to merely sustain life for a limited period on a diet of bread and meat three times a day washed down with creamless unsweetened coffee and varied occasionally with additions of potatoes onions beans etc it would astonish the innocent to have one of our veterans inform him that this was not even the first stage of destitution that a soldier who had these was expected to be on the summit level of contentment any of the boys who followed grant to appomattox courthouse sherman to the sea or pap thomas till his glorious career culminated with the annihilation of hood will tell him of many weeks when a slice of fat pork on a piece of hard tack had to do duty for the breakfast of beef steak and biscuits when another slice of fat pork and another cracker served for the dinner of roast beef and vegetables and a third cracker and slice of pork was a substitute for the supper of toast and chops i say to these veterans in turn that they did not arrive at the first stages of destitution compared with the depths to which we were dragged the restriction for a few weeks to a diet of crackers and fat pork was certainly a hardship but the crackers alone chemists tell us contained all the elements necessary to support life and in our army they were always well made and very palatable i believe i risk nothing in saying that one of the ordinary square crackers of our commissary department contained much more real nutriment than the whole of our average ration i have before compared the size shape and appearance of the daily half loaf of corn bread issued to us to a half brick and i do not yet know of a more fitting comparison at first we got a small piece of rusty bacon along with this but the size of this diminished steadily until at last it faded away entirely and during the last six months of our imprisonment i do not believe that we received rations of meat above a half dozen times to this smallness was added ineffable badness the meal was ground very coarsely by dull weakly propelled stones that imperfectly crushed the grains and left the tough hard coating of the kernels in large sharp mica-like scales which cut and inflamed the stomach and intestines like handfuls of pounded glass the alimentary canals of all compelled to eat it were kept in a continual state of irritation that usually terminated in incurable dysentery 
that i have not overstated this evil can be seen by reference to the testimony of so competent a scientific observer as professor jones and i add to that unimpeachable testimony the following extract from the statement made in an attempted defence of andersonville by dr r randolph stevenson who styles himself formerly surgeon of the army of the confederate states of america chief surgeon of the confederate states military prison hospitals andersonville georgia five from the sameness of the food and from the action of the poisonous gases in the densely crowded and filthy stockade and hospital the blood was altered in its constitution even before the manifestation of actual disease in both the well and the sick the red corpuscles were diminished and in all diseases uncomplicated with inflammation the fibrinous element was deficient in cases of ulceration of the mucous membrane of the intestinal canal the fibrinous element of the blood appeared to be increased while in simple diarrhoea uncomplicated with ulceration and dependent upon the character of the food and the existence of scurvy it was either diminished or remained stationary heart clots were very common if not universally present in the cases of ulceration of the intestinal mucous membrane while in the uncomplicated cases of diarrhoea and scurvy the blood was fluid and did not coagulate readily and the heart clots and fibrinous concretions were almost universally absent from the watery condition of the blood there resulted various serous effusions into the pericardium into the ventricles of the brain and into the abdominal cavity in almost all cases which i examined after death even in the most emaciated there was more or less serous effusion into the abdominal cavity in cases of hospital gangrene of the extremities and in cases of gangrene of the intestines heart clots and firm coagula were universally present the presence of these clots in the cases of hospital gangrene whilst they were absent in the cases in which there were no inflammatory symptoms appears to sustain the conclusion that hospital gangrene is a species of inflammation imperfect and irregular though it may be in its progress in which the fibrinous element and coagulability of the blood are increased even in those who are suffering from such a condition of the blood and from such diseases as are naturally accompanied with a decrease in the fibrinous constituent six the impoverished condition of the blood which led to serous effusions within the ventricles of the brain and around the brain and spinal cord and into the pericardial and abdominal cavities was gradually induced by the action of several causes but chiefly by the character of the food the federal prisoners as a general rule had been reared upon wheat bread and irish potatoes and the indian cordon so extensively used at the south was almost unknown to them as an article of diet previous to their capture owing to the impossibility of obtaining the necessary sieves in the confederacy for the separation of the husk from the corn meal the rations of the confederate soldiers as well as of the federal prisoners consisted of unbolted corn flour and meal and grist this circumstance rendered the corn bread still more disagreeable and distasteful to the federal prisoners while well, indian meal even when prepared with the husk is one of the most wholesome and nutritious forms of food as has been already shown by the health and rapid increase of the southern population and especially of the negroes previous to the present war and by the strength endurance and activity of the confederate soldiers who were throughout the war confined to a great extent to unbolted corn meal it is nevertheless true that those who have not been reared upon corn corn meal or who have not accustomed themselves to its use gradually become excessively tired of this kind of diet when suddenly confined to it without a due proportion of wheat bread large numbers of the federal prisoners appeared to be utterly disgusted with indian corn and immense piles of corn bread could be seen in the stockade and hospital enclosures those who were so disgusted with this form of food that they had no appetite to partake of it except in quantities insufficient to supply the waste of the tissues were of course in the condition of men slowly to starving notwithstanding that the only farinaceous form of food which the confederate states produced in sufficient abundance for the maintenance of armies was not withheld from them in such cases an urgent feeling of hunger was not a prominent symptom and even when it existed at first it soon disappeared and was succeeded by an actual loathing of food in this state the muscular strength was rapidly diminished the tissues wasted and the thin skeleton-like forms moved about with the appearance of utter exhaustion and dejection the mental condition connected with long confinement with the most miserable surroundings and with no hope of or the future also depressed all the nervous and vital actions and was especially active in destroying the appetite 
the effects of mental depression and of defective nutrition were manifested not only in the slow feeble motions of the wasted skeleton-like forms but also in such lethargy listlessness and torpor of the mental faculties as rendered these unfortunate men oblivious and indifferent to their afflicted condition in many cases even of the greatest apparent suffering and distress instead of showing any anxiety to communicate the causes of their distress or to relate their privations and their longings for their homes and their friends and relatives they lay in a listless lethargic and uncomplaining state taking no notice either of their own distressed condition or of the gigantic mass of human misery by which they were surrounded nothing appalled and depressed me so much as this silent uncomplaining misery it is a fact of great interest that notwithstanding this defect of nutrition in men subjected to crowding and filth contagious fevers were rare and typhus fever which is supposed to be generated in just such a state of things as existed at andersonville was unknown these facts established by my investigations stand in striking contrast with such a statement as the following by a recent english writer a deficiency of food especially of the nitrogenous part quickly leads to the breaking up of the animal frame plague pestilence and famine are associated with each other in the public mind and the records of every country show how closely they are related the medical history of ireland is remarkable for the illustrations of how much mischief may be occasioned by a general deficiency of food always the habitat of fever it every now and then becomes the very hotbed of its propagation and development let there be but a small failure in the usual imperfect supply of food and the lurking seeds of pestilence are ready to burst into frightful activity the famine of the present century is but too forcible and illustrative of this it fostered epidemics which have not been witnessed in this generation and gave rise to scenes of devastation and misery which are not surpassed by the most appalling epidemics of the middle ages the principal form of the scourge was known as the contagious famine fever typhus and it spread not merely from end to end of the country in which it had been originated but breaking through all boundaries it crossed the broad ocean and made itself painfully manifest in localities where it was previously unknown thousands fell under the virulence of its action for wherever it came it struck down a seventh of the people and of those whom it attacked not one out of nine perished even those who escaped the fatal influence of it were left the miserable victims of scurvy and low fever while we readily admit that famine induces that state of the system which is the most susceptible to the action of fever poisons and thus induces a state of the entire population which is most favourable for the rapid and destructive spread of all contagious fevers at the same time we are forced by the facts established by the present war as well as by a host of others both old and new to admit that we are still ignorant of the causes necessary for the origin of typhus fever added to the imperfect nature of the rations issued to the federal prisoners the difficulties of their situation were at times greatly increased by the sudden and desolating federal raids in virginia georgia and other states which necessitated the sudden transportation from richmond and other points threatened at law of large bodies of prisoners without the possibility of much previous preparation and not only did these men suffer in transition upon the dilapidated and overburdened line of railroad communication but after arriving at andersonville the the rations were frequently insufficient to supply the sudden addition of several thousand men and as the confederacy became more and more oppressed and when powerful hostile armies were plunging through her bosom the federal prisoners of andersonville suffered incredibly during the hasty removal to millen savannah charleston and other points supposed at the time to be secure from the enemy each one of these causes must be weighed when an attempt is made to estimate the unusual mortality among these prisoners of war seven scurvy arising from sameness of food and imperfect nutrition caused either directly or indirectly nine-tenths of the deaths among the federal prisoners at andersonville not only were the deaths referred to unknown causes to apoplexy to anaskaka and to debility traceable to scurvy and its effects and not only was the mortality in smallpox pneumonia and typhoid fever and in all acute diseases more than doubled by the scorbutic taint but even those all but universal and deadly bowel affections arose from the same causes and derived their fatal character from the same conditions which produced the scurvy 
in truth these men at andersonville were in the condition of a crew at sea confined in a foul ship upon salt meat and unvarying food and without fresh vegetables not only so but these unfortunate prisoners were men forcibly confined and crowded upon a ship tossed about on a stormy ocean without a rudder without a compass without a guiding star and without any apparent boundary or to their voyage and they reflected in their steadily increasing miseries the distressed condition and waning fortunes of devastated and bleeding country which was compelled in justice to her own unfortunate sons to hold these men in the most distressing captivity i saw nothing in the scurvy which prevails so universally at andersonville at all different from this disease as described by various standard writers the mortality was no greater than that which has afflicted a hundred ships upon long voyages and it did not exceed the mortality which has upon me that one occasion and in a much shorter period of time annihilated large armies and desolated beleaguered cities the general results of my investigations upon the chronic diarrhoea and dysentery of the federal prisoners of andersonville were similar to those of the english surgeons during the war against russia nine drugs exercised but little influence over the progress and fatal termination of chronic diarrhoea and dysentery in the military prison and hospital at andersonville cheerfully because the proper form of nourishment milk rice vegetables antiscorbutics and nourishing animal and vegetable soups was not issued and could not be procured in sufficient quantities for the sick prisoners opium allayed pain and checked the bowels temporarily but the frail dam was soon swept away and the patient appears to be but little better if not the worse for this merely palliative treatment the root of the difficulty could not be reached by drugs nothing short of the wanting elements of nutrition would have tended in any manner to restore the tone of the digestive system and of all the wasted and degenerated organs and tissues my opinion to this effect was expressed most decidedly to the medical officers in charge of these unfortunate men the correctness of this view was sustained by the healthy and robust condition of the paroled up prisoners who received an extra ration and who were able to make considerable sums by trading and who supplied themselves with a liberal and varied diet ten the fact that hospital gangrene appeared in the stockade first and originated spontaneously without any previous contagion and occurred sporadically all over the stockade and prison hospital was proof positive that this disease will arise whenever the conditions of crowding filth foul air and bad diet are present the exhalations from the hospital and stockade appeared to exert their effects to a considerable distance outside of these localities the origin of gangrene among these prisoners appeared clearly to depend in great measure upon the state of the general system induced by diet exposure neglect of personal cleanliness and by various external noxious influences the rapidity of the appearance and action of the gangrene depended upon the powers and state of the constitution as well as upon the intensity of the poison in the atmosphere or upon the direct application of poisonous matter to the wounded surface this was further illustrated by the important fact that hospital gangrene or a disease resembling this form of gangrene attacked the intestinal canal of patients laboring under ulceration of the bowels although there were no local manifestations of gangrene upon the surface of the body Body. this mode of termination in cases of dysentery was quite common in the foul atmosphere of the confederate states military prison hospital and in the depressed depraved condition of the system of these federal prisoners death ensued very rapidly after the gangrenous state of the intestines was established eleven the scorbutic condition of the system appeared to favor the origin of foul ulcers which frequently took on true hospital gangrene scurvy and gangrene frequently exist in the same individual in such cases vegetable diet with vegetable acids would remove the scorbutic condition without curing the hospital gangrene scurvy consists not only in an alteration in the constitution of the blood which leads to passive hemorrhage from the bowels and the effusion into the various tissues of a deeply coloured fibrinous exudation but as we have conclusively shown by post-mortem examination this state is attended with consistence of the muscles of the heart and the mucous membrane of the alimentary canal and of solid parts generally we have according to the extent of the deficiency of certain articles of food every degree of scorbutic derangement from the most fearful deprivation of the blood and the perversion of every function subserved by the blood to those slight derangements which are scarcely distinguishable from a state of health 
we are as yet ignorant of the true nature of the changes of the blood and tissues in scurvy and wide field for investigation is open for the determination the characteristic changes physical chemical and physiological of the blood and tissues and of the secretions and excretions of scurvy such inquiries would be of great value in their bearing upon the origin of hospital gangrene up to the present war the results of chemical investigations upon the pathology of the blood and scurvy were not only contradictory but meagre and wanting in that careful detail of the cases from which the blood was abstracted which would enable us to explain the cause of the apparent discrepancies in different analyses thus it is not yet settled whether the fibrin is increased or diminished in this disease and the differences which exist in the statements of different writers appear to be referable to the neglect of a critical examination and record of all the symptoms of the cases from which the blood was abstracted the true nature of the changes of the blood and scurvy can be established only by numerous analyses during different stages of the disease and followed up by carefully performed and recorded post-mortem examinations with such data we could settle such important questions as to whether the increase of fibrin in scurvy was invariably dependent upon some local inflammation twelve gangrenous spots followed by rapid destruction of tissue appeared in some cases in which there had been no previous or existing wound or abrasion and without such well-established facts it might be assumed that the disease was propagated from one patient to another in every case either by exhalations from the gangrenous surface or by direct contact in such a filthy and crowded hospital as that of the confederate states military prison of camp sumter andersonville it was impossible to isolate the wounded from the sources of actual contact of the gangrenous matter the flies swarming over the wounds and over filth of every description the filthy and perfectly washed and scanty rags the limited number of sponges and wash bowls the same wash bowl and sponge serving for a score or more of patients were one and all sources of such constant circulation of the gangrenous matter that the disease might rapidly be propagated from a single gangrenous wound while the fact already considered that a form of moist gangrene resembling hospital gangrene was quite common in this foul atmosphere in cases of dysentery both with and without the existence of hospital gangrene upon the surface demonstrates the dependence of the disease upon the state of the constitution and proves in a clear manner that neither the contact of the poisonous matter of gangrene nor the direct action of the poison atmosphere upon the ulcerated surface is necessary to the development of the disease on the other hand it is equally well established that the disease may be communicated by the various ways just mentioned it is impossible to determine the length of time which rags and clothing saturated with gangrenous matter will retain the power of reproducing the disease when applied to healthy wounds professor brugmans as quoted by guthrie in his commentaries on the surgery of the war in portugal spain france and the netherlands says that in seventeen ninety seven in holland charpy composed of linen threads cut of different lengths which on inquiry it was found had been already used in the great hospitals in france and had been subsequently washed and bleached caused every ulcer to which it was applied to be affected by hospital gangrene guthrie affirms in the same work that the fact that this disease was readily communicated by the application of instruments lint or bandages which had been in contact with infected parts was too firmly established by the experience of every one in portugal and spain to be a matter of doubt there are facts to show that flies may be the means of communicating malignant pustules dr wagner who has related several cases of malignant pustule produced in man and beast both by contact and by eating the flesh of diseased animals which happened in the village of striessa in saxony in eighteen thirty four gives two very remarkable cases which occurred eight days after any beast had been affected with the disease both were women one of twenty-six and the other of fifty years and in them the pustules were well marked and the general symptoms similar to the other cases the latter patient said she had been bitten by a fly upon the back of the neck at which part the carbuncle appeared and the former that she had also been bitten upon the right upper arm by a gnat upon inquiry wagner found that the skin of one of the infected beasts had been hung on a neighbouring wall and thought it very possible that the insects might have been attracted to them by the smell and had thence conveyed the poison end of dr stevens's statement the old adage says that hunger is the best sauce for poor food but hunger failed to render this detestable stuff palatable and it became so loathsome that very many actually starved to death because unable to force their organs of deglutition to receive the nauseous dose and pass it to the stomach 
i was always much healthier than the average of the boys and my appetite consequently much better yet for the last month that i was in andersonville it required all my determination to crowd the bread down my throat and as i have stated before i could only do this by breaking off small bits at a time and forcing each one down as i would a pill a large part of this repulsiveness was due to the coarseness and foulness of the meal the wretched cooking and the lack of salt but there was a still more potent reason than all these nature does not intend that man shall live by bread alone nor by any one kind of food she indicates this by the varying tastes and longings that she gives him if his body needs one kind of constituents his tastes lead him to desire the food that is richest in those constituents when he has taken as much as his system requires the sense of satiety supervenes and he becomes tired of that particular food if tastes are not perverted but allowed a free but temperate exercise they are the surest indicators of the way to preserve health and strength by a judicious selection of alimentation in this case nature was protesting by a rebellion of the taste against any further use of that species of food she was saying as plainly as she ever spoke that death could only be averted by a change of diet which would supply our bodies with the constituents they so sadly needed and which could not be supplied by corn-meal how needless was this confinement of our rations to corn-meal and especially to such wretchedly prepared meal is conclusively shown by the rebel testimony heretofore given it would have been very little extra trouble to the rebels to have had our meal sifted we would gladly have done it ourselves if allowed the utensils an opportunity it would have been as little trouble to have varied our rations with green corn and sweet potatoes of which the country was then full a few wagon loads of roasting ears and sweet potatoes would have banished every trace of scurvy from the camp healed up the wasting dysentery and saved thousands of lives any day that the rebels had chosen they could have gotten a thousand volunteers who would have given their solemn parole not to escape and gone any distance into the country to gather the potatoes and corn and such other vegetables as were readily obtainable and bring them into the camp whatever else may be said in defence of the southern management of military prisons the permitting seven thousand men to die of the scurvy in the summer time in the midst of an agricultural region filled with all manner of green vegetation must forever remain impossible of explanation end of chapter fifty chapter fifty one of andersonville a story of rebel military prisons by john mcelroy this librivox recording is in the public domain solicitude as to the fate of atlanta and sherman's army paucity of news how we heard that atlanta had fallen announcement of a general exchange we leave andersonville we again began to be exceedingly solicitous over the fate of atlanta and sherman's army we had heard but little directly from that front for several weeks few prisoners had come in since those captured in the bloody engagements of the twentieth twenty second and twenty eighth of july in spite of their confident tones and our own sanguine hopes the outlook admitted of very grave doubts the battles of the last week of july had been looked at it in the best light possible indecisive our men had held their own it is true but an invading army cannot afford to simply hold its own anything short of an absolute success is to it disguised defeat then we knew that the cavalry column sent out under stoneman had been so badly handled by that inefficient commander that it had failed ridiculously in its object being beaten in detail and suffering the loss of its commander and a considerable portion of its numbers this had been followed by a defeat of our infantry at etowa creek and then came a long interval in which we received no news save what the rebel papers contained and they pretended no doubt that sherman's failure was already demonstrated next came well authenticated news that sherman had raised the siege and fallen back to the chattahoochee and we felt something of the bitterness of despair for days thereafter we heard nothing though the hot close summer air seemed surcharged with the premonitions of a war storm about to burst even as nature heralds in the same way a concentration of the mighty force of the elements for the grand crash of the thunderstorm 
we waited in tense expectancy for the decision of the fates whether final victory or defeat should end the long and arduous campaign at night the guards in the perches around the stockade called out every half hour so as to show the officers that they were awake and attending to their duty the formula for this ran thus post number one half past eight o'clock and all's well post number two repeated this cry and so it went around one evening when our anxiety as to atlanta was wrought to the highest pitch one of the guards sang out post number four half past eight o'clock and atlanta's gone to hell the heart of every man within hearing leaped to his mouth we looked toward each other almost speechless with glad surprise and then gasped out did you hear that the next instant such a ringing cheer burst out as wells spontaneously from the throats and hearts of men in the first ecstatic moments of victory a cheer to which our saddened hearts and enfeebled lungs had long been strangers it was the genuine honest manly northern cheer as different from the shrill rebel yell as the honest mastiff's deep-voiced welcome is from the howl of the prowling wolf the shout was taken up all over the prison even those who had not heard the guard understood that it meant that atlanta was ours and fairly won and they took up the acclamation with as much enthusiasm as we had begun it all thoughts of sleep were put to flight we would have a season of rejoicing little knots gathered together debated the news and indulged in the most sanguine hopes as to the effect upon the rebels in some parts of the stockade stump speeches were made i believe that boston corbett and his party organized a prayer and praise meeting in our corner we stirred up our tuneful friend nosy who sang again the grand old patriotic hymns that set our thin blood to bounding and made us remember that we were still union soldiers with higher hopes than that of starving and dying in andersonville he sang the ever-glorious star-spangled banner as he used to sing it around the camp-fire in happier days when we were in the field he sang the rousing rally round the flag with its wealth of patriotic fire and martial vigor and we with throats hoarse from shouting joined in the chorus until the welkin rang again the rebels became excited lest our exaltation of spirits would lead to an assault upon the stockade they got under arms and remained so until the enthusiasm became less demonstrative a few days later on the evening of the sixth of september the rebel sergeants who called the roll entered the stockade and each assembling his squads addressed them as follows prisoners i am instructed by general winder to inform you that a general exchange has been agreed upon twenty thousand men will be exchanged immediately at savannah where your vessels are now waiting for you detachments from one to ten will prepare to leave early to-morrow morning the excitement that this news produced was simply indescribable i have seen men in every possible exigency that can confront men and a large proportion view that which impended over them with at least outward composure the boys around me had endured all that we suffered with stoical firmness groans from pain-racked bodies could not be repressed and bitter curses and maledictions against the rebels leaped unbidden to the lips at the slightest occasion but there was no murmuring or whining there was not a day hardly an hour in which one did not see such exhibitions of manly fortitude as made him proud of belonging to a race of which every individual was a hero but the emotion which pain and suffering and danger could not develop joy could and boys sang and shouted and cried and danced as if in a delirium god's country fairer than the sweet promised land of canaan appeared to the rapt vision of the hebrew poet prophet spread out in glad vista before the mind's eye of every one it had come at last it had come that which we had so longed for wished for prayed for dreamed of schemed planned toiled for and for which went up the last earnest dying wish of the thousands of our comrades who would now know no exchange save into that eternal god's country where sickness and sorrow pain and death are felt and feared no more our preparations for leaving were few and simple when the morning came and shortly after the order to remove anders and i picked our well-worn blanket our tattered overcoat our rude chessmen and no less rude board our little black hen and the spoon made of hoop iron and bade farewell to the hole in the ground that had been our home for nearly seven long months 
my feet were still in miserable condition from the lacerations received in the attempt to escape but i took one of our tent poles as a staff and hobbled away we repassed the gates which we had entered on that february night ages since i seemed and crawled slowly over to the depot i had come to regard the rebels around us as such measureless liars that my first impulse was to believe the reverse of anything they said to us and even now while i hoped for the best my old habit of mind was so strongly upon me that i had some doubts of our going to be exchanged simply because it was a rebel who had said so but in the crowd of rebels who stood close to the road upon which we were walking was a young second lieutenant who said to a colonel as i passed well those fellows can sing homeward bound can't they this set my last misgiving at rest now i was certain that we were going to be exchanged and my spirit soared to the skies entering the cars we thumped and pounded toilsomely along after the manner of southern railroads and at the rate of six or eight miles an hour savannah was two hundred and forty miles away and to our impatient minds it seemed as if we would never get there the route lay the whole distance through the cheerless pine barrens which cover the greater part of georgia the only considerable town on the way was macon which had then a population of five thousand or thereabouts for scores of miles there would not be a sign of a human habitation and in the one hundred and eighty miles between macon and savannah there were only three insignificant villages there was a station every ten miles at which the only building was an open shed to shelter from sun and rain a casual passenger or a bit of goods the occasional specimens of the poor white cracker population that we saw seemed indigenous products of the starved soil they suited their poverty-stricken surroundings as well as the gnarled and scrubby vegetation suited the sterile sand thin-chested round shoulders scraggy bearded dull-eyed and open-mouthed they all looked alike all looked as ignorant and stupid and as lazy as they were poor and weak they were low-downers in every respect and made our rough and simple-minded east tennesseans look like models of elegant and cultured gentlemen in contrast we looked on the poverty-stricken land with a good-natured contempt for we thought we were leaving it forever and would soon be in one which compared to it was as the fatness at egypt to the leanness of the desert of sinai the second day after leaving andersonville our train struggled across the swamps into savannah and rolled slowly down the live oak shaded streets into the centre of the city it seemed like another deserted village so vacant and noiseless the streets and the buildings everywhere so overgrown with luxuriant vegetation the limbs of the shade trees crashed along and broke upon the tops of our cars as if no train had passed that way for years through the interstices between the trees and clumps of foliage could be seen the gleaming white mar marble of the monuments erected to green and pulaski looking like giant tombstones in a city of the dead the unbroken stillness so different from what we expected on entering the metropolis of georgia and a city that was an important port in revolutionary days became absolutely oppressive we could not understand it but our thoughts were more intent upon the coming transfer to our flag than upon any speculation as to the cause of the remarkable somnolence of savannah finally some little boys straggled out to where our car was standing and we opened up a conversation with them say boys are our vessels down in the harbour yet the reply came in that piercing treble shriek in which a boy of ten or twelve makes even his most confidential communications i don't know well with our confidence in exchange somewhat dashed they intend to exchange us here don't they another falsetto scream i don't know well with something of a quaver in the questioner's voice what are they going to do with us anyway oh the treble shriek became almost demoniac they are fixing up a place over by the old jail for you what a sinking of hearts was there then andrews and i would not give up hope so speedily as some others did and resolved to believe for a while at least that we were going to be exchanged ordered out of the cars we were marched along the street a crowd of small boys full of the curiosity of the animal gathered around us as we marched suddenly a door in a rather nice house opened an angry-faced woman appeared on the steps and shouted out boys boys what are you doing there come up on the steps immediately come away from them nasty things i will admit that we were not prepossessing in appearance nor were we as cleanly as young gentlemen should habitually be in fact i may as well confess that i would not now if i could help it allow a tramp as dilapidated in raiment as unwashed unshorn uncombed and populous with insects as we were to come within several rods of me
nevertheless it was not pleasant to hear so accurate a description of our personal appearance sent forth on the wings of the wind by a shrill-voiced rebel female a short march brought us to the place they were fixing for us by the old jail it was another pen with high walls of thick pine plank which told us only too plainly how vain were our expectations of exchange when we were turned inside and i realized that the gates of another prison had closed upon me hope forsook me i flung our odious little possessions our can chessboard overcoat and blanket upon the ground and sitting down beside them gave way to the bitterest despair i wanted to die oh so badly never in all my life had i desired anything in the world so much as i did now to get out of it had i had pistol knife rope or poison i would have entered my prison life then and there and departed with the unceremoniousness of a french leave i remembered that i could get a quietus from a guard with very little trouble but i would not give one of the bitterly hated rebels the triumph of shooting me i longed to be another samson with the whole southern confederacy gathered in another temple of dagon that i might pull down the supporting pillars and die happy in slaying thousands of my enemies while i was thus sinking deeper and deeper in the slough of despond the firing of a musket and the shriek of the man who was struck attracted my attention looking towards the opposite end of the pen i saw a guard bringing his still smoking musket to a recover arms and not fifteen feet from him a prisoner lying on the ground in the agonies of death the latter had a pipe in his mouth when he was shot and his teeth still clenched its stem his legs and arms were drawn up convulsively and he was rocking backward and forward on his back the charge had struck him just above the hip bone the rebel officer in command of the guard was sitting on his horse inside the pen at the time and rode forward to see what the matter was lieutenant davis who had come with us from andersonville was also sitting on a horse inside the prison and he called out in his usual harsh disagreeable voice that's all right colonel the man's done just as i awed him to i found that lying around inside were a number of bits of plank each about five feet long which had been sawed off by the carpenters engaged in building the prison the ground being a bare common was destitute of all shelter and the pieces looked as if they would be quite useful in building a tent there may have been an order issued forbidding the prisoners to touch them but if so i had not heard it and i imagine the first intimation of the prisoner just killed that the boards were not to be taken was the bullet which penetrated his vitals twenty-five cents would be a liberal appraisement of the value of the lumber for which the boy lost his life half an hour afterward we thought we saw all the guards march out of the front gate there was still another pile of these same kind of pieces of board lying at the further side of the prison the crowd around me noticed it and we all made a rush for it in spite of my lame feet i outstripped the rest and was just in the act of stooping down to pick the boards up when a loud yell from those behind startled me glancing to my left i saw a guard cocking his gun and bringing it up to shoot me with one frightened spring as quick as a flash and before he could cover me i landed fully a rod back in the crowd and mixed with it the fellow tried hard to draw a beat on me but i was too quick for him and he finally lowered his gun with an oath expressive of disappointment in not being able to kill a yankee walking back to my place the full ludicrousness of the thing dawned upon me so forcibly that i forgot all about my excitement and scare and laughed aloud here not an hour age i was murmuring because i could find no way to die i sighed for death as a bridegroom for the coming of his bride and yet when a rebel had pointed his gun at me it had nearly scared me out of a year's growth and made me jump farther than i could possibly do when my feet were well and i was in good condition otherwise End of chapter 51chapter fifty two of andersonville a story of rebel military prisons by john mcelroy this librivox recording is in the public domain savannah devices to obtain materials for a tent their ultimate success resumption of tunneling escaping by wholesale and being recaptured en masse the obstacles that lay between us and our lines andrews and i did not let the fate of the boy who was killed nor my own narrow escape from losing the top of my head deter us from farther efforts to secure possession of those coveted boards
my readers remember the story of the boy who digging vigorously at a hole replied to the remark of a passing traveller that there was probably no groundhog there and even if there was groundhog was mighty poor eaten anyway with mister there's got to be a groundhog there our family's out o' meat that was what actuated us we were out of material for a tent our solitary blanket had rotted and worn full of holes by its long double duty as bedclothes and tent at andersonville and there was an imperative call for a substitute andrews and i flattered ourselves that when we matched our collective or individual wits against those of a johnny his defeat was pretty certain and with this cheerful estimate of our own powers to animate us we set to work to steal the boards from under the guard's nose the johnny had malice in his heart and buck and ball in his musket but his eyes were not sufficiently numerous to adequately discharge all the duties laid upon him he had too many different things to watch at the same time i would approach a gap in the fence not yet closed as if i intended making a dash through it for liberty and when the johnny had concentrated all his attention on letting me have the contents of his gun just as soon as he could have a reasonable excuse for doing so andrews would pick up a couple of boards and slip away with them then i would fall back in pretended and some real alarm and andrew would come up and draw his attention by a similar feint while i made off with a couple of more pieces after a few hours of this strategy we found ourselves the possessors of some dozen planks with which we made a lean-to that formed a tolerable shelter for our heads and the upper portion of our bodies as the boards were not over five feet long and the slope reduced the sheltered space to about four and one half feet it left the lower part of our naked feet and legs to project out of doors andrews used to lament very touchingly the sunburning his toenails were receiving he knew that his complexion was being ruined for life and all the balm of a thousand flowers in the world would not restore his comely ankles to that condition of pristine loveliness which would admit of their introduction into good society again another defect was that like the fun in a practical joke it was all on one side there was not enough of it to go clear around it was very unpleasant when a storm came up in a direction different from that we had calculated upon to be compelled to get out in the midst of it and build our house over to face the other way still we had a tent and were that much better off than three-fourths of our comrades who had no shelter at all we were owners of a brownstone front on fifth avenue compared to the other fellows our tent erected we began a general survey of our new abiding place the ground was a sandy common in the outskirts of savannah the sand was covered with a light sod the rebels who knew nothing of our burrowing propensities had neglected to make the plank forming the walls of the prison project any distance below the surface of the ground and had put up no dead line around the inside so that it looked as if everything was arranged expressly to invite us to tunnel out we were not the boys to neglect such an invitation by night about three thousand had been received from andersonville and placed inside when morning came it looked as if a colony of gigantic rats had been at work there was a tunnel every ten or fifteen feet and at least twelve hundred of us had gone out through them during the night i never understood why all in the pen did not follow our example and leave the guards watching a forsaken prison there was nothing to prevent it an hour's industrious work with a half canteen would take any one outside or if a boy was too lazy to dig his own tunnel he could have the use of one of the hundred others that had been dug but escaping was only begun when the stockade was passed the site of savannah is virtually an island on the north is the savannah river to the east southeast and south are the two okichi rivers and a chain of sounds and lagoons connecting with the atlantic ocean to the west is a canal connecting the savannah and big ogichi rivers we found ourselves headed off by water whichever way we went all the bridges were guarded and all the boats destroyed early in the morning rebels discovered our absence and the whole garrison of savannah was sent out on patrol after us they picked up the boys in squads of from ten to thirty lurking around the shores of the streams waiting for night to come to get across or engaged in building rafts for transportation by evening the whole mob of us were back in the pen again 
as nobody was punished for running away we treated the whole affair as a lark and those brought back first stood around the gate and yelled derisively as the others came in that night big fires were built all around the stockade and a line of guards placed on the ground inside of these in spite of this precaution quite a number escaped the next day a deadline was put up inside the prison twenty feet from the stockade this only increased the labor of burrowing by making us go farther instead of being able to tunnel out in an hour it now took three or four hours that night several hundred of us rested from our previous performance and hopeful of better luck brought our faithful half canteens now scoured very bright by constant use into requisition again and before the morning dawned we had gained the high reeds of the swamps where we lay concealed until night in this way we managed to evade the recapture that came to most of those who went out but it was a fearful experience having been raised in a country where venomous snakes abounded i had that fear and horror of them that inhabitants of those districts feel and of which people living in sections free from such a scourge know little i fancied that the southern swamps were filled with all forms of loathsome and poisonous reptiles and it required all my courage to venture into them barefooted besides the snags and roots hurt our feet fearfully our hope was to find a boat somewhere in which we could float out to sea and trust to being picked up by some of the blockading fleet but no boat could we find with all our painful and diligent search we learned afterward that the rebels made a practice of breaking up all the boats along the shore to prevent negroes and their own deserters from escaping to the blockading fleet we thought of making a raft of logs but had we had the strength to do this we would doubtless have thought it too risky since we dreaded missing the vessels and being carried out to sea to perish of hunger during the night we came to the railroad bridge across the ojikchi we had some slender hope that if we could reach this we might perhaps get across the river and find better opportunities for escape but these last expectations were blasted by the discovery that it was guarded there was a post and a fire on the shore next us and a single guard with a lantern was stationed on one of the middle spans almost famished with hunger and so weary and footsore that we could scarcely move another step we went back to a cleared place on the high ground and lay down to sleep entirely reckless as to what became of us late in the morning we were awakened by the rebel patrol and taken back to the prison lieutenant davis disgusted with the perpetual attempts to escape moved the dead line out forty feet from the stockade but this restricted our room greatly since the number of prisoners in the pen had now risen to about six thousand and besides it offered little additional protection against tunneling it was not much more difficult to dig fifty feet at then it had been to dig thirty feet davis soon realized this and put the deadline back to twenty feet his next device was a much more sensible one a crowd of one hundred and fifty negroes dug a trench twenty feet wide and five feet deep around the whole prison on the outside and this ditch was filled with water from the city waterworks no one could cross this without attracting the attention of the guards still we were not discouraged and andrews and i joined a crowd that was constructing a large tunnel from near our quarters on the east side of the pen we finished the burrow to within a few inches of the edge of the ditch and then ceased operations to await some stormy night when we could hope to get across the ditch unnoticed orders were issued to guards to fire without warning on men who were observed to be digging or carrying out dirt after nightfall they occasionally did so but the risk did not keep any one from tunnelling our tunnel ran directly under a sentry-box when carrying dirt away the bearer of the bucket had to turn his back on the guard and walk directly down the street in front of him two hundred or three hundred feet to the centre of the camp where he scattered the sand around so as to give no indication of where it came from though we always waited till the moon went down it seemed as if unless the guard were a fool both by nature and training he could not help taking notice of what was going on under his eyes i do not recall any more nervous promenades in my life than those when taking my turn i received my bucket of sand at the mouth of the tunnel and walked slowly away with it the most disagreeable part was in turning my back to the guard could i have faced him i had sufficient confidence in my quickness or of perception and talents as a dodger to imagine that i could make it difficult for him to hit me but in walling with my back to him i was wholly at his mercy fortune however favoured us and we were allowed to go on with our work night after night without a shot in the meanwhile another happy thought slowly gestated in davis's alleged intellect 
how he came to give birth to two ideas with no more than a week between them puzzled all who knew him and still more that he survived this extraordinary strain upon the grey matter of the cerebrum his new idea was to have driven a heavily laden mule cart around the inside of the deadline at least once a day the wheels or the mule's feet broke through the thin sod covering the tunnels and exposed them our tunnel went with the rest and those of our crowd who wore shoes had humiliation added to sorrow by being compelled to go in and spade the hole full of dirt this put an end to subterranean engineering one day one of the boys watched his opportunity got under the ration wagon and clinging close to the coupling pole with hands and feet was carried outside he was detected however as he came from under the wagon and brought back End of chapter 52chapter 53 of Andersonville a story of rebel military prisons by John McElroy this librivox recording is in the public domain frank riverstock's attempt at escape passing off as rebel boy he reaches griswoldville by rail and then strikes across the country for sherman but is caught within twenty miles of our lines one of the shrewdest and nearest successful attempts to escape that came under my notice was that of my friend sergeant frank riverstock of the third west virginia cavalry of whom i have before spoken frank who was quite small with a smooth boyish face had converted to his own use a citizen's coat belonging to a young boy a sutler's assistant who had died in andersonville he had made himself a pair of bag pantaloons and a shirt from pieces of meal sacks which he had appropriated from day to day he had also the sutler's assistant's shoes and to crown all he wore on his head one of those hideous-looking hats of quilted calico which the rebels had taken to wearing in the lack of felt hats which they could neither make nor buy altogether frank looked enough like a rebel to be dangerous to trust near a country store or a stable full of horses when we first arrived in the prison quite a crowd of the savannarians rushed in to inspect us the guards had some difficulty in keeping them and us separate while perplexed with this annoyance one of them saw frank standing in our crowd and touching him with his bayonet said with some sharpness see ya yeah, you must stand back you mustn't crowd on them prisoners so frank stood back he did it promptly but calmly and then as if his curiosity as to yankees was fully satisfied he walked slowly away up the street deliberating as he went on a plan for getting out of the city he hit upon an excellent one going to the engineer of a freight train making ready to start back to macon he told him that his father was working in the confederate machine shops at griswoldville near macon that he himself was also one of the machinists employed there and desired to go thither but lacked the necessary means to pay his passage if the engineer would let him ride up on the engine he would do work enough to pay the fare frank told the story ingeniously the engineer and fireman were won over and gave their consent no more zealous assistant ever climbed upon a tender than frank proved to be he loaded wood with a nervous industry that stood him in place of great strength he kept the tender in perfect order and anticipated as far as possible every want of the engineer and his assistant they were delighted with him and treated him with the greatest kindness dividing their food with him and insisting that he should share their bed when they laid by for the night frank would have gladly declined this latter kindness with thanks as he was conscious that the quantity of graybacks his clothing contained did not make him a very desirable sleeping companion for any one but his friends were so pressing that he was compelled to accede his greatest trouble was a fear of recognition by some one of the prisoners that were continually passing by the train load on their way from andersonville to other prisons he was one of the best known of the prisoners in andersonville bright active always cheerful and forever in motion during waking hours every one in the prison speedily became familiar with him and all addressed him as sergeant frankie if any one on the passing trains had caught a glimpse of him that glimpse would have been followed almost inevitably with a shout of hello sergeant frankie what are you doing there 
then the whole game would have been up frank escaped this by persistent watchfulness and by busying himself on the opposite side of the engine with his back turned to the other trains at last when nearing griswoldville frank pointing to a large white house at some distance across the fields said now right over there is where my uncle lives and i believe i'll just run over and see him and then walk into griswoldville he thanked his friends fervently for their kindness promised to call and see them frequently bade them good-bye and jumped off the train he walked towards the white house as long as he thought he could be seen and then entered a large cornfield and concealed himself in a thicket in the centre of it until dark when he made his way to the neighbouring woods and began journeying northward as fast as his legs could carry him when morning broke he had made good progress but was terribly tired it was not prudent to travel by daylight so he gathered himself some ears of corn and some berries of which he made his breakfast and finding a suitable thicket he crawled into it fell asleep and did not wake up until late in the afternoon after another meal of raw corn and berries he resumed his journey and that night made still better progress he repeated this for several days and nights lying in the woods in the daytime travelling by night through woods fields and by-paths avoiding all the fords bridges and main roads and living on what he could glean from the fields that he might not take even so much risk as was involved in going to the negro cabins for food but there are always flaws in every man's armour of caution even in so perfect one as frank's his complete success so far at the natural effect of inducing a growing carelessness which wrought his ruin one evening he started off briskly after a refreshing rest and sleep he knew that he must be very near sherman's lines and hope cheered him up with the belief that his freedom would soon be won descending from the hill in whose dense brushwood he had made his bed all day he entered a large field full of standing corn and made his way between the rows until he reached on the other side the fence that separated it from the main road across which was another cornfield that frank intended entering but he neglected his usual precautions on approaching a road and instead of coming up cautiously and carefully reconnoitring in all directions before he left cover he sprang boldly over the fence and strode out for the other side as he reached the middle of the road his ears were assailed with the sharp click of a musket being cocked and the harsh command halt halt dare i say turning with a start to his left he saw not ten feet from him a mounted patrol the sound of whose approach had been masked by the deep dust of the road into which his horse's hoofs sank noiselessly frank of course yielded without a word and when sent to the officer in command he told the old story about his being an employee of the griswold ville shops off on a leave of absence to make a visit to sick relatives but unfortunately his captors belonged to that section themselves and speedily caught him in a maze of cross-questioning from which he could not extricate himself it also became apparent from his language that he was a yankee and it was not far from this to the conclusion that he was a spy a conclusion to which the proximity of sherman's lines then less than twenty miles distant greatly assisted by the next morning this belief had become so firmly fixed in the minds of the rebels that frank saw a halter dangling alarmingly near and he concluded the wisest plan was to confess who he really was it was not the smallest of his griefs to realize by how slight a chance he had failed had he looked down the road before he climbed the fence or had he been ten minutes earlier or later the patrol would not have been there he could have gained the next field unperceived and two more nights of successful progress would have taken him into sherman's lines at sand mountain the patrol which caught him was on the lookout for deserters and shirking conscripts who had become unusually numerous since the fall of atlanta he was sent back to us at savannah as he came into the prison gate lieutenant davis was standing near he looked sternly at frank and his rebel garments and muttering by god i'll stop this caught the coat by the tails tore it to the collar and took it and his hat away from frank there was a strange sequel to this episode a few weeks afterward a special exchange for ten thousand was made and frank succeeded in being included in this he was given the usual furlough from the paroled camp at annapolis and went to his home in a little town near mansfield ohio one day while on the cars going i think to newark 
ohio he saw lieutenant davis on the train in citizen's clothes he had been sent by the rebel government to canada with dispatches relating to some of the raids then harassing our northern borders davis was the last man in the world to successfully disguise himself he had a large coarse mouth that made him remembered by all who had ever seen him frank recognized him instantly and said you are lieutenant davis davis replied you are totally mistaken sir i am somebody else frank insisted that he was right davis fumed and blustered but though frank was small he was as game as a bantam rooster and he gave davis to understand that there had been a vast change in their relative positions that the one while still the same insolent swaggerer had not regiments of infantry or batteries of artillery to emphasize his insolence and the other was no longer embarrassed in the discussion by the immense odds in favor of his jailer opponent after a stormy scene frank called in the assistance of some other soldiers in the car arrested davis and took him to camp chase near columbus ohio where he was fully identified by a number of paroled prisoners he was searched and documents showing the nature of his mission beyond a doubt were found upon his person a court-martial was immediately convened for his trial this found him guilty and sentenced him to be hanged as a spy at the conclusion of the trial frank stepped up to the prisoner and said mr davis i believe we're even on that coat now davis was sent to johnson's island for execution but influences were immediately set at work to secure executive clemency what they were i know not but i am informed by the rev robert mccune who was then chaplain of the one hundred and twenty eighth ohio infantry and the post of johnson's island and who was spiritual adviser appointed to prepare davis for execution that the sentence was hardly pronounced before davis was visited by an emissary who told him to dismiss his fears that he should not suffer the punishment it is likely that leading baltimore unionists were enlisted in his behalf through family connections and as the border state unionists were then potent at washington they readily secured a commutation of his sentence to imprisonment during the war it seems that the justice of this world is very unevenly dispensed when so much solicitude is shown for the life of such a man and not at all for the much better men whom he assisted to destroy the official notice of the commutation of the sentence was not published until the day set for the execution but the certain knowledge that it would be forthcoming enabled davis to display a great deal of bravado on approaching what was supposed to be his end as the reader can readily imagine from what i have heretofore said of him davis was the man to improve to the utmost every opportunity to strut his little hour and he did it in this instance he posed attitudinized and vapored so that the camp and the country were filled with stories of the wonderful coolness with which he contemplated his approaching fate among other things he said to his guard as he washed himself elaborately the night before the day announced for the execution where you can be sure of one thing to-morrow night there will certainly be one clean corpse on this island unfortunately for his braggadocio he let it leak out in some way that he had been well aware all the time that he would not be executed he was taken to fort delaware for confinement and died there some time after frank beaver's stock went back to his regiment and served with it until the close of the war he then returned home and after a while became a banker at bowling green ohio he was a fine business man and became very prosperous but though naturally healthy and vigorous his system carried in it the seeds of death sown there by the hardships of captivity he had been one of the victims of the rebels vaccination the virus injected into his blood had caused a large part of his right temple to slough off and when it healed it left a ghastly cicatrix two years ago he was taken suddenly ill and died before his friends had any idea that his condition was serious End of chapter fifty three chapter fifty four of andersonville a story of rebel military prisons by john mcelroy this librivox recording is in the public domain savannah proves to be a change for the better escape from the brats of guards comparison between wirtz and davis a brief interval of good rations winder the man with the evil eye the disloyal work of a shyster after all savannah was a wonderful improvement on andersonville we got away from the pestilential swamp and that poisonous ground 
every mouthful of air was not laden with disease germs nor every cup of water polluted with the seeds of death the earth did not breed gangrene nor the atmosphere promote fever as only the more vigorous had come away we were freed from the depressing spectacle of every third man dying the keen disappointment prostrated very many who had been of average health and i imagine several hundred died but there were hospital arrangements of some kind and the sick were taken away from among us those of us who tunnelled out had an opportunity of stretching our legs which we had not had for months in the overcrowded stockade we had left the attempts to escape did all engaged in them good even though they failed since they aroused new ideas and hopes set the blood into more rapid circulation and toned up the mind and system both i had come away from andersonville with considerable scurvy manifesting itself in my gums and feet soon these signs almost wholly disappeared we also got away from those murderous little brats of reserves who guarded us at andersonville and shot men down as they would stone apples out of a tree our guards now were mostly sailors from the rebel fleet in the harbour irishmen englishmen and scandinavians as free-hearted and kindly as sailors always are i do not think they ever fired a shot at one of us the only trouble we had was with that portion of the guard drawn from the infantry of the garrison they had the same rattlesnake venom of the home guard crowd wherever we met it and shot us down at the least provocation fortunately they only formed a small part of the sentinels best of all we escaped for a while from the upas like shadow of winder and wirtz in whose presence strong men sickened and died as when near some malign genii of an eastern story the peasantry of italy believed firmly in the evil eye did they ever know any such men as winder and his satellite i could comprehend how much foundation they could have for such a belief lieutenant davis had many faults but there was no comparison between him and the andersonville commandant he was a typical young southern man ignorant and bumptious as to the most common matters of schoolboy knowledge inordinately vain of himself and his family coarse in tastes and thoughts violent in his prejudices but after all with some streaks of honour and generosity that made the widest possible difference between him and wirtz who never had any as one of my chums said to me wirtz is the most even-tempered man i ever knew he's always foaming mad this was nearly the truth i never saw wirtz when he was not angry if not violently abusive he was cynical and sardonic never in my little experience with him did i detect a glint of kindly generous humanity if he ever was moved by any sight of suffering its exhibition in his face escaped my eye if he ever had even a wish to mitigate the pain or hardship of any man the expression of such wish never fell on my ear how a man could move daily through such misery as he encountered and never be moved by it except to scorn and mocking is beyond my limited understanding davis vapoured a great deal swearing big round oaths in the broadest of southern patois he was perpetually threatening to open on ye wid ye artillery but the only death that i knew him to directly cause or sanction was that i have described in the previous chapter he would not put himself out of the way to annoy and oppress prisoners as wirtz would but frequently showed even a disposition to humour them in some little thing when it could be done without danger or trouble to himself by and by however he got an idea that there was some money to be made out of the prisoners and he set his wits to work in this direction one day standing at the gate he gave one of his peculiar yells that he used to attract the attention of the camp with why ya ye we all came to attention and he announced yesterday while i was in the camps a rebel always says camps some of you prisoners picked my pockets of seventy-five dollars in greenbacks and i give you notice that i'll not send any moa rations till the money's returned to me this was a very stupid method of extortion since no one believed that he had lost the money and at all events he had no business to have the greenbacks as the rebel laws impose severe penalties upon any citizen and still more upon any soldier dealing with or having in his possession any of the money of the enemy we did without rations until night when they were sent in there was a story that some of the boys in the prison had contributed to make a part of the sum and davis took it and was satisfied i do not know how true the story was 
at another time some of the boys stole the bridle and halter off an old horse that was driven in with a cart the things were worth at a liberal estimate one dollar davis cut off the rations of the whole six thousand of us for one day for this we always imagined that the proceeds went into his pocket a special exchange was arranged between our navy department and that of the rebels by which all seamen and marines among us were exchanged lists of these were sent to the different prisons and the men called for about three-fourths of them were dead but many soldiers divining the situation of affairs answered to the dead men's names went away with the squad and were exchanged much of this was through the connivance of the rebel officers who favoured those who had ingratiated themselves with them in many instances money was paid to secure this privilege and i have been informed on good authority that jack huckleby of the eighth tennessee and ira beverly of the one hundredth ohio who kept a big sutler shop on the north side of andersonville paid davis five hundred dollars each to be allowed to go with the sailors as for andrews and me we had no friends among the rebels nor money to bribe with so we stood no show the rations issued to us for some time after our arrival seemed riotous luxury to what we had been getting at andersonville each of us received daily a half dozen rude and coarse imitations of our fondly remembered hardtack and with these a small piece of meat or a few spoonfuls of molasses and a quart or so of vinegar and several plugs of tobacco for each hundred how exquisite was the taste of the crackers and molasses it was the first wheat bread i had eaten since my entry into richmond nine months before and molasses had been a stranger to me for years after the corn bread we had so long lived upon this was manna it seems that the commissary at savannah laboured under the delusion that he must issue to us the same rations as were served out to the rebel soldiers and sailors it was some little time before the fearful mistake came to the knowledge of winder i fancy that the news almost threw him into an apoplectic fit nothing save his being ordered to the front could have caused him such poignant sorrow as the information that so much good food had been worse than wasted in undoing his work by building up the bodies of his hated enemies without being told we knew that he had been heard from when the tobacco vinegar and molasses failed to come in and the crackers gave way to corn meal still this was a vast improvement on andersonville as the meal was fine and sweet and we each had a spoonful of salt issued to us regularly i am quite sure that i cannot make the reader who has not had an experience similar to ours comprehend the wonderful importance to us of that spoonful of salt whether or not the appetite for salt be as some scientists claim a purely artificial want one thing is certain and that is that either the habit of countless generations or some other cause has so deeply ingrained it into our common nature that it has come to be nearly as essential as food itself and no amount of deprivation can accustom us to its absence rather it seemed that the longer we did without it the more overpowering became our craving i could get along to-day and to-morrow perhaps the whole week without salt in my food since the lack would be supplied from the excess i had already swallowed but at the end of that time nature would begin to demand that i renew the supply of saline constituent of my tissues and she would become more clamorous with every day that i neglected her bidding and finally summoned nausea to aid longing the light artillery of the garrison of savannah four batteries twenty-four pieces were stationed around three sides of the prison the guns unlimbered planted at convenient distance and trained upon us ready for instant use we could see all the grinning mouths through the cracks in the fence there were enough of them to send us as high as the traditional kite flown by gilderoy the having at his back this array of frowning metal lent lieutenant davis such an importance in his own eyes that his demeanour swelled to the grandiose it became very amusing to see him puff up and vaunt over it as he did on every possible occasion for instance finding a crowd of several hundred lounging around the gate he would throw open the wicket stalk in with the air of a jove threatening a rebellious world with the dread thunders of heaven and shout why ye prisoners i give you just two minutes to clear away from this gate or i'll open on you wid de artillery 
one of the buglers of the artillery was a superb musician evidently some old regular whom the confederacy had seduced into its service and his instrument was so sweet-toned that we imagined it was made of silver the calls he played were nearly the same as we used in the cavalry and for the first few days we became bitterly homesick every time he sent ringing out the old familiar signals that to us were so closely associated with what now seemed the bright and happy days when we were in the field with our battalion if we were only back in the valleys of tennessee with what alacrity we would respond to that assembly no orderly's patience would be worn out in getting laggards and lazy ones to fall in for roll call how eagerly we would attend to stable duty how gladly mount our faithful horses and ride away to water and what bareback races ride going and coming we would be even glad to hear guard and drill sounded and there would be music in the disconsolate surgeon's call come get your quinine come get your quinine it'll make you sad it'll make you sick come come oh if we were only back what admirable soldiers we would be one morning about three or four o'clock we were awakened by the ground shaking in a series of heavy dull thumps sounding off seaward our silver-voiced bugler seemed to be awakened too he set the echoes ringing with a vigorously played reveille a minute later came an equally earnest assembly and when boots and saddles followed we knew that all was not well in denmark the thumping and shaking now had a significance and meant heavy yankee guns somewhere near we heard the gunners hitching up the bugle signal forward the wheels roll off and for a half hour afterwards we caught the receding sound of the bugle commanding right turn left turn etc as the batteries marched away of course we became considerably wrought up over the matter as we fancied that knowing we were in savannah our vessels were trying to pass up to the city and take it the thumping and shaking continued until late in the afternoon we subsequently learned that some of our blockaders finding time banging heavy upon their hands had essayed a little diversion by knocking forts jackson and bledsoe two small forts defending the passage of the savannah about their defenders ears after capturing the forts our folks desisted and came no farther quite a number of the old raider crowd had come with us from andersonville among these was the shyster peter bradley they kept up their old tactics of hanging around the gates and currying favor with the rebels in every possible way in hopes to get paroles outside or other favors the great mass of the prisoners were so bitter against the rebels as to feel that they would rather die than ask or accept a favor from their hands and they had little else than contempt for these trucklers the raider crowd's favorite theme of conversation with the rebels was the strong discontent of the boys with the manner of their treatment by our government the assertion that there was any such widespread feeling was utterly false we all had confidence as we continue to have to this day that our government would do everything for us possible consistent with its honor and the success of military operations and outside of the little squad of which i speak not an admission could be extracted from anybody that blame could be attached to any one except the rebels it was regarded as unmanly and unsoldierlike to the last degree as well as senseless to revile our government for the crimes committed by its foes but the rebels were led to believe that we were ripe for revolt against our flag and to side with them imagine if possible the stupidity that would mistake our bitter hatred of those who were our deadly enemies for any feeling that would lead us to join hands with those enemies one day we were surprised to see the carpenters erect a rude stand in the centre of the camp when it was finished bradley appeared upon it in company with some rebel officers and guards we gathered around in curiosity and bradley began making a speech he said that it had now become apparent to all of us that our government had abandoned us that it cared little or nothing for us since it could hire as many more quite readily by offering a bounty equal to the pay which would be due us now that it cost only a few hundred dollars to bring over a shipload of irish dutch and french who were only too glad to agree to fight or do anything else to get to this country the peculiar impudence of this consisted in bradley himself being a foreigner and one who had only come out under one of the later calls and the influence of a big bounty 
continuing in this strain he repeated and dwelt upon the old lie always in the mouths of his crowd that secretary stanton and general halleck had positively refused to enter upon negotiations for exchange because those in prison were only a miserable lot of coffee boilers and blackberry pickers whom the army was better off without the terms coffee boiler and blackberry pickers were considered the worst terms of opprobrium we had in prison they were applied to that class of stragglers and skulkers who were only too ready to give themselves up to the enemy and who on coming in told some gauzy story about just having stopped to boil a cup of coffee or to do something else which they should not have done when they were gobbled up it is not risking much to affirm the probability of bradley and most of his crowd having belonged to this dishonourable class the assertion that either the great chief of staff or the still greater war secretary were even capable of applying such epithets to the mass of prisoners is too preposterous to need refutation or even denial no person outside the raider crowd ever gave the silly lie a moment's toleration bradley concluded his speech in some such language as this and now fellow-prisoners i propose to you this that we unite in informing our government that unless we are exchanged in thirty days we will be forced by self-preservation to join the confederate army for an instant his hearers seemed stunned at the fellow's audacity and then there went up such a roar of denunciation and execration that the air trembled the rebels thought that the whole camp was going to rush on bradley and tear him to pieces and they drew revolvers and levelled muskets to defend him the uproar only ceased when bradley was hurried out of the prisons but for hours everybody was savage and sullen and full of threatenings against him when opportunity served we never saw him afterward angry as i was i could not help being amused at the tempestuous rage of a tall fine-looking and well-educated irish sergeant of an illinois regiment he poured forth denunciations of the traitor and the rebels with the vivid fluency of his hibernian nature vowed he'd give a year of me life but jesus to have the handling of the dirty spalpeen for ten minutes by good and finally in his rage tore off his own shirt and threw it on the ground and trampled on it imagine my astonishment some time after getting out of prison to find the southern papers publishing as a defence against the charges in regard to andersonville the following document which they claim to have been adopted by a mass meeting of the prisoners at a mass meeting held september twenty eighth eighteen sixty four by the federal prisoners confined at savannah georgia it was unanimously agreed that the following resolutions be sent to the president of the united states in the hope that he might thereby take such steps as in his wisdom he may think necessary for our speedy exchange or parole resolved that while we would declare our unbounded love for the union for the home of our fathers and for the graves of those we venerate we would beg most respectfully that our situation as prisoners be diligently inquired into and every obstacle consistent with the honour and dignity of the government at once removed resolved that while allowing the confederate authorities all due praise for the attention paid to prisoners numbers of our men are daily consigned to early graves in the prime of manhood far from home and kindred and this is not caused intentionally by the confederate government but by force of circumstances the prisoners are forced to go without shelter and in great portion of cases without medicine resolved that whereas ten thousand of our brave comrades have descended into an untimely grave within the last six months and as we believe their death was caused by the difference of climate the peculiar kind and insufficiency of food and lack of proper medical treatment and whereas those difficulties still remain we would declare as our firm belief that unless we are speedily exchanged we have no alternative but to share the lamentable fate of our comrades must this thing still go on is there no hope resolved that whereas the cold and inclement season of the year is fast approaching we owed it to be our duty as soldiers and citizens of the united states to inform our government that the majority of our prisoners are without proper clothing in some cases being almost naked and are without blankets to protect us from the scorching sun by day or the heavy dews by night and we would most respectfully request the government to make some arrangement whereby we can be supplied with these to us necessary articles 
resolve that whereas the term of service of many of our comrades having expired they having served truly and faithfully for the term of their several enlistments would most respectfully ask their government are they to be forgotten our past services to be ignored not having seen their wives and little ones for over three years they would most respectfully but firmly request the government to make some arrangements whereby they can be exchanged or paroled resolve that whereas in the fortune of war it was our lot to become prisoners we have suffered patiently and are still willing to suffer if by so doing we can benefit the country but we must most respectfully beg to say that we are not willing to suffer to further the ends of any party or clique to the detriment of our honour our families and our country and we beg that this affair be explained to us that we may continue to hold the government in that respect which is necessary to make a good citizen and soldier p bradley chairman of committee in behalf of prisoners in regard to the above i will simply say this that while i cannot pretend to know or even much that went on around me i do not think it was possible for a mass meeting of prisoners to have been held without my knowing it and its essential features still less was it possible for a mass meeting to have been held which would have adopted any such a document as the above or anything else that a rebel would have found the least pleasure in republishing the whole thing is a brazen falsehood End of chapter fifty four chapter fifty five of andersonville a story of rebel military prisons by john mcelroy this librivox recording is in the public domain why we were hurried out of andersonville the fall of atlanta our longing to hear the news arrival of some fresh fish how we knew they were western boys difference in the appearance of the soldiers of the two armies the reason of our being hurried out of andersonville under the false pretext of exchange dawned on us before we had been in savannah long if the reader will consult the map of georgia he will understand this too let him remember that several of the railroads which now appear were not built then the road upon which andersonville is situated was about one hundred and twenty miles long reaching from macon to americus andersonville being about midway between these two it had no connections anywhere except at macon and it was hundreds of miles across the country from andersonville to any other road when atlanta fell it brought our folks to within sixty miles of macon and any day they were liable to make a forward movement which would capture that place and have us where we could be retaken with ease there was nothing left undone to rouse the apprehensions of the rebels in that direction the humiliating surrender of general stoneman at macon in july showed them what our folks were thinking of and awakened their minds to the disastrous consequences of such movement when executed by a bolder and abler commander two days of one of kilpatrick's swift silent marches would carry his hard-riding troopers around hood's right flank and into the streets of macon where a half-hour's work with the torch on the bridges across the okmokji and the creeks that enter it at that point would have cut all of the confederate army of the tennessee's communications another day and night of easy marching would bring his guidance fluttering through the woods about the stockade at andersonville and give him a reinforcement of twelve or fifteen thousand able-bodied soldiers with whom he could have held the whole valley of the chattahoochee and become the nether millstone against which sherman could have ground hood's army to powder such a thing was not only possible but very probable and doubtless would have occurred had we remained in andersonville another week hence the haste to get us away and hence the lie about exchange for had it not been for this one quarter at least of those taken on the cars would have succeeded in getting off and attempted to have reached sherman's lines the removal went on with such rapidity that by the end of september 
only eight thousand two hundred and eighteen remained at andersonville and these were mostly too sick to be moved two thousand seven hundred died in september fifteen hundred and sixty in october and four hundred and eighty five in november so that at the beginning of december there were only thirteen hundred and fifty nine remaining the larger part of those taken out were sent on to charleston and subsequently to florence and salisbury about six or seven thousand of us as near as i remember were brought to savannah we were all exceedingly anxious to know how the atlantic campaign had ended so far our information only comprised the facts that a sharp battle had been fought and the result was the complete possession of our great objective point the manner of accomplishing this glorious end the magnitude of the engagement the regiments brigades and corps participating the loss on both sides the completeness of the victories etc were all matters that we knew nothing of and thirsted to learn the rebel papers said as little as possible about the capture and the facts in that little were so largely diluted with fiction as to convey no real information but few new prisoners were coming in and none of these were from sherman however toward the last of september a handful of fresh fish were turned inside whom our experienced eyes instantly told us were western boys there was never any difficulty in telling as far as he could be seen whether a boy belonged to the east or the west first no one from the army of the potomac was ever without his corps badge worn conspicuously it was rare to see such a thing on one of sherman's men then there was a dressy air about the army of the potomac that was wholly wanting in the soldiers serving west of the alleghanies the army of the potomac was always near to its base of supplies always had its stores accessible and the care of the clothing and equipments of the men was an essential part of its discipline a ragged or shabbily dressed man was a rarity dress coats paper collars fresh woolen shirts neat fitting pantaloons good comfortable shoes and trim caps or hats with all the blazing brass of company letters an inch long regimental number bugle and eagle according to the regulations were as common to the eastern boys as they were rare among the westerners the latter usually wore blouses instead of dress coats and as a rule their clothing had not been renewed since the opening of the campaign and it showed this those who wore good boots or shoes generally had to submit to forcible exchanges by their captors and the same was true of headgear the rebels were badly off in regard to hats they did not have skill and ingenuity enough to make these out of felt or straw and the makeshifts they contrived of quilted calico and long-leaved pine were ugly enough to frighten horned cattle i never blamed them much for wanting to get rid of these even if they did have to commit a sort of highway robbery upon defenceless prisoners to do so to be a traitor in arms was bad certainly but one never appreciated the entire magnitude of the crime until he saw a rebel wearing a calico or a pine-leaf hat then one felt as if it would be a great mistake to ever show such a man mercy the army of northern virginia seemed to have supplied themselves with headgear of yankee manufacture of previous years and they then quit taking the hats of their prisoners johnston's army did not have such good luck and had to keep plundering to the end of the war another thing about the army of the potomac was the variety of the uniforms there were members of zouave regiments wearing baggy breeches of various hues gaiters crimson fezes and profusely braided jackets i have before mentioned the queer garb of the lost ducks les enfants perdus forty eight new york one of the most striking uniforms was that of the fourteenth brooklyn they wore scarlet pantaloons a blue jacket handsomely braided and a red fez with a white cloth wrapped around the head turban fashion as a large number of them were captured they formed quite a picturesque feature of every crowd they were generally good fellows and gallant soldiers another uniform that attracted much though not so favorable attention was that of the third new jersey cavalry or first new jersey hussars as they preferred to call themselves the designer of the uniform must have had an interest in a corcuma plantation or else he was a fanatical orange man each uniform would furnish occasion enough for a dozen new york riots on the twelfth of july never was such an eruption of the yellows seen outside of the jaundiced livery of some eastern potentate 
down each leg of the pantaloons ran a stripe of yellow braid one and one half inches wide the jacket had enormous gilt buttons and was embellished with yellow braid until it was difficult to tell whether it was blue cloth trimmed with yellow or yellow adorned with blue from the shoulder swung a little false hussar jacket lined with the same flaring yellow the visorless cap was similarly warmed up with the hue of the perfected sunflower their saffron magnificence was like the gorgeous gold of the lilies of the field and solomon in all his glory could not have bow arraigned like one of them i hope he was not i want to retain my respect for him we dubbed these daffodil cavaliers butterflies and the name stuck to them like a poor relation still another distinction that was always noticeable between the two armies was in the bodily bearing of the men the army of the potomac was drilled more rigidly than the western men and had comparatively few long marches its members had something of the stiffness and precision of english and german soldiery while the western boys had the long reachy stride and easy swing that made forty miles a day a rather commonplace march for an infantry regiment this was why we knew the new prisoners to be sherman's boys as soon as they came inside and we started for them to hear the news inviting them over to our lean-to we told them our anxiety for the story of the decisive blow that gave us the central gate of the confederacy and asked them to give it to us End of chapter fifty five chapter fifty six of andersonville a story of rebel military prisons by john mcelroy this librivox recording is in the public domain what caused the fall of atlanta a dissertation upon an important psychological problem the battle of jonesboro why it was fought how sherman deceived hood a desperate bayonet charge and the only successful one in the atlanta campaign a gallant colonel and how he died the heroism of some enlisted men going calmly into certain death an intelligent quick-eyed sunburned boy without an ounce of surplus flesh on face or limbs which had been reduced to greyhound condition by the labours and anxieties of the months of battling between chattanooga and atlanta seemed to be the accepted talker of the crowd since all the rest looked at him as if expecting him to answer for them he did so you want to know about how we got atlanta at last do you well if you don't know i should think you would want to if i didn't i'd want somebody to tell me all about it just as soon as he could get to me for it was one of the neatest little bits of work that old billy and his boys ever did and it got away with hood so bad that he hardly knew what hurt him well first i'll tell you that we belong to the fourteenth ohio volunteers which if you know anything about the army of the cumberland you remember has just about as good a record as any that trains around old pap thomas and he don't allow no slouches of any kind near him either you can bet five hundred dollars to a cent on that and offer to give back the cent if you win ours is jim steedman's old regiment you've all heard of old chickamauga jim who slashed his division of seven thousand freshmen into the rebel flank on the second day at chickamauga in a way that made longstreet wish he'd stayed on the rappahannock and never tried to get up any little sociable with the westerners if i do say it myself i believe we've got as good a crowd of square stand-up trust em every minute in your life boys as ever thawed hardtack and sal billy we got all the grunters and weak sisters fanned out the first year and since then we've been on a business basis all the time we're in a mighty good brigade too most of the regiments have been with us since we formed the first brigade pap thomas ever commanded and waited with him through the mud of kentucky from wildcat to mill springs where he gave zala Koffer just a little the awfulest thrashing that a rebel general ever got that you know was in january eighteen sixty two and was the first victory gained by the western army and our people felt so rejoiced over it that yes yes we've read all about that we broke in and we'd like to hear it again some other time but tell us now about atlanta 
all right let's see where was i oh yes talking about our brigade it is the third brigade of the third division of the fourteenth corps and is made up of the fourteenth ohio thirty eighth ohio tenth kentucky and seventy fourth indiana our old colonel george p s de commands it we never liked him very well in camp but i tell you he's a whole team in a fight and he'd do so well there that all would take to him again and he'd be real popular for a while now isn't that strange broke in andrews who was given to fits of speculation of psychological phenomena none of us yearn to die but the surest way to gain the affection of the boys is to show zeal in leading men into scrapes where the chances of getting shot are the best courage in action like charity covers a multitude of sins i've known it to make the most unpopular man in the battalion the most popular inside of half an hour now m addressing himself to me you remember lieutenant h of our battalion you know he was a very fancy young fellow wore as snippish clothes as the tailor could make had gold lace on his jacket wherever the regulations would allow it decorated his shoulders with the stunningest pair of shoulder knots i ever saw and so on well he did not stay with us long after we went to the front he went back on a detail for a court-martial and stayed a good while when he rejoined us he was not in good odour at all and the boys weren't at all careful in saying unpleasant things when he could hear them a little while after he came back we made that reconnaissance up on the virginia road we stirred up the johnnies with our skirmish line and while the firing was going on in front we sat on our horses in line waiting for the order to move forward and engage you know how solemn such moments are i looked down the line and saw lieutenant h at the right of company blank in command of it i had not seen him since he came back and i sung out hello lieutenant how do you feel the reply came back promptly and with boyish cheerfulness bully by god i'm going to lead seventy men of company into action to-day how his boys did cheer him when the bugle sounded forward trot his company sailed in as if they meant it and swept the johnnies off in short metre you never heard anybody say anything against lieutenant after that you know how it was with captain g of our regiment said one of the fourteenth to another he was promoted from orderly sergeant to a second lieutenant and assigned to company d all the members of company d went to headquarters in a body and protested against his being put in their company and he was not well he behaved so well at chickamauga that the boys saw that they had done him a great injustice and all those that still lived went again to headquarters and asked to take all back that they had said and to have him put into the company well that was doing the manly thing sure but go on about atlanta i was telling about our brigade resumed the narrator of course we think our regiments the best by long odds in the army every fellow thinks that of his regiment but next to it come the other regiments of our brigade there's not a cent of discount on any of them sherman had stretched out his right away to the south and west of atlanta about the middle of august our corps commanded by jefferson c davis was lying in works at utoy creek a couple of miles from atlanta we could see the tall steeples and the high buildings of the city quite plainly things had gone on dull and quiet like for about ten days this was longer by a good deal than we had been at rest since we left resaca in the spring we knew that something was brewing and that it must come to a head soon i belong to company c our little mess now reduced to three by the loss of two of our best soldiers and cooks disbrow and soulier killed behind headlogs in front of atlanta by sharpshooters had one fellow that we called observer because he had such a faculty of picking up news in his prowling around headquarters he brought us in so much of this and it was generally so reliable that we frequently made up his absence from duty by taking his place he was never away from a fight though on the night of the twenty fifth of august observer came in with the news that something was in the wind sherman was getting awful restless and we had found out that this always meant lots of trouble to our friends on the other side sure enough orders came to get ready to move and the next night we all moved to the right and rear out of sight of the johnnies our well-built works were left in charge of garrett's cavalry who concealed their horses in the rear and came up and took our places 
the whole army except the twentieth corps moved quietly off and did it so nicely that we were gone some time before the enemy suspected it then the twentieth corps pulled out towards the north and fell back to the chattahoochee making quite a shove of retreat the rebels snapped up the bait greedily they thought the siege was being raised and they poured over their works to hurry the twentieth boys off the twentieth fellows let them know that there was lots of sting in them yet and the johnnies were not long in discovering that it would have been money in their pockets if they had let that moon and star that's the twentieth badge you know crowd alone but the rebs thought the rest of us were gone for good and that atlanta was saved naturally they felt mighty happy over it and resolved to have a big celebration a ball a meeting of jubilee etc extra trains were run in with girls and women from the surrounding country and they just had a high old time in the meantime we were going through so many different kinds of tactics that it looked as if sherman was really crazy this time sure finally we made a grand left wheel and then went forward a long way in line of battle it puzzled us a good deal but we knew that sherman couldn't get us into any scrape that pap thomas couldn't get us out of and so it was all right along on the evening of the thirty first our right wing seemed to have run against a hornet's nest and we could hear the musketry and cannon speak out real spiteful but nothing came down our way we had struck the railroad leading south from atlanta to macon and began tearing it up the jollity at atlanta was stopped right in the middle by the appalling news that the yankees hadn't retreated worth a cent but had broken out in a new and much worse spot than ever then there was no end of trouble all around and hood started part of his his army back after us part of hardee's and pat cleburne's command went into position in front of us we left them alone till stanley could come up on our left and swing around so as to cut off their retreat when we would bag every one of them but stanley was as slow as he always was and did not come up until it was too late and the game was gone the sun was just going down on the evening of the first of september when we began to see we were in for it sure the fourteenth corps wheeled into position near the railroad and the sound of musketry and artillery became very loud and clear on our front and left we turned a little and marched straight toward the racket becoming more excited every minute we saw the carlin's brigade of regulars who were some distance ahead of us pile knapsacks form in line fix bayonets and dash off with a rousing cheer the rebel fire beat upon them like a summer rainstorm the ground shook with the noise and just as we reached the edge of the cotton field we saw the remnant of the brigade come flying back out of the awful blasting shower of bullets the whole slope was covered with dead and wounded yes interrupts one of the fourteenth and they made that charge right gamely too i can tell you they were good soldiers and well led when we went over the works i remember seeing the body of a little major of one of the regiments lying right on the top if he hadn't been killed he'd been inside in a half a dozen steps more there's no mistake about it those regulars will fight when we saw this resumed the narrator it set our fellows fairly wild they became just crying mad i never saw them so before the order came to strip for the charge and our knapsacks were piled in half a minute the lieutenant of our company who was then on the staff of general baird our division commander rode slowly down the line and gave us our instructions to load our guns fix bayonets and hold fire until we were on top of the rebel works then colonel Esty sang out clear and steady as a uh, bugle signal brigade forward guide centre march and we started heavens how they did let into us as we came up into range they had ten pieces of artillery and more men behind the breastworks than we had in line and the fire they poured on us was simply withering we walked across the hundreds of dead and dying of the regular brigade and at every step our own men fell down among them general baud's horse was shot down and the general thrown far over his head but he jumped up and ran alongside of us major wilson our regimental commander fell mortally wounded Lieutenant lieutenant kirk was killed and also captain stopford adjutant general of the brigade lieutenants cobb and mitchell dropped with wounds and that proved fatal in a few days captain eugen lost an arm one-third of the enlisted men fell but we went straight ahead the grape and the musketry being coming worse every step until we gained the edge of the hill where we were checked a minute by the brush which the rebels had fixed up in the shape of abatis 
just then a terrible fire from a new direction our left swept down the whole length of our line the colonel of the seventeenth new york as gallant a man as ever lived saw the new trouble took his regiment in on the run and relieved us of this but he was himself mortally wounded if our boys were half crazy before they were frantic now and as we got out of the entanglement of the brush we raised a fearful yell and ran at the works we climbed the sides fired right down into the defenders and then began with the bayonet and sword for a few minutes it was simply awful on both sides men acted like infuriated devils they dashed each other's brains out with clubbed muskets bayonets were driven into men's bodies up to the muzzle of the gun officers ran their swords through their opponents and revolvers after being emptied into the faces of the rebels were thrown with desperate force into the ranks in our regiment was a stout german butcher named frank fleck he became so excited that he threw down his sword and rushed among the rebels with his bare fists knocking down a swath of them he yelled to the first rebel he met by god i've no patience bit you and knocked him sprawling he caught hold of the commander of the rebel brigade and snatched him back over the works by main strength wonderful to say he escaped unhurt but the boys will probably not soon let him hear the last of by god i've no patience mit you the tenth kentucky by the queerest luck in the world was matched against the rebel ninth kentucky the commanders of the two regiments were brothers-in-law and the men relatives friends acquaintances and schoolmates they hated each other accordingly and the fight between them was more bitter if possible than anywhere else on the line the thirty eighth ohio and seventy fourth indiana put in some work that was just magnificent we hadn't time to look at it then but the dead and wounded piled up after the fight told the story we gradually forced our way over the works but the rebels were game to the last and we had to make them surrender almost one at a time the artillerymen tried to fire on us when we were so close we could lay our hands on the guns finally nearly all in the works surrendered and were disarmed and marched back just then an aide came dashing up with the information that we must turn the works and get ready to receive hardy who was advancing to retake the position we snatched up some shovels lying near and began work we had no time to removed the dead and dying rebels on the works and the dirt we threw covered them up it proved a false alarm hardy had as much as he could do to save his own hide and the affair ended about dark when we came to count up what we had gained we found that we had actually taken more prisoners from behind breastworks than there were in our brigade when we started the charge of we had made the only really successful bayonet charge of the campaign every other time since we left chattanooga the party standing on the defensive had been successful here we had taken strong double lines with ten guns seven battle flags and over two thousand prisoners we had lost terribly not less than one-third of the brigade and many of our best men our regiment went into the battle with fifteen officers nine of these were killed or wounded and seven of the nine lost either their limbs or lives the thirty-eighth ohio and the other regiments of the brigade lost equally heavy we thought chickamauga awful but jonesboro discounted it do you know said another of the fourteenth i heard our surgeon telling about how that colonel grower of the seventeenth new york who came in so splendidly on our left died they say he was a wall street broker before the war he was hit shortly after he led his regiment in and after the fight was carried back to the hospital while our surgeon was going the rounds colonel grower called him and said quietly when you get through with the men come and see me please the doctor would have attended to him then but grower wouldn't let him after he got through he went back to grower examined his wound and told him that he could only live a few hours grower received the news tranquilly had the doctor write a letter to his wife and gave him his things to send her and then grasping the doctor's hand he said doctor i've just one more favor to ask will you grant it the doctor said certainly what is it you say i can't live but a few hours yes that is true in that i will likely be in great pain i'm sorry to say so well then do give me morphia enough to put me to sleep so that i will wake up only in another world the doctor did so colonel grower thanked him wrung his hand bade him good-bye and went to sleep to wake no more do you believe in presentiments and superstitions said another of the fourteenth there was fisher pray orderly sergeant of company i he came from waterville ohio where his folks are now living the day before we started out he had a presentiment that we were going into a fight and that he would be killed he couldn't shake it off he told the lieutenant and some of the boys about it 
and they tried to ridicule him out of it but it was no good when the sharp firing broke out in front some of the boys said fisher i do believe you are right and he nodded his head mournfully when we were piling knapsacks for the charge the lieutenant who was a great friend of fisher's said fisher you stay here and guard the knapsacks fisher's face blazed in an instant no sir said he i never shirked a fight yet and i won't begin now so he went into the fight and was killed as he knew he would be now that's what i call nerve the same thing was true of sergeant arthur tarbox of company a said the narrator he had a presentiment too he knew he was going to be killed if he went in and he was offered an honourable chance to stay out but he would not take it and went in and was killed well we stayed there the next day buried our dead took care of our wounded and gathered up the plunder we had taken from the johnnies the rest of the army went off hot blocks after hardy and the rest of hood's army which it was hoped would be caught outside of entrenchments but hood had too much the start and got into the works at lovejoy ahead of our fellows the night before we heard several very loud explosions up to the north we guessed what that meant and so did the twentieth corps who were lying back at the chattahoochee and the next morning the general commanding slocum sent out a reconnaissance it was met by the mayor of atlanta who said that the rebels had blown up their stores and retreated the twentieth corps then came in and took possession of the city and the next day the third sherman came in and issued an order declaring the campaign at an end and that we would rest a while and refit we laid around atlanta a good while and things quieted down so that it seemed almost like peace after the four months of continual fighting we had gone through we had been under a strain so long that now we boys went in the other direction and became too careless and that's how we got picked up we went out about five miles one night after a lot of nice smoked hams that a nigger told us were stored in an old cotton press and which we knew would be enough sight better eating for company c than the commissary pork we had lived on so long we found the cotton press and the hams just as the nigger told us and we hitched up a team to take them into camp as we hadn't seen any johnny signs anywhere we set our guns down to help load the meat and just as we all came stringing out to the wagon with as much meat as we could carry a company of ferguson's cavalry popped out of the woods about one hundred yards in front of us and were on top of us before we could say i scat you see they'd heard of the meat too end of chapter fifty six chapter fifty seven of andersonville a story of rebel military prisons by john mcelroy this librivox recording is in the public domain a fair sacrifice the story of one boy who willingly gave his young life for his country charlie barber was one of the truest hearted and best liked of my schoolboy chums and friends for several terms we sat together on the same uncompromisingly uncomfortable bench worried over the same boy maddening problems in ray's arithmetic part three learned the same jargon of meaningless rules from green's grammar pondered over mitchell's geography and atlas and tried in vain to understand why providence made the surface of one state obtrusively pink and another ultramarine blue trod slowly and painfully over the rugged road bullion points out for beginners in latin and began to believe we should hate ourselves and everybody else if we were gotten up after the manner shown by cutter's physiology we were caught together in the same long series of schoolboy scrapes and were usually ferruled together by the same strong-armed teacher we shared nearly everything our fun and work enjoyment and annoyance all were generally meted out to us together we read from the same books the story of the wonderful world we were going to see in that bright future when we were men we spent our saturdays and vacations in the miniature explorations of the rocky hills and caves and dark cedar woods around our homes to gather ocular helps to a better comprehension of that magical land which we were convinced began just beyond our horizon and had in it visible to the eye of him who travelled through its enchanted breadth all that gulliver's fables the arabian nights and a hundred books of travel and adventure told of we imagined that the only dull and commonplace spot on earth was that where we lived everywhere else life was a grand spectacular drama full of thrilling effects 
brave and handsome young men were rescuing distressed damsels beautiful as they were wealthy bloody pirates and swarthy murderers were being foiled by quaint spoken backwoodsmen who carried unerring rifles gallant but blundering irishmen speaking the most delightful brogue and making the funniest mistakes were daily thwarting cool and determined villains bold tars were encountering fearful sea perils lion-hearted adventurers were cowing and quelling whole tribes of barbarians magicians were casting spells misers hoarding gold scientists making astonishing discoveries poor and unknown boys achieving wealth and fame at a single bound hidden mysteries coming to light and so the world was going on making reams of history with each diurnal revolution and furnishing boundless material for the most delightful books at the age of thirteen a perusal of the lives of benjamin franklin and horace greeley precipitated my determination to no longer hesitate in launching my small bark upon the great ocean i ran away from home in a truly romantic way and placed my foot on what i expected to be the first round of the ladder of fame by becoming devil boy in a printing office in a distant large city charlie's attachment to his mother and his home was too strong to permit him to take this step and we parted in sorrow mitigated on my side by roseate dreams of the future six years passed one hot august morning i met an old acquaintance at the creek in andersonville he told me to come there the next morning after roll call and he would take me to see some person who was very anxious to meet me i was prompt at the rendezvous and was soon joined by the other party he threaded his way slowly for over half an hour through the closely jumbled mass of tents and burrows and at length stopped in front of a blanket tent in the northwestern corner the occupant rose and took my hand for an instant i was puzzled then the clear blue eyes and well-remembered smile recalled to me my old-time comrade charlie barber his story was soon told he was a sergeant in a western virginia cavalry regiment the fourth i think at the time hunter was making his retreat from the valley of virginia it was decided to mislead the enemy by sending out a courier with false dispatches to be captured there was a call for a volunteer for this service charlie was the first to offer with that spirit of generous self-sacrifice that was one of his pleasantest traits when a boy he knew what he had to expect capture meant imprisonment at andersonville our men had now a pretty clear understanding of what this was charlie took the dispatches and rode into the enemy's lines he was taken and the false information produced the desired effect on his way to andersonville he was stripped of all his clothing but his shirt and pantaloons and turned into the stockade in this condition when i saw him he had been in a week or more he told his story quietly almost diffidently not seeming aware that he had done more than his simple duty i left him with the promise and expectation of returning the next day but when i attempted to find him again i was lost in the maze of tents and burrows i had forgotten to ask the number of his detachment and after spending several days in hunting for him i was forced to give the search up he knew as little of my whereabouts and though we were all the time within seventeen hundred feet of each other neither we nor our common acquaintance could ever manage to meet again this will give the reader an idea of the throng compressed within the narrow limits of the stockade after leaving andersonville however i met this man once more and learned from him that charlie had sickened and died within a month after his entrance to prison so ended his daydream of a career in the busy world end of chapter fifty seven chapter fifty eight of andersonville a story of rebel military prisons by john mcelroy this librivox recording is in the public domain we leave savannah more hopes of exchange scenes of departure flankers on the back track toward andersonville alarm thereat at the parting of two ways we finally bring up at camp lawton on the evening of the eleventh of october there came an order for one thousand prisoners to fall in and march out for transfer to some other point of course andrews and i flanked into this crowd 
that was our usual way of doing holding that the chances were strongly in favor of every movement of prisoners being to our lines we never failed to be numbered in the first squad of prisoners that were sent out the selective mirage of exchange was always luring us on it must come some time certainly and it would be most likely to come to those who were most earnestly searching for it at all events we should leave no means untried to avail ourselves of whatever seeming chances there might be there could be no other motive for this move we argued than exchange the confederacy was not likely to be at the trouble and expense of hauling us about the country without some good reason something better than a wish to make us acquainted with southern scenery and topography it would hardly take us away from savannah so soon after bringing us there for any other purpose than delivery to our people the rebels encouraged this belief with direct assertions of its truth they framed a plausible lie about there having arisen some difficulty concerning the admission of our vessels past the harbour defences of savannah which made it necessary to take us elsewhere probably to charleston for delivery to our men wishes are always the most powerful allies of belief there is little difficulty in convincing a man of that of which he wants to be convinced we forgot the lie told us when we were taken from andersonville and believed the one which was told us now andrews and i hastily snatched our worldly possession our overcoat blanket can spoon chessboard and men yelled to some of our neighbors that they could have our hitherto much treasured house and running down to the gate forced ourselves well up to the front of the crowd that was being assembled to go out the usual scenes accompanying the departure of first squads were being acted tumultuously every one in the camp wanted to be one of the supposed to be favored few and if not selected at first tried to flank in that is slip into the place of some one else who had had better luck this one naturally resisted displacement v et armis and the fights would become so general as to cause a resemblance to the famed fair of donnybrook the cry would go up look out for flankers the lines of the selected would dress up compactly and outsiders trying to force themselves in would get mercilessly pounded we finally got out of the pen and into the cars which soon rolled away to the westward we were packed in too densely to be able to lie down we could hardly sit down andrews and i took up our position in one corner piled our little treasures under us and trying to lean against each other in such a way as to afford mutual support and rest dozed fitfully through a long weary night when morning came we found ourselves running northwest through a poor pine barren country that strongly resembled that we had traversed in coming to savannah the more we looked at it the more familiar it became and soon there was no doubt we were going back to andersonville by noon we had reached millen eighty miles from savannah and fifty-three from augusta it was the junction of the road leading to macon and that running to augusta we halted a little while at the y and to us the minutes were full of anxiety if we turned off to the left we were going back to andersonville if we took the right-hand road we were on the way to charleston or richmond with chances in favor of exchange at length we started and to our joy our engine took the right-hand track we stopped again after a run of five miles in the midst of one of the open scattering forests of long-leaved pine that i have before described we were ordered out of the cars and marching a few rods came in sight of another of those hateful stockades which seemed to be as natural products of the sterile sand of that dreary land as its desolate woods and its breed of boy murderers and grey-headed assassins again our hearts sank and death seemed more welcome than incarceration in those gloomy wooden walls we marched despondently up to the gates of the prison and halted while a party of rebel clerks made a list of our names rank companies and regiments as they were rebels it was slow work reading and writing never came by nature as dogberry would say to any man fighting for secession as a rule he took to them as reluctantly as if he thought them cunning inventions of the northern abolitionists to perplex and demoralize him what a half dozen boys taken out of our own ranks would have done with ease in an hour or so these rebels worried all over all of the afternoon and then their register of us was so imperfect badly written and misspelled that the yankee clerks afterwards detailed for the purpose never could succeed in reducing it to intelligibility 
we learned that the place at which we had arrived was camp lawton but we almost always spoke of it as millen the same as camp sumter is universally known as andersonville shortly after dark we were turned inside the stockade being the first that had entered there was quite a quantity of wood the offal from the timber used in constructing the stockade lying on the ground the night was chilly one we soon had a number of fires blazing green pitch pine when burned gives off a peculiar pungent odour which is never forgotten by one who has once smelled it i first became acquainted with it on entering andersonville and to this day it is the most powerful remembrance i can have of the opening of that dreadful iliad of woes on my journey to washington of late years the locomotives are invariably fed with pitch pine as we near the capital and as the well-remembered smell reaches me i grow sick at heart with the flood of saddening recollections indissolubly associated with it as our fires blazed up the clinging penetrating fumes diffused themselves everywhere the night was as cool as the one when we arrived at andersonville the earth meagerly sodded with sparse hard wiry grass was the same the same piney breezes blew in from the surrounding trees the same dismal owls hooted at us the same mournful whippoorwill lamented god knows what in the gathering twilight what we both felt in the gloomy recesses of downcast hearts andrews expressed as he turned to me with my god mac this looks like andersonville all over again a cupful of cornmeal was issued to each of us i hunted up some water andrews made a stiff dough and spread it about half an inch thick on the back of our chessboard he propped this up before the fire and when the surface was neatly browned over slipped it off the board and turned it over to brown the other side similarly this done we divided it carefully between us swallowed it in silence spread our old overcoat on the ground tucked chessboard can and spoon under far enough to be out of the reach of thieves adjusted the thin blanket so as to get the most possible warmth out of it crawled in close together and went to sleep this thank heaven we could do we could still sleep and nature had some opportunity to repair the waste of the day we slept and forgot where we were End of chapter fifty eight chapter fifty nine of andersonville a story of rebel military prisons by john mcelroy this librivox recording is in the public domain our new quarters at camp lawton building a hut an exceptional commandant he is a good man but will take bribes rations in the morning we took a survey of our new quarters and found that we were in a stockade resembling very much in construction and dimensions that at andersonville the principal difference was that the upright logs were in their rough state whereas they were hewed at andersonville and the brook running through the camp was not bordered by a swamp but had clean firm banks our next move was to make the best of the situation we were divided into hundreds each commanded by a sergeant ten hundreds constituted a division the head of which was also a sergeant i was elected by my comrades to the sergeancy of the second hundred of the first division as soon as we were assigned to our ground we began constructing shelter for the first and only time in my prison experience we found a full supply of material for this purpose and the use we made of it showed how infinitely better we would have fared if in each prison the rebels had done even so slight a thing as to bring in a few logs from the surrounding woods and distribute them to us a hundred or so of these would probably have saved thousands of lives at andersonville and florence a large tree lay on the ground assigned to our hundred andrews and i took possession of one side of the ten feet nearest the butt other boys occupied the rest in a similar manner one of our boys had succeeded in smuggling an axe in with him and we kept it in constant use day and night each group borrowing it for an hour or so at a time it was as dull as a hoe and we were very weak so that it was slow work niggering off as the boys termed it a cut of the log 
it seemed as if beavers could have gnawed it off easier and more quickly we only cut an inch or so at a time and then passed the axe to the next users making little wedges with a dull knife we drove them into the log with clubs and split off long thin strips like the weather boards of a house and by the time we had split off our share of the log in this slow and laborious way we had a fine lot of these strips we were lucky enough to find four forked sticks of which we made the corners of our dwelling and roofed it carefully with our strips held in place by sods torn up from the edge of the creek bank the sides and ends were enclosed we gathered enough pine tops to cover the ground to a depth of several inches we banked up the outside and ditched around it and then had the most comfortable abode we had during our prison career it was truly a house built with our own hands for we had no tools whatever save the occasional use of the aforementioned dull axe and equally dull knife the rude little hut represented as much actual hard manual labor as would be required to build a comfortable little cottage in the north but we gladly performed it as we would have done any other work to better our condition for a while wood was quite plentiful and we had the luxury daily of warm fires which the increasing coolness of the weather made important accessories to our comfort other prisoners kept coming in those we left behind at savannah followed us and the prison there was broken up quite a number also came in from andersonville so that in a little while we had between six and seven thousand in the stockade the last comers found all the material for tents and all the fuel used up and consequently did not fare so well as the earlier arrivals the commandant of the prison one captain bows was the best of his class it was my fortune to meet compared with the senseless brutality of wirtz the reckless deviltry of davis or the stupid malignance of barrett at florence his administration was mildness and wisdom itself he enforced discipline better than any of those named but has what they all lacked executive ability and he secured results that they could not possibly attain and without anything like the friction that attended their efforts i do not remember that any one was shot during our six weeks stay at millen a circumstance simply remarkable since i do not recall a single week passed anywhere else without at least one murder by the guards one instance will illustrate the difference of his administration from that of other prison commandants he came upon the grounds of our division one morning accompanied by a pleasant-faced intelligent appearing lad of about fifteen or sixteen he said to us gentlemen the only instance during our imprisonment when we received so polite a designation this is my son who will hereafter call your role he will treat you as gentlemen and i know you will do the same to him this understanding was observed to the letter on both sides young bows invariably spoke civilly to us and we obeyed his orders with a prompt cheerfulness that left him nothing to complain of the only charge i have to make against bows is made more in detail in another chapter and that is that he took money from well prisoners for giving them the first chance to go through on the sick exchange how culpable this was i must leave each reader to decide for himself i thought it very wrong at the time but possibly my views might have been coloured highly by my not having any money wherewith to procure my own inclusion in the happy lot of the exchanged of one thing i am certain that his acceptance of money to buy his official action was not singular on his part i am convinced that every commandant we had over us except Wirtz, was habitually in the receipt of bribes from prisoners i never heard that any one succeeded in bribing words and this is the sole good thing i can say of that fellow against this it may be said however that he plundered the boys so effectually on entering the prison as to leave them little of the wherewithal to bribe anybody davis was probably the most unscrupulous bribe-taker of the lot he actually received money for permitting prisoners to escape to our lines and got down to as low a figure as one hundred dollars for this sort of service i never heard that any of the other commandants went this far the rations issued to us were somewhat better than those of andersonville as the meal was finer and better though it was absurdly insufficient in quantity and we received no salt on several occasions fresh beef was dealt out to us and each time the excitement created among those who had not tasted fresh meat for weeks and months was wonderful on the first occasion the meat was simply the heads of the cattle killed for the use of the guards 
several wagon loads of these were brought in and distributed we broke them up so that every man got a piece of the bone which was boiled and reboiled as long as a single bubble of grease would rise to the surface of the water every vestige of meat was gnawed and scraped from the surface and then the bone was charred until it crumbled when it was eaten no one who has not experienced it can imagine the inordinate hunger for animal food of those who had eaten little else than corn bread for so long our exhausted bodies were perishing for lack of proper sustenance nature indicated fresh grief as the best medium to repair the great damage already done and our longing for it became beyond description End of chapter fifty nine chapter sixty of andersonville a story of rebel military prisons by john mcelroy this librivox recording is in the public domain the raiders reappear on the scene the attempt to assassinate those who were concerned in the execution a couple of lively fights in which the raiders are defeated holding an election our old antagonists the raiders were present in strong force in millen like ourselves they had imagined the departure from andersonville was for exchange and their relations to the rebels were such that they were all given a chance to go with the first squads a number had been allowed to go with the sailors on the special naval exchange from savannah in the place of sailors and marines who had died on the way to charleston a fight had taken place between them and the real sailors during which one of their number a curly-headed irishman named daly who was in such high favour with the rebels that he was given the place of driving the ration wagon that came in the north side at andersonville was killed and thrown under the wheels of the moving train which passed over him after things began to settle into shape at millen they seemed to believe that they were in such ascendancy as to numbers and organization that they could put into execution their schemes of vengeance against those of us who had been active participants in the execution of their confederates at andersonville after some little preliminaries they settled upon corporal watt payne of my company as their first victim the reader will remember payne as one of the two corporals who pulled the trigger to the scaffold at the time of the execution payne was a very good man physically and was yet in fair condition the raiders came up one day with their best man pete donnelly and provoked a fight intending in the course of it to kill payne we who knew payne felt reasonably confident of his ability to handle even so redoubtable a pugilist as donnelly and we gathered together a little squad of our friends to see fair play the fight began after the usual amount of bad talk on both sides and we were pleased to see our man slowly get the better of the new york plug ugly after several sharp rounds they closed and still pain was ahead but in an evil moment he spied a pine knot at his feet which he thought he could reach and end the fight by cracking donnelly's head with it donnelly took instant advantage of the movement to get it threw pain heavily and fell upon him his crowd rushed in to finish our man by clubbing him over the head we sailed in to prevent this and after a rattling exchange of blows all around succeeded in getting pain away the issue of the fight seemed rather against us however and the raiders were much emboldened pain kept close to his crowd after that and as we had shown such an entire willingness to stand by him the raiders with their accustomed prudence when real fighting was involved did not attempt to molest him farther though they talked very savagely a few days after this sergeant goody and corporal ned kerrigan both of our battalion came in i must ask the reader to again recall the fact that sergeant goody was one of the six hangmen who put the meal sacks over the heads and the ropes around the necks of the condemned corporal kerrigan was the gigantic prize-fighter who was universally acknowledged to be the best man physically among the whole thirty-four thousand in andersonville the raiders knew that goody had come in before we of his own battalion did they resolved to kill him then and there and in broad daylight he had secured in some way a sheltered tent and was inside of it fixing it up the raider crowd headed by p donnelly and dick allen went up to his tent and one of them called to him sergeant come out i want to see you goody supposing it was one of us came crawling out on his hands and knees as he did so their heavy clubs crashed down upon his head 
he was neither killed nor stunned as they had reason to expect he succeeded in rising to his feet and breaking through the crowd of assassins he dashed down the side of the hill hotly pursued by them coming to the creek he leaped it in his excitement but his pursuers could not and were checked one of our battalion boys who saw and comprehended the whole affair ran over to us shouting turn out turn out for god's sake the raiders are killing goody we snatched up our clubs and started after the raiders but before we could reach them ned kerrigan who also comprehended what the trouble was had run to the side of goody armed with a terrible-looking club the sight of ned and the demonstration that he was thoroughly aroused was enough for the raider crew and they abandoned the field hastily we did not feel ourselves strong enough to follow them on to their own dunghill and try conclusions with them but we determined to report the matter to the rebel commandant from whom we had reason to believe we could expect assistance we were right we sent in a squad of guards arrested dick allen pete donnelly and several other ringleaders took them out and put them in the stocks in such a manner that they were compelled to lie upon their stomachs a shallow tin vessel containing water was placed under their faces to furnish them drink they stayed there a day and night and when released joined the rebel army entering the artillery company that manned the guns in the fort covering the prison i used to imagine with what zeal they would send us over a round of shell or grape if they could get anything like an excuse this gave us good riddance of our dangerous enemies and we had little further trouble with any of them the depression in the temperature made me very sensible of the deficiencies in my wardrobe unshod feet a shirt like a fishing net and pantaloons as well ventilated as a paling fence might do very well for the boiling sun at andersonville and savannah but now with the thermometer nightly dipping a little nearer the frost line it became unpleasantly evident that as garments their office was purely perfunctory one might say ornamental simply if we wanted to be very sarcastic they were worn solely to afford convenient quarters for multitudes of lice and in deference to the prejudice which has existed since the fall of man against our mingling with our fellow-creatures in the attire provided us by nature had i read darwin then i should have expected that my long exposure to the weather would start a fine suit of fur in the effort of nature to adapt me to my environment but no more indications of this appeared than if i had been a hairless dog of mexico suddenly transplanted to more northern latitudes providence did not seem to be in the tempering the wind to the shorn lamb business as far as i was concerned i still retained an almost unconquerable prejudice against stripping the dead to secure clothes and so unless exchange or death came speedily i was in a bad fix one morning about daybreak andrews who had started to go to another part of the camp came slipping back in a state of gleeful excitement at first i thought he either had found a tunnel or had heard some good news about exchange it was neither he opened his jacket and handed me an infantryman's blouse which he had found in the main street where it had dropped out of some fellow's bundle we did not make any extra exertion to find the owner andrews was in sore need of clothes himself but my necessities were so much greater that the generous fellow thought of my wants first we examined the garment with as much interest as ever a bell bestowed on a new dress from worse it was in fair preservation but the owner had cut the buttons off to trade to the guard doubtless for a few sticks of wood or a spoonful of salt we supplied the place of these with little wooden pins and i donned the garment as a shirt and coat and vest too for that matter the best suit i ever put on never gave me a hundredth part the satisfaction that this did shortly after i managed to subdue my aversion so far as to take a good shoe which a one-legged dead man had no farther use for and a little later a comrade gave me for the other foot a boot bottom from which he had cut the top to make a bucket the day of the presidential election of eighteen sixty four approached the rebels were naturally very much interested in the result as they believed that the election of mcclellan meant compromise and secession of hostilities while the re-election of lincoln meant prosecution of the war to the bitter end the toadying raiders who were perpetually hanging around the gate to get a chance to insinuate themselves into the favor of the rebel officers persuaded them that we were all so bitterly hostile to our government for not exchanging us that if we were allowed to vote we would cast an overwhelming majority in favor of mcclellan the rebels thought that this might perhaps be used to advantage as political capital for their friends in the north 
they gave orders that we might if we chose hold an election on the same day of the presidential election they sent in some ballot boxes and re-elected judges of the election about noon of that day captain bowes and a crowd of tight-booted broad-hatted rebel officers strutted in with the peculiar if you don't believe i'm a butcher jest smell a uh, my boots swagger characteristic of the class they had come in to see us all voting for mcclellan instead they found the polls surrounded with the ticket peddlers shouting walk right up here now and get your unconditional union abraham lincoln tickets here's your straight-haired prosecution of the war ticket vote the lincoln ticket vote to whip the rebels and make peace with them when they've laid down their arms don't vote a mcclellan ticket and gratify rebels everywhere etc the rebel officers did not find the scene what their fancy painted it and turning around they strutted out when the votes came to be counted out there were over seven thousand for lincoln and not half that many hundred for mcclellan the latter got very few votes outside the raider crowd the same day a similar election was held in florence with like result of course this did not indicate that there was any such a preponderance of republicans among us it meant simply that the democratic boys little as they might have liked lincoln would have voted for him a hundred times rather than do anything to please the rebels i never heard that the rebels sent the result north End of chapter sixty chapter sixty one of andersonville a story of rebel military prisons by john mcelroy this librivox recording is in the public domain the rebels formally proposed to us to desert to them contumelious treatment of the proposition their rage an exciting time an outbreak threatened difficulties attending desertion to the rebels one day in november some little time after the occurrences narrated in the last chapter orders came in to make out rolls of all those who were born outside of the united states and whose terms of service had expired we held a little council among ourselves as to the meaning of this and concluded that some partial exchange had been agreed on and the rebels were going to send back the class of boys whom they thought would be of least value to the government acting on this conclusion the great majority of us enrolled ourselves as foreigners and as having served out our terms i made out the rule of my hundred and managed to give every man a foreign nativity those whose names would bear it were assigned to england ireland scotland france and germany and the balance were distributed through canada and the west indies after finishing the roll and sending it out i did not wonder that the rebels believed the battles for the union were fought by foreign mercenaries the other rolls were made out in the same way and i do not suppose that they showed five hundred native americans in the stockade the next day after sending out the rolls there came an order that all those whose names appeared thereon should fall in we did so promptly and as nearly every man in camp was included we fell in as for other purposes by hundreds and thousands we were then marched outside and massed around a stump on which stood a rebel officer evidently waiting to make us a speech we awaited his remarks with the greatest impatience but he did not begin until the last division had marched out and came to a parade rest close to the stump it was the same old story prisoners you can no longer have any doubt that your government has cruelly abandoned you it makes no efforts to release you and refuses all our offers of exchange we are anxious to get our men back and have made every effort to do so but it refuses to meet us on any reasonable grounds your secretary of war has said that the government can get along very well without you and general halleck has said that you were nothing but a set of blackberry pickers and coffee boilers anyhow you have already endured much more than it could expect of you you served it faithfully during the term you enlisted for and now when it is through with you it throws you aside to starve and die you also can have no doubt that the southern confederacy is certain to succeed in securing its independence it would do this in a few months it now offers you an opportunity to join its service and if you serve it faithfully to the end you will receive the same rewards as the rest of its soldiers you will be taken out of here be well clothed and fed given a good bounty and at the conclusion of the war receive a land warrant for a nice farm if you but we had heard enough the sergeant of our division a man with a stentorian voice sprang out and shouted attention first division we sergeants of hundreds repeated the command down the line shouted he first division about said we first hundred about 
second hundred about third hundred about fourth hundred about etc etc said he face ten sergeants repeated face one after the other and each man in the hundreds turned on his heel then our leader commanded first division forward march and we strode back into the stockade followed immediately by all the other divisions leaving the orator still standing on the stump the rebels were furious at this curt way of replying we had scarcely reached our quarters when they came in with several companies with loaded guns and fixed bayonets they drove us out of our tents and huts into one corner under the pretense of hunting axes and spades but in reality to steal our blankets and whatever else they could find that they wanted and to break down and injure our huts many of which costing us days of patient labour they destroyed in pure wantonness we were burning with the bitterest indignation a tall slender man named lloyd a member of the sixty first ohio a rough and educated fellow but brimful of patriotism and manly common sense jumped up on a stump and poured out his soul in a rude but fiery eloquence comrades he said do not let the blowing of these rebel whelps discourage you pay no attention to the lies they have told you to-day you know well that our government is too honourable and just to desert any one who serves it it has not deserted us their hell-born confederacy is not going to succeed i tell you that as sure as there is a god who reigns and judges in israel before the spring breezes stir the tops of these blasted old pines their confederacy and all the lousy graybacks who support it will be so deep in hell that nothing but a search warrant from the throne of our god almighty can ever find it again and the glorious old stars and stripes here he began cheering tremendously a rebel captain came running up said to the guard who was leaning on his gun gazing curiously at lloyd what in the hell are you standing gaping there for why don't you shoot the damn yankee son of a bitch and snatching the gun away from him cocked and levelled it at lloyd but the boys near jerked the speaker down from the stump and saved his life we became fearfully wrought up some of the more excitable shouted out to charge on the line of guards snatched their guns away from them and force our way through the gate the shouts were taken up by others as if in obedience to the suggestion we instinctively formed in line of battle facing the guards a glance down the line showed me an array of desperate tensely drawn faces such as one sees who looks a man when they are summoning up all their resolution for some deed of great peril the rebel officers hastily retreated behind the line of guards whose faces blanched but they levelled the muskets and prepared to receive us captain bose who was overlooking the prison from an elevation outside had however divined the trouble at the outset and was preparing to meet it the gunners who had shouted the pieces and trained them upon us when we came out to listen to the speech had again covered us with them and were ready to sweep the prison with grape and canister at the instant of command the long roll was summoning the infantry regiments back into line and some of the cooler headed among us pointed these facts out and succeeded in getting the line to dissolve again into groups of muttering sullen-faced men when this was done the guards marched out by a cautious indirect manoeuvre so as not to turn their backs to us it was believed that we had some among us who would like to avail themselves of the offer of the rebels and that they would try to inform the rebels of their desires by going to the gate during the night and speaking to the officer of the guard a squad armed themselves with clubs and laid in wait for these they succeeded in catching several snatching some of them back even after they had told the guard their wishes in a tone so loud that all near could hear distinctly the officer of the guard rushed in two or three times in a vain attempt to save the would-be deserter from the cruel hands that clutched him and bore him away to where he had a lesson in loyalty impressed upon the fleshiest part of his person by a long flexible strip of pine wielded by very willing hands after this was kept up for several nights different ideas began to prevail it was felt that if a man wanted to join the rebels the best way was to let him go and get rid of him he was of no benefit to the government and would be of none to the rebels after this no restriction was put upon any one who desired to go outside and take the oath but very few did so however and these were wholly confined to the raider crowd End of chapter sixty one chapter sixty two of andersonville a story of rebel military prisons by john mcelroy 
this librivox recording is in the public domain sergeant leroy l key his adventures subsequent to the executions he goes outside at andersonville on parole labours in the cookhouse attempts to escape is recaptured and taken to macon escapes from there but is compelled to return is finally exchanged at savannah leroy elkey the heroic sergeant of company m sixteenth illinois cavalry who organized and led the regulators at andersonville in their successful conflict with and defeat of the raiders and who presided at the execution of the six condemned men on the eleventh of july furnishes at the request of the author the following story of his prison career subsequent to that event on the twelfth day of july eighteen sixty four the day after the hanging of the six raiders by the urgent request of my many friends of whom you were one i sought and obtained from wirtz a parole for myself and the six brave men who assisted as executioners of those desperados it seemed that you were all fearful that we might after what had been done be assassinated if we remained in the stockade and that we might be overpowered perhaps by the friends of the raiders we had hanged at a time possibly when you would not be on hand to give us assistance and thus lose our lives for rendering the help we did in getting rid of the worst pestilence we had to contend with on obtaining my parole i was very careful to have it so arranged and mutually understood between wirtz and myself that at any time that my squad meaning the survivors of my comrades with whom i was originally captured was sent away from andersonville either to be exchanged or to go to another prison that i should be allowed to go with them this was agreed to and so written in my parole which i carried until it absolutely wore out i took a position in the cookhouse and the other boys either went to work there or at the hospital or graveyard as occasion required i worked here and did the best i could for the many starving wretches inside in the way of preparing their food until the eighth day of september at which time if you remember quite a train load of men were removed as many of us thought for the purpose of exchange but as we afterwards discovered to be taken to another prison among the crowd so removed was my squad or at least a portion of them being my intimate messmates while in the stockade and as soon as i found this to be the case i waited on worse at his office and asked permission to go with them which he refused stating that he was compelled to have men at the cookhouse to cook for those in the stockade until they were all gone or exchanged i reminded him of the condition in my parole but this only had the effect of making him mad and he threatened me with the stocks if i did not go back and resume work i then and there made up my mind to attempt my escape considering that the parole had first been broken by the man that granted it on inquiry after my return to the cookhouse i found four other boys who were also planning an escape and who were only too glad to get me to join them and take charge of the affair our plans were well laid and well executed as the sequel will prove and in this particular my own experience in the endeavour to escape from andersonville is not entirely dissimilar from yours though it had different results i very much regret that in the attempt i lost my pencilled memorandum in which it was my habit to chronicle what went on around me daily and where i had the names of my brave comrades who made the effort to escape with me unfortunately i cannot now recall to memory the name of one of them or remember to what commands they belonged i knew that our greatest risk was run in eluding the guards and that in the morning we should be compelled to cheat the bloodhounds the first we managed to do very well not without many hairbreadth escapes however but we did succeed in getting through both lines of guards and found ourselves in the densest pine forest i ever saw we travelled as nearly as we could judge due north all night until daylight from our fatigue and bruises and the long hours that had elapsed since eight o'clock the time of our starting we thought we had come not less than twelve or fifteen miles imagine our surprise and mortification then when we could plainly hear the reveille and almost the sergeant's voice calling the roll while the answers of here were perfectly distinct we could not possibly have been more than a mile 
or mile and a half at the farthest from the stockade our anxiety and mortification were doubled when at the usual hour as we supposed we heard the well-known and long familiar sound of the hunter's horn calling his hounds to their accustomed task of making the circuit of the stockade for the purpose of ascertaining whether or not any yankee had had the audacity to attempt an escape the hounds anticipating no doubt this usual daily work gave forth glad barks of joy at being thus called forth to duty we heard them start as was usual from about the railroad depot as we imagined but the sounds growing fainter and fainter gave us a little hope that our trail had been missed only a short time however were we allowed this pleasant reflection for ere long it could not have been more than an hour we could plainly see that they were drawing nearer and nearer they finally appeared so close that i advised the boys to climb a tree or sapling in order to keep the dogs from biting them and to be ready to surrender when the hunters came up hoping thus to experience as little misery as possible and not dreaming but that we were caught on on came the hounds nearer and nearer still till we imagined that we could see the undergrowth in the forest shaking by coming in contact with their bodies plainer and plainer came the sound of the hunter's voice urging them forward our hearts were in our throats and in the terrible excitement we wondered if it could be possible for providence to so arrange it that the dogs would pass us this last thought by some strange fancy had taken possession of me and i here frankly acknowledge that i believed it would happen why i believed it god only knows my excitement was so great indeed that i almost lost sight of our danger and felt like shouting to the dogs myself while i came near losing my hold in the tree in which i was hidden by chance i happened to look around at my nearest neighbour in distress his expression was sufficient to quell any enthusiasm i might have had and i too became despondent in a very few minutes our suspense was over the dogs came within not less than three hundred yards of us and we could even see one of them god in heaven can only imagine what great joy was then brought to our aching hearts for almost instantly upon coming into sight the hounds struck off on a different trail and passed us their voices became fainter and fainter until finally we could hear them no longer about noon however they were called back and taken to camp but until that time not one of us left our position in the trees when we were satisfied that we were safe for the present we descended to the ground to get what rest we could in order to be prepared for the night's march having previously agreed to travel at night and sleep in the daytime our father who art in heaven etc were the first words that escaped my lips and the first thoughts that came to my mind as i landed on terra firma never before or since had i experienced such a profound reverence for almighty god for i firmly believe that only through some mighty invisible power were we at that time delivered from untold tortures had we been found we might have been torn and mutilated by the dogs or taken back to andersonville have suffered for days or perhaps weeks in the stocks or chain gang as the humour of words might have dictated at the time either of which would have been almost certain death it was very fortunate for us that before our escape from andersonville we were detailed at the cookhouse for by this means we were enabled to bring away enough food to live for several days without the necessity of theft each one of us had our haversacks full of such small delicacies as it was possible for us to get when we started these consisting of corn bread and fat bacon nothing less nothing more yet we managed to subsist comfortably until our fourth day out when we happened to come upon a sweet potato patch the potatoes in which had not been dug in a very short space of time we were all well satisfied with this article and lived on them raw during that day and the next night just at evening in going through a field we suddenly came across three negro men who at first sight of us showed signs of running thinking as they told us afterward that we were the patrols after explaining to them who we were and our condition they took us to a very quiet retreat in the woods and two of them went off stating that they would soon be back in a very short time they returned laden with well-cooked provisions which not only gave us a good supper but supplied us for the next day with all that we wanted they then guided us on our way for several miles and left us after having refused compensation for what they had done
we continued to travel in this way for nine long weary nights and on the morning of the tenth day as we were going into the woods to hide as usual a little before daylight we came to a small pond at which there was a negro boy watering two mules before hitching them to a cane mill it then being cane grinding time in georgia he saw us at the same time we did him and being frightened put whip to the animals and ran off we tried every way to stop him but it was no use he had the start of us we were very fearful of the consequences of this mishap but had no remedy and being very tired could do nothing else but go into the woods go to sleep and trust to luck the next thing i remembered was being punched in the ribs by my comrade nearest to me and aroused with the remark we are gone up on opening my eyes i saw four men in citizen's dress each of whom had a shotgun ready for use we were ordered to get up the first question asked us was who are you this was spoken in so mild a tone as to lead me to believe that we might possibly be in the hands of gentlemen if not indeed in those of friends it was some time before any one answered the boys by their looks and the expression of their countenances seemed to appeal to me for a reply to get them out of their present dilemma if possible before i had time to collect my thoughts we were startled by these words coming from the same man that had asked the original question you had better not hesitate for we have an idea who you are and should it prove that we are correct it will be the worse for you who do you think we are i inquired horse thieves and moss backs was the reply i jumped at the conclusion instantly that in order to save our lives we had better at once own the truth in a very few words i told them who we were where we were from how long we had been on the road etc at this they withdrew a short distance from us for a consultation leaving us for the time in terrible suspense as to what our fate might be soon however they returned and informed us that they would be compelled to take us to the county jail to await further orders from the military commander of the district while they were talking together i took a hasty inventory of what valuables we had on hand i found in the crowd four silver watches about three hundred dollars in confederate money and possibly about one hundred dollars in greenbacks before their return i told the boys to be sure not to refuse any request i should make said i gentlemen we have here four silver watches and several hundred dollars in confederate money and greenbacks all of which we now offer you if you will but allow us to proceed on our journey we taking our own chances in the future this proposition to my great surprise was refused i thought then that possibly i had been a little indiscreet in exposing our valuables but in this i was mistaken for we had indeed fallen into the hands of gentlemen whose zeal for the lost cause was greater than that for obtaining worldly wealth and who not only refused to the bride but took us to a well-furnished and well-supplied farmhouse close by gave us an excellent breakfast allowing us to sit at the table in a beautiful dining-room with a lady at the head filled our haversacks with good wholesome food and allowed us to keep our property with an admonition to be careful how we showed it again we were then put into a wagon and taken to hamilton a small town the county seat of hamilton county georgia and placed in jail where we remained for two days and nights fearing always that the jail would be burned over our heads as we heard frequent threats of that nature by the mob on the streets but the same kind providence that had heretofore watched over us seemed not to have deserted us in this trouble one of the days we were confined at this place was sunday and some kind-hearted lady or ladies only wished i knew their names as well as those of the gentlemen who had us first in charge so that i could chronicle them with honour here taking compassion upon our forlorn condition sent us a splendid dinner on a very large china platter whether it was done intentionally or not we never learned but it was a fact however that there was not a knife fork or spoon upon the dish and no table to set it upon it was placed on the floor around which we soon gathered and with grateful hearts we got away with it all in an incredibly short space of time while many men and boys looked on enjoying our ludicrous attitudes and manners from here we were taken to columbus georgia and again placed in a jail and in the charge of confederate soldiers we could easily see with that we were gradually getting into hot water again and that ere many days we would have to resume our old habits in prison only hope now was that we would not be returned to andersonville knowing well that if we got back into the clutches of words our chances for life would be slim indeed 
from columbus we were sent by rail to macon where we were placed in a prison somewhat similar to andersonville but of nothing like its pretensions to security i soon learned that it was only used as a kind of reception place for the prisoners who were captured in small squads and when they numbered two or three hundred they would be shipped to andersonville or some other place of greater dimensions and strength what became of the other boys who were with me after we got to macon i do not know for i lost sight of them there the very next day after our arrival there were shipped to andersonville from this prison between two and three hundred men i was called on to go with the crowd but having had a sufficient experience of the hospitality of that hotel i concluded to play old soldier so i became too sick to travel in this way i escaped being sent off four different times meanwhile quite a large number of commissioned officers had been sent up from charleston to be exchanged at rough and ready with them were about forty more than the cartel called for and they were left at macon for ten days or two weeks among these officers were several of my acquaintance one being lieutenant huntley of our regiment i am not quite sure that i am right in the name of this officer but i think i am through whose influence i was allowed to go outside with him on parole it was while enjoying this parole that i got more familiarly acquainted with captain hertel or hertrail who was in command of the prison at macon and to his honour i here assert that he was the only gentleman and the only officer that had the least humane feeling in his breast who ever had charge of me while a prisoner of war after we were taken out of the hands of our original captors at jonesville virginia it now became very evident that the rebels were moving the prisoners from andersonville and elsewhere so as to place them beyond the reach of sherman and stoneman at my present place of confinement the fear of our recapture had also taken possession of the rebel authorities so the prisoners were sent off in much smaller squads than formerly frequently not more than ten or fifteen in a gang whereas before they never thought of dispatching less than two or three hundred together i acknowledge that i began to get very uneasy fearful that the old soldier dodge would not be much longer successful and i would be forced back to my old haunts it so happened however that i managed to make it serve me by getting detailed in the prison hospital as nurse so that i was enabled to play another dodge upon the rebel officers at first when the sergeant would come around to find out who were able to walk with assistance to the depot i was shaking with a chill which according to my representation had not abated in the least for several hours my teeth were actually chattering at the time for i had learned how to make them do so i was passed the next day the orders for removal were more stringent than had yet been issued stating that all who could stand it to be removed on stretchers must go i concluded at once that i was gone so as soon as i learned how matters were i got out from under my dirty blanket stood up and found i was able to walk to my great astonishment of course an officer came early in the morning to muster us into ranks preparatory for removal i fell in with the rest we were marched out and around to the gate of the prison now it so happened that just as we neared the gate of the prison the prisoners were being marched from the stockade the officer in charge of us we numbering possibly about ten undertook to place us at the head of the column coming out but the guard in charge of that squad refused to let him do so we were then ordered to stand at one side with no guard over us but the officer who had brought us from the hospital taking this in at a glance i concluded that now was my chance to make my second attempt to escape i stepped behind the gate office a small frame building with only one room which was not more than six feet from me and as luck or providence would have it the negro man whose duty it was as i knew to wait on and take care of this office and who had taken quite a liking for me was standing at the back door i winked at him and threw him my blanket and the cup at the same time telling him in a whisper to hide them away from me until he heard from me again with a grin and a nod he accepted the trust and i started down along the walls of the stockade alone in order to make this more plain and to show what a risk i was running at the time i will state that between the stockade and a brick wall fully as high as the stockade fence that was parallel with it throughout its entire length on that side there was a space of not more than thirty feet on the outside of this stockade was a platform built for the guards to walk on sufficiently clear the top to allow them to look inside with ease and on this side on the platform were three guards i travelled about fifty feet only from the gate office when i heard the command to halt i did so of course where are you going you damned yank said the guard going after my clothes that are over there in the wash pointing to a small cabin just beyond the stockade where i happened to know that the officers had their washing done oh yes said he you are one of the yanks that's been on parole are you 
yes well hurry up or you will get left the other guards heard this conversation and thinking it all right i was allowed to pass without further trouble i went to the cabin in question for i saw the last guard on the line watching me and boldly entered i made a clear statement to the woman in charge of it about how i had made my escape and asked her to secrete me in the house until night i was soon convinced however from what she told me as well as from my own knowledge of how things were managed in the confederacy that it would not be right for me to stay there for if the house was searched and i found in it it would be the worse for her therefore not wishing to entail misery upon another i begged her to give me something to eat and going to the swamp near by succeeded in getting well without detection i lay there all day and during the time had a very severe chill and afterwards a burning fever so that when night came knowing i could not travel i resolved to return to the cabin and spend the night and give myself up the next morning there was no trouble in returning i learned that my fears of the morning had not been groundless for the guards had actually searched the house for me the woman told them that i had got my clothes and left the house shortly after my entrance which was the truth except the part about the clothes i thanked her very kindly and begged to be allowed to stay in the cabin till morning when i would present myself at captain h s office and suffer the consequences this she allowed me to do i shall ever be feel grateful to this woman for her protection she was white and her given name was sally but the other i have forgotten about daylight i strolled over near the office and looked around there until i saw the captain take a seat at his desk i stepped into the door as soon as i saw that he was not occupied and saluted him a la militaire who are you he asked you look like a yank yes sir said i i am called by that name since i was captured in the federal army well what are you doing here and what is your name i told him why didn't you answer to your name when it was called at the gate yesterday sir i never heard any one call my name where were you i ran away down into the swamp were you recaptured and brought back no sir i came back of my own accord what do you mean by this evasion i'm not trying to evade sir or i might not have been here now the truth is captain i've been in many prisons since my capture and have been treated very badly in all of them until i came here i then explained to him freely my escape from andersonville and my subsequent recapture how it was that i had played old soldier etc now said i captain as long as i am a prisoner of war i wish to stay with you or under your command this is my reason for running away yesterday when i felt confident that if i did not do so i would be returned under wirtz's command and if i had been or so returned i would have killed myself rather than submit to the untold tortures which he would have put me to for having the audacity to attempt an escape from him the captain's attention was here called to some other matters in hand and i was sent back into the stockade with a command very pleasantly given that i should stay there until ordered out which i very gratefully promised to do and did this was the last chance i ever had to talk to captain hertrell to my great sorrow for i had really formed a liking for the man notwithstanding the fact that he was a rebel and a commander of prisoners the next day we all had to leave macon whether we were able or not the order was imperative great was my joy when i learned that we were on the way to savannah and not to andersonville we travelled over the same road so well described in one of your articles on andersonville and arrived in savannah some time in the afternoon of the twenty first of november eighteen sixty four our squad was placed in some barracks and confined there until the next day i was sick at the time so sick in fact that i could hardly hold my head up soon after we were taken to the florida depot as they told us to be shipped to some prison in those dismal swamps i came near fainting when this was told to us for i was confident that i could not survive another siege of prison life if it was anything to compare to what i had already suffered when we arrived at the depot it was raining the officer in charge of us wanted to know what train to put us on for there were two if not three trains waiting for orders to start he was told to march us to a certain flat car near by but before giving the order he demanded a receipt for us which the train officer refused we were accordingly taken back to our quarters which proved to be a most fortunate circumstance on the twenty third day of november to our great relief we were called upon to sign a parole preparatory to being sent down the river on the flat boat to our exchange ships then lying in the harbour when i say we i mean those of us that had recently come from macon and a few others who had also been fortunate in reaching savannah in small squads the other poor fellows who had already been loaded on the trains were taken away to florida and many of them never lived to return on the twenty fourth those of us who had been paroled were taken on board our ships and were once more safely housed under the great glorious and beautiful star-spangled banner long may she wave End of chapter sixty two
chapter sixty three of andersonville a story of rebel military prisons by john mcelroy this librivox recording is in the public domain dreary weather the cold rains distress all and kill hundreds exchange of ten thousand sick captain bows turns a pretty but not very honest penny as november wore away long continued chill searching rains desolated our days and nights the great cold drops pelted down slowly dismally and incessantly each seemed to beat through our emaciated frames against the very marrow of our bones and to be battering its way remorselessly into the citadel of life like the cruel drops that fell from the basin of the inquisitors upon the firmly fastened head of their victim until his reason fled and the death agony cramped his heart to stillness the lagging leaden hours were inexpressibly dreary compared with many others we were quite comfortable as our hut protected us from the actual beating of the rain upon our bodies but we were much more miserable than under the sweltering heat of andersonville as we lay almost naked upon our bed of pine leaves shivering in the raw rasping air and looked out over acres of wretches lying dumbly on the sodden sand receiving the benumbing drench of the sullen skies without a groan or a motion it was enough to kill healthy vigorous men active and resolute with bodies well nourished and well clothed and with minds vivacious and hopeful to stand these day and night long solid drenchings no one can imagine how fatal it was to boys whose vitality was sapped by long months in andersonville by coarse meagre changeless food by grovelling on the bare earth and by hopelessness as to any improvement of condition fever rheumatism throat and lung diseases and despair now came to complete the work begun by scurvy dysentery and gangrene in andersonville hundreds weary of the long struggle and of hoping against hope laid themselves down and yielded to their fate in the six weeks that we were at millen one man in every ten died the ghostly pines there sigh over the unnoted graves of seven hundred boys for whom life's morning closed in the gloomiest shadows as many as would form a splendid regiment as many as constitute the first-born of a populous city more than three times as many as were slain outright on our side in the bloody battle of franklin succumbed to this new hardship the country for which they died does not even have a record of their names they were simply blotted out of existence they became as though they had never been about the middle of the month the rebels yielded to the importunities of our government so far as to agree to exchange ten thousand sick the rebel surgeons took praiseworthy care that our government should profit as little as possible by this by sending every hopeless case every man whose lease of life was not likely to extend much beyond his reaching the parole boat if he once reached our receiving officers it was all that was necessary he counted to them as much as if he had been a goliath a very large portion of those sent through died on the way to our lines or within a few hours after their transports had been once more under the old stars and stripes had moderated the sending of the sick through gave our commandant captain bows a fine opportunity to fill his pockets by conniving at the passage of well men there was still considerable money in the hands of a few prisoners all this and more too were they willing to give for their lives in the first batch that went away were two of the leading sutlers at andersonville who had accumulated perhaps one thousand dollars each by their shrewd and successful bartering it was generally believed that they gave every cent to bows for the privilege of leaving i know nothing of the truth of this but i am reasonably certain that they paid him very handsomely soon we heard that one hundred and fifty dollars each had been sufficient to buy some men out then one hundred seventy five fifty thirty twenty ten and at last five dollars 
whether the upright bows drew the line at the latter figure and refused to sell his honour for less than the ruling rates of a street-walker's virtue i know not it was the lowest quotation that came to my knowledge but he may have gone cheaper i have always observed that when men or women begin to traffic in themselves their price falls as rapidly as that of a piece of tainted meat in hot weather if one could buy them at the rate they wind up with and sell them at their first price there would be room for an enormous profit the cheapest i ever knew a rebel officer to be bought was some weeks after this at florence the sick exchange was still going on i have before spoken of the the rebel passion for bright gilt buttons it used to be a proverbial comment upon the small treasons that were of daily occurrence on both sides that you could buy the soul of a mean man in our crowd for a pint of cornmeal and the soul of a rebel guard for a half dozen brass buttons a boy of the fifth fourth ohio whose home was at or near lima ohio wore a blue vest with the gilt bright trimmed buttons of a staff officer the rebel surgeon who was examining the sick for exchange saw the buttons and admired them very much the boy stepped back borrowed a knife from a comrade cut the buttons off and handed them to the doctor all right sir said he as his itching palm closed over the coveted ornaments you can pass and pass he did to home and friends captain bose's merchandising in the matter of exchange was as open as the issuing of rations his agent in conducting the bargaining was a raider a new york gambler and stool pigeon whom we called matty he dealt quite fairly for several times when the exchange was interrupted bose sent the money back to those who had paid him and received it again when the exchange was renewed had it been possible to buy our way out for five cents each andrews and i would have had to stay back since we had not had that much money for months and all our friends were in an equally bad plight like almost everybody else we had spent the few dollars we happened to have on entering prison in a week or so and since then we had been entirely penniless there was no hope left for us but to try to pass the surgeons as desperately sick and we expended our energies in simulating this condition rheumatism was our fort and i flatter myself we got up two cases that were apparently bad enough to serve as illustrations for a patent medicine advertisement but it would not do bad as we made our condition appear there were so many more who were infinitely worse that we stood no show in the competitive examination i doubt if we would have been given an average of fifty in a report we had to stand back and see about one quarter of our number march out and away home we could not complain at this much as we wanted to go ourselves since there could be no question that these poor fellows deserved the precedence we did grumble savagely however at captain bose's venality in selling out chances to moneyed men since these were invariably those who were best prepared to withstand the hardships of imprisonment as they were mostly new men and all had good clothes and blankets we did not blame the men however since it was not in human nature to resist an opportunity to get away at any cost from that accursed place all that a man hath he will give for his life and i think that if i had owned the city of new york in fee simple i would have given it away willingly rather than stand in prison another month the settlers to whom i have alluded above had accumulated sufficient to supply themselves with all the necessaries and some of the comforts of life during any probable term of imprisonment and still have a snug amount left but they would rather give it all up and return to service with their regiments in the field than take the chances of any longer continuance in prison i can only surmise how much bows realized out of the prisoners by his venality but i feel sure that it could not have been less than three thousand dollars and i would not be astonished to learn that it was ten thousand dollars in green End of chapter sixty three chapter sixty four of andersonville a story of rebel military prisons by john mcelroy this librivox recording is in the public domain another removal sherman's advance scares the rebels into running us away from millen we are taken to savannah and thence down the atlantic and gulf road to blackshear
one night toward the last of november there was a general alarm around the prison a gun was fired from the fort the long roll was beaten in the various camps of the guards and the regiments answered by getting under arms in haste and forming near the prison gates the reason for this which we did not learn until weeks later was that sherman who had cut loose from atlanta and started on his famous march to the sea had taken such a course as rendered it probable that millen was one of his objective points it was therefore necessary that we should be hurried away with all possible speed as we had had no news from sherman since the end of the atlanta campaign and were ignorant of his having begun his great raid we were at an utter loss to account for the commotion among our keepers about three o'clock in the morning the rebel sergeants who called the roll came in and ordered us to turn out immediately and get ready to move the morning was one of the most cheerless i ever knew a cold rain poured relentlessly down upon us half-naked shivering wretches as we groped around in the darkness for our pitiful little belongings of rags and cooking utensils and huddled together in groups urged on continually by the curses and abuse of the rebel officers sent in to get us ready to move though roused at three o'clock the cars were not ready to receive us till nearly noon in the meantime we stood in ranks numb trembling and heartsick the guards around us crouched over fires and shielded themselves as best they could with blankets and bits of tent cloth we had nothing to build fires with and were not allowed to approach those of the guards around us everywhere was the dull cold gray hopeless desolation of the approach of minter the hard wiry grass that thinly covered the sand the occasional stunted weeds and the sparse foliage of the gnarled and dwarfish undergrowth all were parched brown and sear by the fiery heat of the long summer and now rattled drearily under the pitiless cold rain streaming from lowering clouds that seemed to have floated down to us from the cheerless summit of some great iceberg the tall naked pines moaned and shivered dead sapless leaves fell wearily to the sodden earth like withered hopes drifting down to deepen some slough of despond scores of our crowd found this the culmination of their misery they laid down upon the ground and yielded to death as welcome relief and we left them lying there unburied when we moved to the cars as we passed through the rebel camp at dawn on our way to the cars andrews and i noticed a nest of four large bright new tin pans a rare thing in the confederacy at that time we managed to snatch them without the guard's attention being attracted and in an instant had them wrapped up in our blanket but the blanket was full of holes and in spite of all our efforts it would slip at the most inconvenient times so as to show a broad glare of the bright metal just when it seemed it could not help attracting the attention of the guards or their officers a dozen times at least we were on the imminent brink of detection but we finally got our treasure safely to the cars and sat down upon them the cars were open flats the rain still beat down unrelentingly andrews and i huddled ourselves together so as to make our bodies afford as much heat as possible pulled our faithful oak overcoat around us as far as it would go and endured the inclemency as best we could our train headed back to savannah and again our hearts warmed up with hopes of exchange it seemed as if there could be no other purpose of taking us out of a prison so recently established and at such cost as millen as we approached the coast the rain ceased but a piercing cold wind set in that threatened to convert our soaked rags into icicles very many died on the way when we arrived at savannah almost if not quite every car had upon it one whom hunger no longer gnawed or disease wasted whom cold had pinched for the last time and for whom the golden portals of the beyond had opened for an exchange that neither davis nor his despicable tool winder could control we did not sentimentalize over these we could not mourn the thousands that we had seen pass away made that emotion hackneyed and wearisome with the death of some friend and comrade as regularly an event of each day as roll-call and drawing rations the sentiment of grief had become nearly obsolete we were not hardened we had simply come to look upon death as commonplace and ordinary to have had no one dead or dying around us would have been regarded as singular besides why should we feel any regret at the passing away of those whose condition would probably be bettered thereby it was difficult to see where we who still lived were any better off than they who were gone before and now forever at peace each in his windowless palace of rest if imprisonment was to continue only another month we would rather be with them 
arriving at savannah we were ordered off the cars a squad from each car carried the dead to a designated spot and land them in a row composing their limbs as well as possible but giving no other funeral rites not even making a record of their names and regiments negro laborers came along afterwards with carts took the bodies to some vacant ground and sunk them out of sight in the sand we were given a few crackers each the same rude imitation of hard tack that had been served out to us when we arrived at savannah the first time and then were marched over and put upon a train on the atlantic and gulf railroad running from savannah along the sea coast towards florida what this meant we had little conception but hope which sprang eternal in the prisoner's breast whispered that perhaps it was exchange that there was some difficulty about our vessels coming to savannah and we were being taken to some other more convenient seaport probably to florida to deliver us to our folks there we satisfied ourselves that we were running along the sea-coast by tasting the water in the streams we crossed whenever we could get an opportunity to dip up some as long as the water tasted salty we knew we were near the sea and hope burned brightly the truth was as we afterwards learned the rebels were terribly puzzled what to do with us we were brought to savannah but that did not solve the problem and we were sent down the atlantic and gulf road as a temporary expedient the railroad was the first of the many bad ones which it was my fortune to ride upon in my excursions while a guest of the southern confederacy it had run down until it had nearly reached the worn-out condition of that western road of which an employee of a rival route once said that all there was left of it now was two streaks of rust and the right-of-way as it was one of the non-essential roads to the southern confederacy it was stripped of the best of its rolling stock and machinery to supply the other more important lines i have before mentioned the scarcity of grease in the south and the difficulty of supplying the railroads with lubricants apparently there had been no oil on the atlantic and gulf since the beginning of the war and the screeches of the dry axles revolving in the worn-out boxes were agonizing something would break on the cars or blow out on the engine every few miles necessitating a long stop for repairs then there was no supply of fuel along the line when the engine ran out of wood it would halt and a couple of negroes riding on the tender would assail a panel a fence or a fallen tree with their axes and after an hour or such matter of hard chopping would pile sufficient wood upon the tender to enable us to renew our journey frequently the engine stopped as if from sheer fatigue or inanition the rebel officers tried to get us to assist it up the grade by dismounting and pushing behind we respectfully but firmly declined we were gentlemen of leisure we said and decidedly averse to manual labor we had been invited on this excursion by mr jeff davis and his friends who set themselves up as our entertainers and it would be a gross breach of hospitality to reflect upon our host by working our passage if this was insisted upon we should certainly not visit them again besides it made no difference to us whether the train got along or not we were not losing anything by the delay we were not anxious to go anywhere one part of the southern confederacy was just as good as another to us so not a finger could they persuade any of us to raise to help along the journey the country we were traversing was sterile and poor worse even than that in the neighborhood of andersonville farms and farmhouses were scarce and of towns there were none not even a collection of houses big enough to justify a blacksmith's shop or a store appeared along the whole route but few fields of any kind were seen and nowhere was there a farm which gave evidence of a determined effort on the part of its occupants to till the soil and to improve their condition when the train stopped for wood or for repairs or from exhaustion we were allowed to descend from the cars and stretch our numbed limbs it did us good in other ways too it seemed almost happiness to be outside of those cursed stockades to rest our eyes by looking away through the woods and seeing birds and animals that were free they must be happy because to us to be free once more was the summit of earthly happiness there was a chance too to pick up something green to eat and we were famishing for this the scurvy still lingered in our systems and we were hungry for an antidote a plant grew rather plentifully along the track that looked very much as i imagine a palm-leaf fan does in its green state the leaf was not so large as an ordinary palm-leaf fan and came directly out of the ground the natives called it bull-grass but anything more 
unlike grass i never saw so we rejected that nomenclature and dubbed them green fans they were very hard to pull up it being usually as much as the strongest of us could do to draw them out of the ground when pulled up there was found the smallest bit of a stock not as much as a joint of one's little finger that was eatable it had no particular taste and probably little nutriment still it was fresh and green and we strained our weak muscles and enfeebled sinews at every opportunity endeavouring to pull up a green fan at one place where we stopped there was a makeshift of a garden one of those sorry truck patches which do poor duty about southern cabins for the kitchen gardens of the northern farmers and produce a few coarse cowpeas a scanty lot of collards a coarse kind of cabbage with a stalk about a yard long and some onions to vary the usual side meat and corn pone diet of the georgia cracker scanning the patches ruins of vine and stalk andrews espied a handful of onions which had remained ungathered they tempted him as the apple did eve without stopping to communicate his intention to me he sprang from the car snatched the onions from their bed pulled up half a dozen collared stalks and was on his way back before the guard could make up his mind to fire upon him the swiftness of his motion saved his life for had he been more deliberate the guard would have concluded he was trying to escape and shot him down as it was he was returning back before the guard could get his gun up the onions he had secure were to us more delicious than wine upon the lees they seemed to find their way into every fibre of our bodies and invigorate every organ the collared stalks he had snatched up in the expectation of finding in them something resembling the nutritious heart that we remembered as children seeking and finding in the stalks of cabbage but we were disappointed the stalks were as dry and rotten as the bones of southern society even hunger could find no meat in them after some days of this leisurely journeying toward the south we halted permanently about eighty-six miles from savannah there was no reason why we should stop there more than any place else where we had been or were likely to go it seemed as if the rebels had simply tired of hauling us and dumped us off we had another lot of dead accumulated since we left savannah and the scenes at that place were repeated the train returned for another load of prisoners End of chapter 64chapter 65 of andersonville a story of rebel military prisons by john mcelroy this librivox recording is in the public domain blackshire and pierce country we take up new quarters but are called out for exchange excitement over signing the parole a happy journey to savannah grievous disappointment we were informed that the place we were at was blackshear and that it was the courthouse that is the county seat of pierce county where they kept the courthouse or county seat is beyond conjecture to me since i could not see a half dozen houses in the whole clearing and not one of them was a respectable dwelling taking even so low a standard for respectable dwellings as that afforded by the majority of georgia houses pierce county as i have since learned by the census report is one of the poorest counties of a poor section of a very poor state a population of less than two thousand is thinly scattered over its five hundred square miles of territory and gain a meagre subsistence by a weak simulation of cultivating patches of its sandy dunes and plains and nubbin corn and dropsical sweet potatoes a few razorback hogs a species so gaunt and thin that i heard a man once declare that he had stopped a lot belonging to a neighbour from crawling through the cracks of a tight board fence by simply tying a knot in their tails roam the woods and supply all the meat used andrews used to insist that some of the hogs which we saw were so thin that the connection between their fore and hind quarters was only a single thickness of skin with hair on both sides but then andrews sometimes seemed to me to have a tendency to exaggerate the swine certainly did have proportions that strongly resembled those of the animals which children cut out of cardboard they were like the geometrical definition of a superfice all length and breadth and no thickness a ham from them would look like a palm-leaf fan i never ceased to marvel at the delicate adjustment of the development of animal life to the soil in these lean sections of georgia the poor land would not maintain anything but lank lazy men with few wants and none but lank lazy men with few wants sought a maintenance from it 
i may have tangled up cause effect in this proposition but if so the reader can disentangle them at his leisure i was not astonished to learn that it took five hundred square miles of pierce county land to maintain two thousand crackers even as poorly as they lived i should want fully that much of it to support one fair-sized northern family as it should be after leaving the cars we were marched off into the pine woods by the side of a considerable stream and told that this was to be our camp heavy guard was placed around us and a number of pieces of artillery mounted where they would command the camp we started in to make ourselves comfortable as at millen by building shanties the prisoners we left behind followed us and we soon had our old crowd of five or six thousand who had been our companions at savannah and miller's again with us the place looked very favourable for escape we knew we were still near the sea-coast really not more than forty miles away and we felt that if we could once get there we should be safe andrews and i meditated plans of escape and toiled away at our cabin about a week after our arrival we were startled by an order for the one thousand of us who had first arrived to get ready to move out in a few minutes we were taken outside the guard line massed close together and informed in a few words by a rebel officer that we were about to be taken back to savannah for exchange the announcement took away our breath for an instant the rush of emotion made us speechless and when utterance returned the first use we made of it was to join in one simultaneous outburst of acclamation those inside the guard line understanding what our cheer meant answered us with a loud shout of congratulation the first real genuine hearty cheering that had been done since receiving the announcement of the exchange at andersonville three months before as soon as the excitement had subsided somewhat the rebel proceeded to explain that we would all be required to sign a parole this set us to thinking after our scornful rejection of the proposition to enlist in the rebel army the rebels had felt around among us considerably as to how we were disposed toward taking what was called the non-combatant's oath that is the swearing not to take up arms against the southern confederacy again during the war to the most of us this seemed only a little less dishonorable than joining the rebel army we held that our oaths to our own government placed us at its disposal until it chose to discharge us and we could not make any engagements with its enemies that might come in contravention of that duty in short it to look very much like desertion and this we did not feel at liberty to consider there were still many among us who feeling certain that they could not survive imprisonment much longer were disposed to look favourably upon the non-combatants oath thinking that the circumstances of the case would justify their apparent dereliction from duty whether it would or not i must leave two more skilled casuists than myself to decide it was a matter i believed every man must settle with his own conscience the opinion that i then held and expressed was that if a boy felt that he was hopelessly sick and that he could not live if he remained in prison he was justified in taking the oath in the absence of our own surgeons he would have, have to decide for himself whether he was sick enough to be warranted in resorting to this means of saving his life if he was in as good health as the majority of us were with a reasonable prospect of surviving some weeks longer there was no excuse for taking the oath for in that few weeks we might be exchanged be recaptured or make our escape i think this was the general opinion of the prisoners while the rebel was talking about our signing the parole there flashed upon us all at the same moment a suspicion that this was a trap to delude us into signing the non-combatant's oath instantly there went up a general shout read the parole to us the rebel was handed a blank parole by a companion and he read over the printed condition at the top which was that those signing agreed not to bear arms against the confederates in the field or in garrison not to man any works assist in any expedition do any sort of guard duty serve in any military constabulary or perform any kind of military service until properly exchanged for a minute this was satisfactory then their ingrained distrust of anything a rebel said or did returned and they shouted no no let some of us read it let illinois read it the rebel looked around in a puzzled manner who the hell is illinois where is he said he i saluted and said that's a nickname they give me very well said he get up on this stump and read this parole to these damned fools that won't believe me 
i mounted the stump took the blank from his hand and read it over slowly giving as much emphasis as possible to the all-important clause at the end until properly exchanged i then said boys this seems all right to me and they answered with almost one voice yes that's all right we'll sign that i was never so proud of the american soldier boy as at that moment they all felt that signing that paper was to give them freedom and life they knew too well from sad experience what the alternative was many felt that unless released another week would see them in their graves all knew that every day's stay in rebel hands greatly lessened their chances of life yet in all that thousand there was not one voice in favor of yielding a tittle of honor to save life they would secure their freedom honorably or die faithfully remember that this was a miscellaneous crowd of boys gathered from all sections of the country and from many of whom no exalted conceptions of duty and honor were expected i wish some one would point out to me on the brightest pages of nightly record some deed of fealty and truth that equals the simple fidelity of these unknown heroes i do not think that one of them felt that he was doing anything especially meritorious he only obeyed the natural promptings of his loyal heart the business of signing the paroles was then begun in earnest we were separated into squads according to the first letters of our names all those whose name began with a being placed in one squad those beginning with b in another and so on blank paroles for each letter were spread out on boxes and planks at different places and the signing went on under the superintendence of a rebel sergeant and one of the prisoners the squad of ims selected me to superintend the signing for us and i stood by to direct the boys and sign for the very few who could not write after this was done we fell into ranks again called the roll of the signers and carefully compared the number of men with the number of signatures so that nobody should pass unparalleled the oath was then administered to us and two days rations of corn meal and fresh beef were issued this formality removed the last lingering doubt that we had of the exchange being a reality and we gave way to the happiest emotions we cheered ourselves hoarse and the fellows still inside followed our example as they expected that they would share our good fortune in a day or two our next performance was to set to work cook our two days rations at once and eat them this was not very difficult as the whole supply for two days would hardly make one square meal that done many of the boys went to the guard line and threw their blankets clothing cooking utensils etc to their comrades who were still inside no one thought they would have any further use for such things to-morrow at this time thank heaven said a boy near me as he tossed his blanket and overcoat back to some one inside we'll be in god's country and then i wouldn't touch them damned lousy old rags with a ten-foot pole one of the boys in the m squad was a maine infantryman who had been with me in the pemberton building in richmond and had fashioned himself a little square pan out of a tin plate of a tobacco press such as i have described in an earlier chapter he had carried it with him ever since and it was his sole vessel for all purposes for cooking carrying water drawing rations etc he had cherished it as if it were a farm or a good situation but now as he turned away from signing his name to the parole he looked at his faithful servant for a minute in undisguised contempt on the eve of restoration to happier better things it was a reminder of all the petty inglorious contemptible trials and sorrows he had endured he actually loathed it for its remembrances and flinging it upon the ground he crushed it out of all shape and usefulness with his feet trampling upon it as he would everything connected with his prison life months afterward i had to lend this man my little can to cook his rations in andrews and i flung the bright new tin pans we had stolen at millen inside the line to be scrambled for it was hard to tell who were the most surprised at their appearance the rebels or our own boys for few had any idea that there were such things in the whole confederacy and certainly none looked for them in the possession of two such poverty-stricken specimens as we were we thought it best to retain possession of our little can spoon chessboard blanket and overcoat as we marched down and boarded the train the rebels confirmed their previous action by taking all the guards from around us only some eight or ten were sent to the train and these quartered themselves in the caboose and paid us no further attention the train rolled away amid cheering by ourselves and those we left behind one thousand happier boys than we never started on a journey we were going home that was enough to wreathe the skies with glory and fill the world with sweetness and light the wintry sun had something of geniality and warmth 
the landscape lost some of its repulsiveness the dreary palmettos had less of that hideousness which made us regard them as very fitting emblems of treason we even began to feel a little good-humoured contempt for our hateful little brats of guards and to reflect how much vicious education and surroundings were to be held responsible for their misdeeds we laughed and sang as we rolled along towards savannah going back much faster than we came we retold old stories and repeated old jokes that had become wearisome months and months ago but were now freshened up and given their olden pith by the joyousness of the occasion we revived and talked over old schemes gotten up in the earlier days of prison life of what we would do when we got out but almost forgotten since in the general uncertainty of ever getting out we exchanged addresses and promised faithfully to write to each other and tell how we found everything at home so the afternoon and night passed we were too excited to sleep and passed the hours watching the scenery recalling the objects we had passed on the way to blackshear and guessing how near we were to savannah though we were running along within fifteen or twenty miles of the coast with all our guards asleep in the caboose no one thought of escape we could step off the cars and walk over to the seashore as easily as a man steps out of his door and walks to a neighboring town but why should we were we not going directly to our vessels in the harbor of savannah and was it not better to do this than to take the chances of escaping and encounter the difficulties of reaching our blockaders we thought so and we stayed on the cars a cold gray winter morning was just breaking as we reached savannah our train ran down in the city and then whistled sharply and ran back a mile or so it repeated this maneuver two or three times the evident design being to keep us on the cars until the people were ready to receive us finally our engine ran with all the speed she was capable of and as the train dashed into the street we found ourselves between two heavy lines of guards with bayonets fixed the whole sickening reality was made apparent by one glance at the guard line our parole was a mockery its only object being to get us to savannah as easily as possible and to prevent benefit from our recapture to any of sherman's raiders who might make a dash for the railroad while we were in transit there had been no intention of exchanging us there was no exchange going on at savannah after all i do not think we felt the disappointment as keenly as the first time we were brought to savannah imprisonment had stupefied us we were duller and more helpless ordered down out of the cars we were formed in line in the street said a rebel officer now any of you fellows that are too sick to go to charleston step forward one pace we looked at each other an instant and then the whole line stepped forward we all felt too sick to go to charleston or to do anything else in the world end of chapter sixty five